Chapter 13 Ethan We've arrived, Your Majesty. The carriage came to a stop as the brusque voice of the alicorn pulling the cart echoed through the air. Emma started at my side, clutching at the carriage seat. She appeared very nervous. Take a breath, I told her as I took her hand. It'll be all right. She swallowed thickly. What if they don't like me? They will love you, and if they do not, they are fools. Dolinska had several outlying faction villages surrounding the city. Emma had been to all of them but our own, and I thought it was high time she did. We had decided to travel to the Wolven village to meet with the pack before our wedding. It was the end of October, and our nuptials were weeks away. If Emma was to be my bride, our faction had to accept her as their female alpha first. Previously, the two of us had been banned from the Wolven town's borders, but now that we were king and queen, we had an invitation to visit again. I planned to use our visit to make things right with the pack. What if they're still angry at us for cheating in the contest? They don't blame you for losing, you know. They blame me, she argued. They know we have partaken in the trial of tears. Most are merely happy to see Wolvens on the throne, I told her. But some of them still support Gabby. You can't say that's not true, she insisted. Some do, yes. But they left the pack months ago to be with Gabby at her fortress. It is only the ones who are still wavering in the middle that we need to convince. Courage, Emma. She nodded. We walked out of the carriage, and she turned in place as she looked around. The Wolven village was always my favorite out of all the faction towns, and it wasn't merely because I belonged to it. It was set deep in the woods, much further into the forest than the rest of Dolinska's surrounding faction suburbs. The foliage was thick here, huge pines blocking out most of the sunlight, their trunks covered with ivy. Wild flowers grew along the edges of a stone path covered in moss. Little wood cabins sat in a disordered fashion beside triangular cottages with crooked thatch roofs placed in odd spots along the village. The town smelled of wild sage, pine, and cinnamon baking into bread. It was already making me hungry, thinking of the sweet rolls my father had purchased for me as a child here. We started down the path. Guards surrounded us, giving us space while ensuring our safety. The autumn leaves, a mixture of orange, red, and yellow, gave a stark contrast to the rich emerald of the forest. It had snowed that morning, but hadn't stuck to the ground. Emma pulled her winter cloak on to avoid the chill. I put my arm around her shoulders to share my shifter warmth as we roamed beneath the street lamps of the village. I began pointing out features. The shops here are focused on homemaking. They sell fabrics and yarns, as well as home decor and freshly dipped candles. Many woven sorceresses take up flower arranging, painting, or needlework in their spare time. Everything about our village is about making the home and the community a more welcoming and beautiful space. A woman sat at a spinning wheel creating magical silk, while another sorceress a few feet away worked on canning newly harvested vegetables for the winter. A shifter nearby worked on stitching his leather armor, while at a forge only a short distance away, his co-worker hammered away at a blade. Everyone in the Wolven village seemed busy, working on crafts, hobbies, or necessities that would ensure the pack made it through the winter. "'What's that?' Emma asked, nodding her head at the statue of a beautiful woman tucked within the trees, surrounded by a circle of pointed stones. Wolvens laid flowers at the statue's feet, bowing in reverence. "'It is an altar to Neva. Some say she is the goddess of the moon, and, as wolves, we revere the moon and worship her. I said. We leave offerings upon the altar, for the hope of a good hunt. Do the wolvens hunt often? The village mostly supplies its own food. Venison and other game is what is offered in the shops for meat, killed fresh that morning by the pack's hunters. The vegetables and fruits are grown right here in the village. Everyone has their own garden, and each villager is expected to chip in for the town's survival. People stopped in their tracks and bowed to us as we passed. Shifters slumped to the earth on all fours, while their marked curtsied as we passed by. A small crowd had gathered in the town to get a look at us, but some kept their distance, averting their eyes and paying attention to their work. We were not beloved by everyone, but at least we were not actively hated. That was a good sign. 
We passed by a dirt arena surrounded by wooden fencing. Inside the arena, two wolvens in their shifter forms fought. The older wolven barked orders at the younger one, telling him he needed to be lighter on his feet. A large bonfire burned next to the training arena and was surrounded by wooden benches. There was a small cart there with a sorceress on staff that served spiced cider and hot chocolate. We stopped for a moment, taking a seat by the fire so Emma could ward off a bit of the chill. A servant moved to help her, but I waved him off and obtained a hot cider from the cart vendor myself, pressing it into my mate's hands. A training area, I explained, to teach the hunters how to bring down game. The bonfire is always kept burning, from autumn to early spring, for anyone who wishes to come get warm and perhaps share a bit of conversation. It feels so cozy here, she said, cheeks warming in the firelight. The pack is very close-knit, more so than the other factions. You won't find the elaborate riches of the dragons here, nor the magic of the alicorns, or the knowledge the griffins hold. Yet you will find family, and neighbors willing to share whatever they have. It is a great place to raise a child. A few people lifted their hands in greeting to me, and I waved back with a smile. Emma noticed and commented, The villagers seem to know you personally. I spent much time here as a boy. My father was a simple man, for as great a king as he was. I think he would have preferred to live here, if it were possible. The times he brought me here as a child were always full of wonder and joy. I enjoyed growing up at the palace, but if I must admit it, I have to say that this is my true home. A couple of children were watching us mischievously from the trees. They giggled and pointed at Emma. I indicated they should come here. A few of them gasped and ducked to hide, but a brave girl trotted out from behind the bushes, gazing at Emma with wide eyes as if she was her own personal hero. Hello, Emma said, looking down at the little girl's closed fist. What is it you've got there? The little girl wiggled back and forth and then said, For you, my queen. She put a small blue stone on Emma's lap. It was shiny and polished, but wasn't anything special. Probably had come from somewhere in the forest, perhaps from a river nearby. Thank you, Emma said, taking the small stone in her hand. It's a lovely gift. Your hair is so pretty, the little girl said, and her fingers twitched. Touching a monarch wasn't permitted in our society, but Emma pulled her hair to the side and said, Here, you can play with it if you like. The little girl nearly burst with joy. She reached out to stroke Emma's hair, then began twisting the strands between her fingers. The little girl giggled as she braided Emma's hair back, and when she finished, she said, Do you like it? Very good. It's beautiful enough to go to the ball, Emma said. The little girl was giddy. She ran off with a squeal, crying, I fashioned the queen's hair. I rose with a laugh and helped Emma up. She'll be repeating that story until she's old and gray, for sure. Emma didn't respond. She was sad as she watched the little one run off. I didn't like that in the slightest, so I hurried to move on. Close to the bonfire was a cave system. Once we entered, the way ahead grew dark, lit only by lanterns hanging from the ceiling. There were metal doors placed in equal measurements around the walls of the cave, leading to apartments. This is our den, I explained. Many young wolvens live here after they graduate from Arcania University. It is how many of them get their start in life, and where most of our children are conceived and born. Emma grimaced, and I berated myself. I wasn't helping. I attempted to walk through the rest of the cave system as quickly as possible, until the opposite entrance to the den opened up to a wide space. Emma's eyes widened as she took in the garden around her, which was sculpted with a variety of white rose bushes that surrounded a small pond. Two swans swam on the surface of the pond. The ripples they created sent the white petals floating outward. It was a beautiful space, intricately created by the best of the royal gardeners. The queen's royal garden, I told her. I had it put in after our coronation. The roses are dying at this time of year, but in the spring they will be bright and vibrant once again. Emma skimmed her hands along the wilting petals with a look of wonder. I led her to a stone bench with a matching round table and knelt on one knee. For you to write your poetry, I said. Your work with words can't replace skating, but I know it's a balm on your heart. I wanted you to have somewhere special where you can come to pen your thoughts. Her face was alight with adoration. Ethan, this is wonderful. I don't understand what I did to deserve you. 
You merely exist. Emma rolled her eyes. Okay, you're taking it a step too far. I smiled and kissed her hand before rising. There's still much to see. Come. We wandered through the village until we came to the edge of town. Here was a circular cottage with a tall chimney rising from the right side. I opened the door to the cottage. The guards remained outside as Emma and I entered. The cottage was small, with a stone fireplace and a cast iron stove. A tree rose in the middle of the room, its roots twisting around the ceiling and keeping the house standing. The furniture was made of oak, carved by my grandfather, and racks for drying meat hung in the kitchen. On every surface hung a hunting pelt or a hand-stitched quilt. The whole place smelled of the woodsy scent of the stove and tobacco from my grandfather's pipe. My grandparents had long since passed away, and yet this place never failed to make me believe they were still here. The cottage was only one room. There was a bed near a stack of bookshelves. The place didn't even have a bathroom, only an outhouse tucked in the back. It was rustic in every sense of the word. Whose house is this? Emma asked as she circled the tree. This was my father's childhood home, where he lived until he won the contest and became king. I inherited it after he died, I explained. Your father must have been a great woven for someone on the circle to endorse him without noble blood, Emma said. He was a peasant, yes, but he was respectable and brave and very skilled in battle. He saved a lord's life from a monster attack, which enabled him a spot in the contest. Which he competed in with my mother, Emma said, running her hands over the tapestry. Then, once they had won, she left him for my father. Her tone held some sorrow, as if she wasn't sure her mother had made the right choice. I took her hands in my own. I do not regret anything that has happened or wish it different. If it were so, you and I would not exist, and we'd not be able to be together. You're right, she sighed. No use being bothered over the past. I've already arranged for us to stay here under armed guard until Heimskanun and the Day of the Dead are finished. The Wolven Festival for the holiday is not nearly as large as the city's, but it is memorable besides, and it's time you spent Heimskanun with your own faction, I said. Can we do that? Why not? I thought we could use a break from the palace, I said with a shrug. Perhaps see what life would have been like if we hadn't become what we are. Emma nodded somberly. It's a taste of another life. You may come here any time you like, I said, grasping her forearms. Any time you might need an escape. Emma's eyes flashed to the side, as if she did not wish to speak of whatever was on her mind. She pulled away from me, creating distance, and it wounded me. I had brought her here to my family's ancestral home to try to bring us closer together. But perhaps the moment was too intimate. She was pulling away. It's almost been six months since we found the Griffin Stone, and we haven't made any progress on gaining the last two crystals, she said. We're running out of time. She wanted to talk about heavy things, to carve some room between us. I did not understand why. But the matter could not be avoided, so I said, Yes. It appears Arthur's research has ground to a halt. Arthur is a brilliant researcher, but perhaps he needs more help, Emma mused. We should speak to Augustus, Theo's brother. He works at the Alicorn Hall of History. He told us about the Pool of Memory. Perhaps he has other information that could help us. Can we trust him? I was wary of speaking to anyone about our quest who wasn't in our immediate circle. I mean, he's Theo's brother. Family and blood mean nothing. Look at my relatives. Good point. Emma nibbled on her lip. I suppose we only need to tell him the crucial details, that we must meet the Spring Princess, and something must be given to her to provide our escape from her land. He doesn't need to know about the crystals. It's an avenue we haven't examined. Very well. Let's speak to him. We had the thought to head to the Alicorn Village to look for him, but with all the guards we had to tote with us at all times, we decided it would be less of a hassle to summon him here and send a royal escort to retrieve him. We waited inside the cottage for him to arrive. I got a fire going, and Emma put some tea on to prepare for our guest. It felt like something we would do on any normal day had we not become king and queen. The ambiance the cottage created nearly felt off like living in another world. Maybe it was a mistake to bring her here. It only reminded her of what we could never have. I had made a foolish decision. 
Some time later, a giant of an alicorn stepped through the door. He barely fit in the cottage. Despite the very muscular differences, I knew he was Theo's brother the moment I laid eyes on him. The two shifters looked very much alike. Augustus, it's nice to meet you, I said, inclining my head. Call me Gus, your majesty, he said, giving a bow to me, and then to my mate. It's nice to see you again, Emma, or should I say, my queen. We hope you weren't in the middle of something. We didn't want to inconvenience you, Emma noted. Nonsense. It's an honor to be summoned by the king and queen, and friends of my brother besides. What assistance do you require from me? He asked. We gathered around the kitchen table. Emma had already poured us some tea. Gus sipped at it lightly, the dainty cup appearing like a toy in his massive hand. Gus and I were sitting, but Emma appeared like she couldn't sit still. She paced back and forth in the kitchen, eager for answers. I was told you have need of my knowledge. Ask away, Gus said. What we may ask is strange, but I promise you that it's very important. We can't reveal why, but know that the fate of the country is at stake, I said. Gus let out a bold laugh. Very grave. I certainly hope I can help you. We're looking for the Spring Princess, Emma began, and Gus's eyes widened. We know she exists in Edmire, but we do not know where in the realm she lives. We must find her and speak with her in order to barter for an item she has that we need. However, we know that once you are in her court, she doesn't allow guests to leave. We need something to trade with her, both for the object we are looking for and for safe passage back to Earth. Gus nodded. I see. I'm afraid I cannot help you. I know of the Spring Princess and uh, of the legends surrounding her, but I do not know where you could find her. There's no clue you could give us? I asked. It's not my area of expertise, Gus apologized. All I know for certain is that if you wish to give the Spring Princess a gift she'll find worthy of, it must be a very powerful magical object, something magically unique, and objects like that are difficult to obtain. Damn it, Emma grumbled under her breath and went to take a seat. I figured you'd say that. I just thought, ouch. You all right? I asked raising an eyebrow. I, I just sat on the rock the kid gave me earlier, she said. She dug through the pocket of her cloak and with a sigh laid the stone on the table. When Gus saw it, his mouth dropped open. He leaned over the stone, expression completely enthralled with the stone's unassuming presence. Where did you get this? Gus asked, mystified. What? The stone? Emma said. This isn't a stone. It's a Rusalka scale. Gus said with awe. I believe Odette told us she and Theo met the Rusalka once, some time ago during her first semester at Arcania University, I said, thinking back on the subject. Odette being Odette, none of us had ever taken her story very seriously, but perhaps there was something to the tale. Then they are very lucky. The Rusalka don't appear to just anyone, Gus said. Typically, Rusalka only show themselves to children, or those that have druid blood. The Rusalka considered druids their cousins, though the Draka are all gone now. Emma and I shared a glance. Theo had not told his brother about Odette's druid blood. We tried to keep that knowledge as quiet as possible. Had the Rusalka chosen to greet Odette because they were kin? At the time, she had not known she was a druid. In all the tales I've heard about Rusalka, they're quite dangerous, I commented. That's because they are. Most fae who run into Rusalka, especially men, are slaughtered by them, typically drowned. It's not a good idea to go looking for them unless they choose to show themselves, unless you desire a watery grave. Gus studied the scale. Did a child give this to you? Yes. Why? I asked. That part is important. If you had received it from an adult, it would mean the scale was stolen from a child therefore rendering the magic useless. So it's valuable? Emma asked. Yes. To find a scale of theirs is very rare. Rusalka don't shed their scales unless they intentionally wish to leave one behind for someone to find, and in all cases, it is only for a child. The child must give away the scale freely, otherwise the magic will cease to work. It cannot be taken from a young one, only gifted by them. Strange coincidence a child gave us one today, then, I mused. 
Don't call it coincidence. One of the gods probably guided this little girl to the scale at the exact moment you were about to arrive at the village, Gus said. These instances don't happen often. They're rare enough to be considered fairy tales and acts of fate. Are all gifts by Rusaka only given to children? Emma asked. No. They may gift other objects, such as things they find at the bottom of the river and whatnot, but as in most situations with any fae, you don't take whatever object they give you. It's a recipe for a bad contract. Gus placed the scale on the table and leaned back. As they are immortal, their magic can nearly be as strong as the gods. This scale has great power. Power enough, perhaps, to appeal to the spring princess? I asked, hopefully. I think so. She'll find this an exceptional item to have in her possession. But, then again, so will anyone else. Keep it safe, he insisted, handing the scale back to us. We thanked Gus for his time and offered him payment for his services, which he refused. We settled on donating a significant sum to the Alicorn Hall of History to show our gratitude. He left just as twilight was falling over the woven village. We have what we need to make the trade, Emma said, turning the scale in her palm. Now all we need to do is discover where her island is, and the Seely Stone will be ours. We're so close, Ethan. That we were. Another victory was within our grasp, and yet I couldn't help but feel anxious about the whole endeavor. A nervous rattling in my gut told me that going to the realm of the Spring Princess would have unintended consequences for whoever joined us on our quest there. I only hoped that whatever she demanded of us, the sacrifice would be worth it to obtain the Seely Stone. Our time in the Wolven Village was quiet. It was a well-needed rest from the palace and all of its duties, which we sorely needed. I had the thought that everything was peaceful for the first time. Unfortunately, that peace was bound to be interrupted at some point. Emma was brewing our morning tea the day before Heimskunun. I smelled something was off about the tea the moment Emma poured me a cup. I stared at it, surveying the tea's woodsy scent and wine color, which was slightly off. Emma rose the cup to her lips, about to take a drink. Don't drink that! I knocked the teacup out of her hand. It shattered on the floor. She stared at me like I'd gone insane. What's going on? Emma took a few steps backward as I carefully took the lid off the teapot. A sharp scent filled the room. The lid dropped out of my hand, clattering against the floor. Get back! I grabbed Emma's arm and pulled her away from the table. Why? What's wrong with it? Her body tensed against mine as she went on high alert. This is a wolfsbane tincture. It is dangerous to all wolvens, but especially shifters, I said. One drop of this would have been enough to kill us. If this had touched our lips, we would have been dead. So even if we would have tasted the poison in the tea, by then it would be too late, Emma mused. Precisely. Wolfsbane is even more dangerous than St. John's wart for wolvens. I didn't notice any difference in how it smelled, Emma said, staring at the spill on the floor. Most wolvens, even shifters, can't recognize the scent. Smells too closely to average spices most wouldn't detect. Then how did you know there was wolfsbane in the tea? Emma asked. My father knew herbs and plants well. Needed to, growing up hunting in these woods. He taught me how to avoid wolfsbane as soon as I was old enough to know what it was. Good thing for your father, then. We'd be dead without his knowledge. Another thing I had to thank my father for. Even in death, he had saved my life. How do you think they poisoned us? No one has been in the cabin, Emma said. We just had supplies dropped off yesterday, I pointed out. We ordered a new bag of tea leaves. Someone must have tampered with them before the guards delivered them. Then we need to find them, Emma insisted. We alerted the guards, who began a full search of the surrounding area. It didn't take but fifteen minutes for them to drag someone into the cabin. Sire, we found this one trying to skirt around the back, a guard said. He and another guard dragged a resentful-looking wolven shifter in by the arms. He had this on his person, another guard added. He held up a flask. Inside were a few remaining droplets of the wolfsbane tincture. I recognized the shifter immediately. It had been years, but he was a murderer I'd put away during my time as the Phantom. I'd left evidence behind that led the Arcania Alliance right to him. He must have been let out of prison recently due to some mishap in the court's system. A mistrial, perhaps. Whatever the case... He'd figured out the Phantom was involved in putting him behind bars, and now he wanted to make me pay for it. 
The shifter's face rose into a snarl, and he spat at my feet. He'd come back to the scene of his attempted crime to see if he'd been victorious in his goal, instead of being smart and making a run for it. He certainly wasn't the brightest assassin. Who the hell do you think you are? Emma seethed. She stomped toward the man. Her hands were shaking. If not for diplomacy's sake, I was sure she'd slap him across the face. Poisoning our tea? You've got balls of steel. Someone had to do something, the shifter cried. It was only I who was brave enough to do what no one else would. And what may that be? I asked, crossing my arms. As if you don't know. The pack cannot accept you, he raged. For the rest of your reign, there will be whispers of the criminal king and his bastard queen. The pack may show respect to your face, but as long as you live and breathe, they will always despise you being on that throne. Be silent, I shouted. I take no orders from a liar and a cheat. They will never accept you as Alpha, the shifter barked. Get him out of my sight, I snapped, and I waved him off. The guards dragged him away, and I turned my back on his curses and insults. His head would roll to pay the price for treason later, but at the moment I couldn't handle any more of his hateful rhetoric. A griffin guard came in to clean up the spilled tea and to take the teapot out of the cabin. Emma was pacing around the cabin, chewing on her thumbnails as we were left alone once again. It seems I will never stop paying for the sins of my past, I said tiredly. Even now, what I did as the Phantom continues to haunt me. It's worse than that. I knew there'd be dissenters, but I didn't think we'd be attacked in our own village, Emma said. Ridiculed and mocked? Yes, but this crosses a line. Even worse, his words have some truth, I said. He walked into our home and poisoned us with wolfsbane, and he had no trouble doing so. This is a tight-knit community, Emma. People talk, and they know each other's business. At least one person had to have an inkling of what he had planned, and no one gave us fair warning or stopped him from doing it. If I'm truly being honest, I'm certain there are at least a few wolvens who knew of his plans and didn't get in his way. So, what? We have to live the rest of our lives knowing the pack hates us? Emma flung her hands up. It's not like we have the time or the energy to deal with this on top of everything else. Disloyalty cannot be allowed to simmer. It grows and spreads. He isn't the first to try to kill us, and he won't be the last. But if we're to remain protected, we need the majority on our side. Especially the pack, I insisted. We can't earn the respect of the rest of the Fae if our own faction doesn't honor us. Gaining the respect of the Wolvens is critical. And how do you want us to earn their approval? If passing the trial of tears wasn't enough, what is? We're going to have to prove ourselves to them. Some way, somehow. Emma made a skeptical noise, which I ignored. She was perfectly content with allowing the Wolvens to hate us if they so wanted, but I knew that wasn't an option. We had enough enemies as it was. If there was infighting within our own villages, the whole movement against Gabby would crumble. One way or another, we had to earn the loyalty of the pack and be accepted as their alphas. Otherwise, the war was already lost. Chapter 14 Emma My queen, you simply must settle on your dress. Your wedding is in three weeks. That's hardly enough time to get your hemline done. Lady Wilma Ett was my wedding planner, and she took Ethan's and I's nuptials as seriously as the war. Picking out the color scheme of napkins was like life or death to her. I stood on a stool in her office, covered in endless spools of white fabric as seamstresses took my measurements. I had the thought Wilma Ett would be an incredible general. The old woman ran her event planning staff tighter than the army ran their barracks. She was impeccable, with incredible stature, ironed clothes, and perfectly coiffed hair. Needless to say, I liked her, and I think she liked me, but we didn't often get along. I was certain she believed I was a clueless American puppy she had to whip into shape to fit into high society. I don't understand why we can't go to a store and pick something out. I'll even go couture, so it'll be expensive, I said. Wilma Ett gave a sniff so loud it was nearly jarring. A Malovian queen has never chosen a wedding dress off the rack. Do you wish to insult your people, your majesty? 
My wedding dress had been a huge point of contention between us. I was supposed to have chosen something for my gown months ago so the seamstresses could work on it all year and have it done in time for my final fitting, which was supposed to be now. Unfortunately, I hadn't been able to make up my mind on what I wanted to wear, and as there were far more important matters going on in the country, I hadn't devoted any time to sitting around and thinking about it. I was about to get married in a little over 20 days, and I still didn't have my dress. I can't believe your wedding is on a Wednesday, Wilma Et scolded. Why the king chose such a day, I'll never know. The kingdom didn't need to know that December 1st was the earliest day we could get married by Malovian tradition. My honeymoon provided an excuse to get me out of the kingdom by December 4th, the day the Black Claw had sworn to take my blood to raise Droga. We'd booked our honeymoon far out of the country after the wedding was over to keep me safe from whatever the cult had planned. It's not important what day they picked, Delmere said pointedly. We just have to get Emma a dress in time. Kiara, Odette, and Delmere were my bridesmaids. They were getting the last finishing touches put on their dresses, which were ice blue. They looked incredible, though the seamstresses kept having to take Delmare's dress out on account of her growing pregnancy. She would be five months along by the time the wedding happened. Willamette was still fretting on how she would manage to make Delmare's dress tasteful. She didn't want the baby to distract the gossiping press from the main event. It's not that I don't like any of the options, it's that I like too many, I protested. The designers had done an amazing job with all the different sketches of dresses they'd composed, but I loved them all, and there were just too many choices. I was worried about limiting it down to one, and then regretting what I'd picked out for my big day. If the queen does not choose, a choice will be made for her. As it is, the seamstresses will be up day and night to finish your gown in time, Wilma Et replied. Can't we just use magic to make a dress? I asked. Wilma Et physically staggered backward like that was the most offensive thing she'd ever heard. My queen, an illusion cannot make up for the real thing. There is no replacement for hand-stitched beads or careful embroidery. In this area... Magic provides no shortcuts. Your dress will be put on tour in museums all over Malovia once your wedding is complete. We can't have the public looking at an illusion. You need something that lasts. I scowled. At this rate, I'd be walking down the aisle in my underwear. I glanced at the collection of designs scattered all over the table and only felt more overwhelmed. Let me... Odette hopped off her stool and hobbled toward me. I can design something I know the queen will love. My dear, we know you are talented with a needle, but this requires delicate work. Wilma at sighed. No, that's not a bad idea, I said. Do you think you could choose for me, Odette? Don't you want to design your own dress, my queen? Willamette prodded. Not really, I said bluntly. It's become obvious I can't make up my mind. As queen, I had a lot of decisions I had to make on a daily basis. If I had to decide one more thing, I would scream, even if it was about my wedding dress. Wilma Et pursed out her lips. Do you trust your ladies-in-waiting to create something stunning? Absolutely. I put my fate in her hands. I nodded, and Odette hurried to the desk. Hmm... Odette leaned over the table and examined the designs. Then she took a pair of scissors and cut three designs in half, taping the pieces of paper together. Here! These sleeves, this top, and this skirt! This is exactly what the queen needs! Are you sure? Wilma Et's gaze was piercing. Of course! I know Emma will love it. I know her style. Wilma Et glanced at me, but I said, I trust Odette. I'd rather be surprised. Have the seamstresses begin on the dress immediately. Very well. Wilma Et handed the design off to two seamstresses. They glanced at each other in shock, whispering under their breath as they glanced down at the design. Either I'd be wearing something incredible on my wedding day, 
or my dress would look like a total Odette explosion, complete with ruffles, feathers, and God knew what else. I wasn't sure what to expect, but at any rate, I knew whatever Odette created would be unforgettable. Lil Matt kept me for a few hours more, prodding me about decorations and seating arrangements, which were hard to compile because most fae, especially nobles, didn't like each other. At least we agreed on the flowers. I'd insisted upon white roses for everything, and Will Matt had praised me, saying it was a very traditional choice. Will Matt didn't let me go until it was nearly time for dinner. I was wiped out. My wedding was important, and planning it was fun, but to be honest, I only had so much energy to get me through the day. This wedding is getting out of hand, I complained to my friends as we made our way to the dining hall. No monster could scare Will Matt. She'd shame them to death about their scruffy appearance, Kiara joked. No doubt. I let out a great yawn, and Odette said, Looks like you need a nap. I've been training a lot lately. Magdalena has me working morning, noon, and night, and when I'm not practicing with her, I'm working with Lucian and Unseelie magic, I said. Not to mention you have queenly duties as well, Odette added. It was all very overwhelming. I was tired. Have you made any progress on shadow manipulation? Kiara asked. I scowled. No, I didn't want to talk about it either. You haven't even practiced shadow manipulation since you tried that one time with Lucian, Delmer objected. How do you know you can't do it? Because I just don't want to, okay? A tension headache was making its way across my head. I rubbed my temple, bothered. Emma, you need a break. You're on the verge of burnout, Kiara warned. You keep pushing yourself like this and you won't be able to do magic at all. I ignored Kiara and took a turn for the stairwell. I have to go to my quarters. Emma, you can't skip meals, Kiara scolded. I'll be down in a minute. I just have to wrap up a few things. I hurried away before they could object. Truth be told, I had no time to rest, even if it was to eat. There was magic to be done. Aliska, one of my maids, was busy sprucing up our quarters. She curtsied to me before walking out, and I gave her a smile. I made sure the door was locked and she was gone before I entered my private study. My office was protected with a ward that kept everyone but Ethan, my friends, and I out. It was where my hearth fire on Earth was located, and where my most powerful magic could be crafted. Therefore, I couldn't allow anyone to tamper with it. On a wooden altar against the wall is where I kept most of my supplies. The altar was decorated with a statue of Milana, a black candle, salt in a wooden bowl, a few crystals, and a Celtic knot talisman as a reminder of my fey ancestors. I used my hearth fire to craft spells that would be far more powerful than any I could create on my own. It was better to craft them in my true hearth fire cottage in Edinburgh, but I couldn't often get away and I needed something at hand I could use when I was in dire need of strong magic. I lit the black candle and the incense. I scattered the salt around me in a circle and took a deep breath, upturning my hands to the gods. I hadn't forgotten what Queen Antonia had done to my mother, nor would I. During one of our training sessions, Lord Lucian had taught me an unseelie spell to bind the powers of weaker fae to prevent them from harming others. It was a risky spell and took a lot of energy, not to mention it didn't always work. The free will Faye carried and the will of the gods sometimes rendered the spell useless. If someone I loved willingly chose to confront or involve themselves with Antonia, my binds on her would break and she'd be as dangerous as ever. Most Faye couldn't bind other Faye. It took an exceptionally talented sorceress to pull it off, and during my first few tries, it hadn't been easy. But despite how unreliable and difficult the spell was, I still performed it every new moon to renew it and keep the spell fresh. Over time, the spell would weaken, which is why I had to cast it monthly. I took a deep breath and tilted my head back, praying to the gods. So, Mir, father stag of the hunt, leave not your child behind. Listen to my sacred prayer. This is who I bind. Protect those I love from Queen Antonia. Safeguard them from her snare. Encircle them in your white light and leave them defended there. Whenever I cast the binding spell, I could sense Antonia's rage. 
I was more powerful than she was, so I could successfully bind her. She couldn't use her magic to hurt my family or friends. She could still use her words and influence, however, which I vastly worried about. I couldn't bind Gabby, though I tried. Droga's power was shielding her, like Milana's magic shielded me. The candle abruptly flickered and went out. A bad sign. The incense stopped burning, and the salt around my feet scattered. I gave a cry of pain as I slumped forward, grabbing onto the edges of the table to keep myself upright. I felt even more drained than I had been before. As the candle smoldered, I gritted my teeth. Gabby must have put a protective spell around Antonia to prevent me from binding her again. God damn it. I would hex her if I could. Unfortunately, curses had a way of backfiring if you didn't get them right, and I didn't have enough materials that would render the curse accurate, such as a piece of her hair or access to her things. If I got it wrong, the hex would only reverse and end up killing me instead. I had to wait for my opportunity to find Antonia face to face if I wanted to gain my revenge. My knees wobbled. I took the time to cast a cleansing spell over myself and the room to rid it of Gabby's influence. By this point, I was exhausted. I crawled, literally crawled, on my hands and knees from the study to my bed and pulled myself into it, falling into a deep sleep. I woke up a short time later. I heard the door open and a light click on. Ethan was carrying a tray. He placed it on the nightstand beside me and sat down on the bed. He brushed my hair away from my eyes as I turned on my back. We missed you at dinner. I brought you something. He gestured to the tray. I sat up with a groan. The sight of food and the smell churned my stomach, but I reached out and started nibbling on what he'd brought anyway. Thank you. I need it. Spell backfired. Ethan's lips downturned. Are you sure you're all right? I feel a little better now, I lied. More like death warmed over. Well enough to see Magdalena. She's requesting your presence. Maybe. I slung my legs off the bed. I had no more interest in eating. I hope we don't drain too hard. She said she wouldn't keep you for long. Ethan escorted me to the Hall of Wonders. Lady Magdalena was already waiting inside and turned toward me briskly. I heard you were sleeping, she stated. I hope you rested up. I'm sorry for the interruption, but I thought it would be best if we could have one more lesson of sorts, just a refresher on what you've learned. There was a lump in my throat, but I nodded. I wanted to have a bit more peace, a short time alone that I could enjoy without having to worry about the fate of the world. But a queen always had duties, even on her time off, so I said, Sure, we can practice. Ethan's look was somber. He wanted me all to himself. Unfortunately, he knew the sacrifices we had to make. He shifted into a wolf and sat on the edge of the arena as Lady Magdalena faced me. Lady Magdalena took my face in her hands. Her eyes were kind and generous as she swept a lock of hair away from my eyes. I think my sessions have grown on you. You've become a woman who is ready to lead her pack. I hope I haven't let you down. It was one of my greatest fears, failing Lady Magdalena. I couldn't bear it if she was disappointed in me. Secretly, I feared she did after I'd been forced to quit skating, and I felt like I had to make up for it with my rule. I'd rather see the entire kingdom fall than to have her disapproval. I'd been trying so hard to please her over these past few months. And yet, I wasn't sure if it was enough. Of course you haven't let me down. You never will, I'm certain of it. She patted my cheek before she stepped aside. On to business. Let's see what you can do with those powers of yours. I nodded. I drew unsealing magic from a crystal in my pocket, I always carried one now, and used it to conjure a stream of black magic. I maneuvered my unsealing powers from one hand to another as I freely faced Lady Magdalena, holding my head up high. Excellent, Lady Magdalena praised me, but it's not enough. Let's see how you fare in a challenge against me. My jaw dropped open. Lady Magdalena wanted me to duel her when I was this tired? Was she freaking nuts? I didn't have time to think about it, because Lady Magdalena tossed a blue battle orb at me 
knocking me onto my ass. Ethan growled as I collapsed, but I waved him off. Don't interfere, I told him. I have to prove myself to her. His lip remained raised, but he stayed back as I circled Lady Magdalena. I conjured a couple of battle orbs of my own, tossing them her way. When they came close, she waved her hand. Each of them disappeared before they even graced her presence. The battle orbs were just a distraction. Using the magic in my crystal, I shot unseely magic at Lady Magdalena. She kept my powers at bay with defensive magic, but now that she was distracted, it was my turn to put the pressure on her. I rained fiery blue arrows down from above with an unseely illusion. Lady Magdalena had to put up a shield with one hand to protect herself, fighting my unseely magic with the other. Her shield suddenly vanished as my arrows broke against it. Magdalena whipped an enormous whirlwind of magic, blue, sparkling, and deadly. She sent it spinning outward at me like a tornado. Ethan jumped to his feet, certain I'd get swept up in it. But I was prepared. I used my unseely magic to take hold of the tornado and steer it out of the way. I found that her magic was connected to her mind, and I didn't hesitate to take advantage of that opportunity. I cast my intention out through the spell, and it ricocheted outward, latching onto Lady Magdalena's mind. I could feel her harsh power hammering at me, trying to order me out, but I refused to let it break my will. This was what she'd wanted me to do. She'd ordered me to overpower her mind time and time again during all our training sessions, and I hadn't been able to do it before. This was the day that changed. I forced Lady Magdalena to her knees and ordered her to drop her magic. Her spell ended, the whirlwind exploding in a mess of sparks. It was then I lost control and was forced out of her mind, careening backward into my own consciousness. Very good, Emmeline, Lady Magdalena was panting as she got back to her feet. You've done well. I've taught you everything I can. I feel you're well prepared for what lies ahead. You don't need me anymore. A sudden longing to have her by my side clenched at my chest. She didn't think I needed her? How could she say such a thing? We can keep training, I offered. We don't have to stop. I wanted to quit. I really was exhausted. After my earlier spell and all of that, but I was willing to keep pushing myself just to have her in my presence a little longer. She gave a wry smile. I'm afraid I have duties to report to. I thank you kindly for the offer, but I'm afraid this requires my urgent attention. My heart sank, but I knew Lady Magdalena wasn't one to be tamed. She was a wild creature, one who did as she pleased, and that I'd felt her presence for even just a short time was enough. Okay, I'll see you soon. Lady Magdalena nodded, then she opened up a portal. Ethan came to my side as my mentor disappeared from my sight. She is a strange woman, he uttered, his eyes watching the place where she had left. Yes, I agreed, but she is the mightiest sorceress who has ever lived, and perhaps whoever will be. Forgive me, but I think you may be stronger. Ethan shifted back into a man. Would you be up for a little trip? I've planned something special for us. My curiosity was tempted. Where to? You'll need a cloak. Ethan crafted an illusion of a winter cloak, then draped it over my shoulders before he took my hand. He led me out of the Hall of Wonders and to the ballroom, where a spinning portal was waiting. A portal? I asked. Yes, we're going somewhere. No guards? Not this time. It was both a relief and a worry that we were leaving without our guard. I got so tired of being followed around all the time, but so many people were trying to kill us nowadays that I was anxious if our guards weren't around. Wherever we were going had to be safe. We stepped through the portal, and my boots hit snow. I felt an icy gust of wind rush against my face. I grabbed the clasp of my cloak to keep it from flying off. I looked around. It was twilight. The sun was beginning to dip below the horizon. There was a dotting of mountains in the distance along with a shimmer of sea and a flat expanse of white snow beyond, the earth covered in orange light. It was breathtaking. 
Where are we? Somewhere in Switzerland. Turn around. I did so and gasped as I craned my neck upward. A massive wall of ice towered over us. It was crystal clear and several miles wide. It reflected the sun, shimmering like glass, and made shivers run over my skin. There was an opening in the glacier up ahead, along with a snowy pathway that led inside the monolith. What is this place? I asked, very much impressed. It's an ice cave. Nature carved it out of the inside of a glacier. It's here all year round, Ethan said. I heard of it and thought it was a very Emma-like place to go. You know me too well. I started for the entrance. Ethan followed me as I entered the ice cave. The halls were wide enough to wander through, and there were all kinds of interesting formations of ice within the walls and ceiling. I trailed the designs of bubbles trapped within the ice and became mesmerized by the merging colors of turquoise, amethyst, and aquamarine in the glassy surface. Through the walls of the ice cave, the sunlight broke through, sending multicolor rays shooting across the cave and over the path we walked. The rays reflected off the massive icicles lining the ceiling, making the entire cave glimmer like diamonds. Ethan and I passed a few waterfalls within the glaciers. Eventually, the cave widened, and we came to a circular pool in the middle of the ice cave. Ethan laid his cloak on the floor, and we sat by the edge of the spring. In the ice cave, you could hear every shift of the glacier as it moved. It was a little eerie, if not beautiful, music. I leaned against Ethan, and he put his arms around me to keep me warm with his shifter heat. This is really cool, I said. It's great that we're here together. Ethan moved closer. I thought, well, I thought it would be a nice spot for us to talk in private, if I'm being honest. Huh? I turned my body so I could look up at him. The palace is always so busy. You never know who may be listening in, and there are some things that should only be reserved for us. We need to discuss things that are important to our relationship. Sometimes, we're so busy focused on running the country, I think we forget to pause and consider our own lives and what's important to us. I hadn't really stopped to think about what I wanted out of life, or about Ethan and me, in a really long time. I was so busy making sure everyone else got what they needed that I hadn't really considered if my mate and I were on the right path. I think we're doing well as king and queen, I said. I think we are too, but there's more to life than just being royals. It's important we have these kinds of discussions regularly to check up with each other and make sure we're still being honest about what we want, Ethan said. I want you, I said, and I placed a hand on his chest. Yes, but is that enough? Ethan's eyes told me exactly what he meant. I'd said he was enough before, that the life we could build together was worth the sacrifice both of us had to make. Now, I wasn't so sure. I had been absolutely certain that I could live a life without children as long as I was with Ethan, and I'd meant it. I didn't think I was lying to myself at the time, merely hadn't realized how that loss would feel once the people around me started becoming parents. And it was a loss. I'd barely thought about kids before, but I'd always assumed at some point I would have them and didn't give much thought about it otherwise. But being told you couldn't have the one thing everyone else could? I had a crown, a palace, and more power than I could imagine, but none of it could make up for the choice that was taken from me. A choice that had been mine to make. Ethan was okay with not being a parent. He didn't care, so long as he had me. I didn't know if I could say the same. Which sucked, because it was my body that didn't work, not his. I loved Ethan. I could live my life and grow old with him without adding more members to our family and still be happy. But would I always feel like something was missing? Yes. I just want us to be clear on what we want going forward and the type of life we want to make together. Ethan said, We're going to be married soon. Whatever life we want to build, we have to do it as one. I nodded. I want us to make decisions together, for sure. Then why does it feel like you're forcing yourself to go through this alone? 
I tensed against his body, and Ethan said, I'm not oblivious to your pain, Emma. I see the look in your eyes whenever Delmare or Vara pass, whenever Gavi's child is mentioned. You freeze, and you become so far away. I don't know what I need to do in order to lessen that pain, but I want to help you, so let me. My mouth went dry, and I drew closer to him as I insisted, We can try. We can take the risk. There's a chance, a good one. Our kids will be healthy, and they won't inherit by disease. My condition is rare. We could have a healthy child. Or one that isn't, or a genetic carrier of your illness. Ethan pointed out, You said before you couldn't live with giving your disease to a child. Maybe I was wrong to say that. It's not like living with the disease makes your life less worthwhile or less valuable. I shouldn't count myself out of having kids because I might pass on what I have. Suffering happens to everyone, not just disabled people. Any child that is brought into the world will experience pain at some point. After all, isn't their life worth something, worth living, even if they end up like me? That's not a terrible argument. But isn't one you can stand behind if you don't get the results you want, and the worst-case scenario happens? Because I could live with that, Onawelka, but I don't know if you could. And I think you're still holding out for the gamble that they'll be alright. I could accept having a sick child and not allow the guilt to eat me alive. Could you? That was a tough question. Ethan wouldn't blame himself or me if our children inherited what I had. Me? I didn't know. It was another one of those situations where I wouldn't truly know the answer until I was in it, and playing with someone's life like that seemed cruel. I can't tell you if I'd be okay or not, I said. But I'm certain that children are something that I want in my life, some way, somehow. And I'm not sure if there's another way to get what I want, except to roll the dice and hope things turn out alright. I recognize that it feels, and sounds, selfish, but I'm just not sure how to move past this pain in any other way. You're missing an even bigger component. It won't be a walk in the park, Onawilka. Ethan's words were so true. I could become pregnant, technically, but it would be high risk, and the chances of me dying from childbirth or pregnancy were higher than they were for most women. Ethan and I had made the decision not to have children for my own safety, and to avoid possibly passing my disease down to my child. But if we really wanted to, we could still try. Honestly, the fact that I still had a choice in the matter made everything that much harder. If it were up to fate and I was sterile, the decision would be off my shoulders. I wouldn't be forced to make a choice whether to go through with a pregnancy or not. Every time I thought about having children, I had to consider how much I was willing to risk. My own life, along with the health of my child. The indecision of not knowing what to do or how much to sacrifice tore me in two. My doctor approved me for pregnancy. She'll think I'll be fine, I said. But we know there will be complications, possibly life-threatening ones. So the pregnancy will be high risk. Why not put everything on the line in order to get what we want? Because it could end with you sicker than you already are or worse, dead. Ethan said firmly, We cannot gamble with your life like that, not only for ourselves, but for Melovia's sake as well. I chewed on my lip as I thought, This is a tough situation. I don't want to put myself at risk, and I'm not sure I could be okay with the possibility of passing on my disease. But at the same time, I don't know if my life could be complete if I can't be a mother. And I don't want to sit here and make you promises that I don't mean. Words have power. As Faye, they're our intention, our magic. And I can't swear that you and Melovia are enough without being dishonest and betraying my heart. The gods must answer our prayers. Ethan said in frustration. There has to be a way to mend this pain without putting you or a child at risk. If there's an answer, it's not clear right now, I said. Maybe that's what we have to live with. Ethan nodded. We're still so young. We don't have to decide at the moment. 
Sometimes the right answer is perhaps no answer at all. I don't even know if I'd be a good mother, I muttered. I believe you would be, Ethan said. Would I? My mother did the best she could, and she made a lot of sacrifices to keep me safe. But she was also a selfish person. She still is, to a point. I rubbed my eyes. I feel awful saying all of this about her, especially after she nearly died in the fire. But sometimes, my mother makes decisions that are best for herself, and not for Arthur and I. I understand what she gave up, yet I find myself terrified that I'm going to repeat her mistakes. She clung to me and became obsessed with my life because she had to leave Arthur. I wouldn't want to smother a child like that. It stunted me, Ethan. I'm still learning how to get around that. What if I made the same mistake with her own child? You have to remind yourself that you are not your mother, Ethan said kindly. Am I that much different, though? Having a child with my disease is a fear of mine, but it's a worse fear that I'll be a terrible mother. I can't help but think that I am like my mother, because becoming a parent is a selfish decision no matter how you look at it. You're creating a new life, someone to love, that you know will suffer because you feel like something is missing inside of you. What's more selfish than that? But it's also necessary, Ethan pointed out. The world goes on, with or without us. Children will grow to suffer, but they will also grow to experience joy and happiness, and will make the world a better place. It's not selfish to want a child, Emma. And... It's a bit extreme to believe that you're condemning a child to a life of misery because you've brought them into the world. Life is both joy and pain. That's what makes it beautiful and worth living. I don't want to damage my child. Every parent makes mistakes. It's what you do to repair them that counts, Ethan said. I began to shake. I'm still so angry at my father, and that rage feels unjustified because he did the best he could, but I'm still mad that he couldn't be there for me growing up, and I'm mad at my mother for keeping Arthur and I apart. No matter how much she feared for our lives, that was wrong, Ethan. I've tried to let it go for the sake of my family, but there's still a part inside of me that resents them both. You can't reverse the past. No, but it haunts me, thinking of what might have been. How our lives could have been different. We could have been happy together. Or you could have been dead, Ethan said. There are no promises in life. I've said what I needed to to my father. He knows how I feel, and he knows I forgive him, I said. But I have to forgive my mother, too, and my grandparents for keeping this a secret. And I think I can. But from what I've learned, forgiveness takes time. It's not something you can just decide to do. You can choose forgiveness, but if you don't feel it in your heart, it means nothing. Only time can mend that wound. And as much as I want to forgive, I don't think I can, not at the moment. I can't force myself to feel a way that I really don't inside. I can still love them besides, and not punish them for what they did. And maybe someday I'll find a way to let that resentment go. Just not yet. Do you think something they could do would change that? No. I just need to be ready. I have to accept that we could have never had that life together, no matter how badly I wanted it. It's like skating, in a way. I had to accept that dream was gone and wasn't coming back. How much I wanted it had no effect on the outcome in the end. It's a sad truth of life, but wanting something doesn't mean it'll come to you, no matter how badly you desire it. I know. Life is so complicated. It would be easier to endure if I knew the answers and knew what to do, even if the path ahead was hard. But I don't know what to do anymore, Ethan. The only way forward is to just keep going. Now that you've had some time to experience it, do you think you made the right decision, deciding to become my queen? Yes, I said firmly. I've come into my own as a ruler. I still miss my old life, but I don't want to be reminded of it anymore. I've let that go. 
I had to in order to become a new person. What about you? I am glad I am king. Though my cousin was right, it's a much harder endeavor than I ever imagined it to be. Ethan remained silent for a moment, and I said, Do you still hold yourself responsible for Elijah's death? I harbor some guilt, though we both know it was a necessary evil. I do not think that I took him seriously when he told me how hard being a monarch was, the weight that is on your shoulders. I think he couldn't take the pressure. There was a darkness inside of him he couldn't escape, and it ate him alive in the end. Do you think there's a darkness inside of you, too? His voice betrayed as much. I know there is. And yet, I'm not afraid of it. The heaviness of the crown is a hard burden to bear, but I know I can last underneath it. I think Elijah was afraid of letting everyone down, despite how desperately he tried to hide it. He was afraid of becoming a failure. I am not. I have failed time and time again, and I've learned that you can always work your way back from your mistakes. Whatever the country demands of me, I feel ready for it. I'm not so sure that's true. I was hinting at what we both had been avoiding, because at this moment it felt so stifling. I wasn't sure we could ignore it any longer. Ethan mused quietly and said, Do you remember our time during Schatzenick? Yes, Lucas Holiday, the day of romance. It'd been a fun day, one of our last before the battle of Arcania University and before we'd become monarchs. It seemed like forever ago. What did you wish for when you slipped that piece of paper into Luca's wall? I didn't have to remember. For a long and happy life with you. That seems very mundane. It's not. Because I don't know if I'll get that chance. Ethan's eyebrows crinkled. Why do you say that, Emma? You know it hurts me so. Because it's reality, and I don't think either of us are willing to face it, I said. But we can't keep running from my fate forever. There is a possibility I could die before Malovia knows peace. And if we're talking about having kids, we need to decide now. I won't be able to conceive and birth a child in the short time I have left unless we get on it. I deserve some time with my baby. Before the end. I will not accept it, Ethan said firmly. We will find a way around the prophecy. There's more than the prophecy at stake, I said. I kept my voice even, but I was getting frustrated. I'm ill, Ethan. You know that. It's something we have to accept. I can accept your illness, but not your death, Ethan insisted. How can you ask me to let you go? Even if your disease progresses, we'll find a new treatment, a new way. Because it's not fair to ask me to keep fighting if I don't want to. Especially if our country is at stake, I pointed out. I have the entire nation to think about, but I also have to consider myself and what's best for my own mental well-being. Part of that isn't having to worry if you're going to fall apart after I'm gone. Ethan's eyes were starting to glisten. You're just so full of life. Sometimes I don't even remember that you're ill. Then that's a blessing, I said. Ethan, you get time to forget, but I don't. To you, this disease is a part of me, only one small piece. But to me, this is a pervading part of my life. I never get to turn away from it, never get to turn it off. I can't forget, because every second of my existence, I'm reminded of what I have inside of me and what I have to fight. I'm reminded of my limitations every time I take a step or inhale a breath or think about what moment I'm going to live next. I can't walk down the stairs without considering what would happen if I fainted and fell down them, or miss an hour of sleep without wondering if it's going to make me ill in the morning. That forgetting, it's a luxury I can't afford to have, so be grateful that you get to cherish that. The ice cave was starting to grow dark. I heard Ethan's voice tremble as he said, I was separated once from you before. Do not ask me to do it again. I have to. I won't be able to go forward with my destiny and do what needs to be done if I'm afraid you'll fall to pieces after I'm gone. 
When it comes down to the moment while I'll have to choose between saving the Fae and staying with you, Ethan, if you're not ready to let me go, I'm going to choose you, because I won't have the strength to abandon my mate. Then the Fae will be doomed and will have condemned our people. Ethan tightened his arms around me. There has to be another way. But what if there isn't? This has to be your choice as much as mine. When the time comes, if the time comes, and I have to die to save Malovia, you have to be okay with that and let me do it. Lately, I've been more concerned with how you're going to handle my death rather than dealing with my own feelings over it. I took a deep breath. And that's scary, Ethan. I'm staring down this dark tunnel that's coming for me, and I'm trying to make my peace with it. But I can't, because I feel like you're holding me back, not letting me go down that way. I feel this is the path the gods have asked me to walk. I'm going to follow what they have destined for me, unless you ask me not to. Don't fight against it kicking and screaming. Support me, because I can't do this on my own. This is the hardest part of my prophecy and my disease, because I'm not afraid of dying. I'm afraid of leaving you behind. Ethan broke into tears. He swept a hand through my hair and pressed his lips to my head as he spoke. How could you stare death in the face and think of me and not yourself? Because I want you to go on without me. Death will be peaceful. But we will be parted. You will be in the great hunting grounds, and I will be here, forced to live without you until my dying day. You asked me once to put you before Malovia, and I did so. Now you're asking me that I change my mind and put our country before you once more? We will be together in the realm of the gods one day, and yet I will have to endure years of loneliness before that time. Is that what you're asking me to do? Yes. I cupped a hand to his face and wiped his tears away. It's the hardest thing I've asked you to go through, but what other choice do we have? I can feel death coming, like a specter that's creeping over my skin, just waiting for me to fall into his arms with every day that passes. With every hour, I take a step closer. And I'm ready for him. That is, if you're willing to accept that this prophecy might be my end. What do you want? His eyes flashed amethyst, and once again, I caught a glimpse of that strange magic he had inside of him we weren't able to place. I want you to be happy, Ethan. I want you to move on and have a good life, even if I'm not there. It's my only wish. You can't spend the rest of your life locked away because I'm gone. What will that do to the country and my memory? Life is short and fleeting for all of us. Spending your days miserable at my demise isn't a sign of love, Ethan. It's a way to dishonor the person I was. If you spend the years wasting away because of my death, you aren't showing that you loved me. You're fighting over what was inevitable. The best way to acknowledge my sacrifice, even if it's hard, is to have a life worth living. Is that what you wish from me? He whispered. Yes. If I'm gone, don't squander the days you have grieving my absence. Use that time to preserve what I treasured and to fight for the causes I believed in. There will still be a lot of work to do after this war is over. You'll be able to make a difference as a king. I ask that you carry on and do the work that I won't be able to. I feel if I try to be happy after your death, I'm betraying you. That perhaps I did not love you as much as I thought, Ethan said, almost fearfully. Love doesn't hold on so tightly to what's not there, and you're putting me in a cage. My spirit isn't free to fly if you're refusing to accept my passing, I said. I rubbed his shoulder, trying to get him to see sense. Of course you love me. I know you do, and I will know that you love me after I'm gone. Ethan took a heavy breath. And this I vow to you. I will accept your sacrifice, and if it comes to it, I will not get in the way of your destiny or try to prevent whatever is coming if you're truly fated for it. 
If you die, I will move on. I will honor your memory and continue to fight for what you believed was right. And somehow, I'll find some sort of semblance of happiness in this life until we meet again in the great hunting grounds. That's all I ask of you, I hushed. I kissed him because I was truly thankful for the gift he was giving me. We didn't know what was ahead of us, but at least now I knew if the worst came to pass, Ethan would go on. It left me free to follow whatever destiny had in store. I broke the kiss and stood up. I walked to the edge of the spring and unclipped my cloak. Well, no matter how much time I have left, days or years, I want to live every second of it. Might as well start now. Emma! Ethan's alarm was apparent, but I didn't listen. I jumped into the spring and sank underwater. The icy water felt like daggers scraping across my skin, puncturing my lungs and heart. It was uncomfortable, almost painful, but I reveled in it. It was something I'd never done. Exhilaration ran through my veins at the feeling of being suspended within the freezing reverence. My dress floated outward in the water, billowing around me as if I were a ghost. I closed my eyes and hovered there for a second, feeling every sharp sensation of the cold and savoring it because I knew I wouldn't be mortal forever. Someday, my life would come to an end. I accepted it. I accepted death. But not yet. I wanted to experience life as much as I could before that time came. Ethan plunged in after me. I opened my eyes. His body stiffened as he hit the water before he grabbed my arm and hauled me to the surface. Our heads broke the water. Ethan's voice was strained as he choked out, You're going to kill me, woman. I was laughing as we pulled ourselves onto the snowy bank. It was so cold my body was shaking. I summoned a portal as we got to our feet and dragged him through it. We appeared back in our warm bedroom. Back in their quarters, Emma and Ethan enjoy each other's company, savoring the moment. Emma knows the life she has left to live is short, and she wants to enjoy every second she can with her love. Whatever comes, we're not going to end, Ethan. We love each other so much, we'll be together again, no matter what comes to separate us. Ethan gave a throaty noise of agreement. As he held me, I knew I was one lucky girl. Life, death, neither mattered because Ethan and I shared an eternal soul bond, and that connection was something nothing, not even the gods, could separate. I would adore and love him until my dying breath, and I'd be waiting for him on the other side until we were reunited again. Chapter 15 Ethan My wedding was only a few days away, and as such, it was time for my bachelor party. I had no interest in bars and strippers, and as a king it wouldn't be proper anyway, so Stefan had planned a good old-fashioned camping trip. It was prime hunting season in Malovia, and we hoped to bring home a few deer, as well as get roaring drunk. It was around midnight. We were hunting on the royal grounds surrounding the palace. I would have preferred somewhere a bit more rural, but in a time of war with enemies everywhere, I was forced to take what I could get and be happy with it. There were guards stationed all around the woods where we roamed. They gave us our distance, standing alert more than a mile off as my friends and I searched the woods for stags. Very loudly, I might add. Every deer in Malovia has heard you bastards coming, I grumbled. I was crouching in the bushes and waiting for a deer to walk by, but it would be a near impossible task with the men I'd brought. Would you please stop singing? I hissed in a low voice at Stefan. He was carrying on some brash hunting song, which echoed through the woods. He was also dragging Theo, who was so drunk he couldn't stand. I thought we were here to have fun, Stefan objected. You want to be my daddy and give me a lecture? Maybe he'll take you across the knee, Theo slurred with a snicker, and his head drooped onto his shoulder. Kinky, Stefan wickled his eyebrows. Didn't know it was that kind of party. I want to biff you across the face. I scanned the trees for deer, but didn't see any. Couldn't smell them, either. The woods were empty. Like dumbasses, we hadn't brought any food, just alcohol, so if we didn't catch something, 
We were going hungry tonight. My dream of a freshly hunted kill roasting over an open fire was being crushed underfoot by the sound of Stefan's loud boots and Theo's inane giggling. Alexei popped his head out of a bush. Why is he always pissed whenever we drink? Alexei asked, giving a glance at Theo. Because he's the easiest to get drunk, Stefan said, slinging an arm around Theo's shoulders. He's my little lightweight. Theo hiccuped. I shook my head. I'd had a few drinks before we'd left the campsite, but gods, Theo had gone through an entire keg of ale on his own. Apparently, the party was starting early. Ouch, that hurt. Arthur stumbled out of the thicket, pulling a couple thorns out of his ass. He looked entirely miserable trekking through these woods. Arthur was sober, as he didn't like to drink, but he was a piss-poor hunter. Are you sure you wanted to come along? Alexei asked in amusement. Hunting doesn't seem like your favorite activity. I'm trying to just enjoy a night out with my mates. Don't have too many free days left, Arthur commented. Stefan's face lit up. That's right. Arthur and I need to get our kicks while we can. The thought of Stefan being a father was both endearing and scary as hell. Sure you're prepared? I asked. Absolutely. Oh, gods, I hope it's a girl. I couldn't handle one like me. I was a hellion when I was younger. Stefan sighed. He was, I added. All right, little bastard, Stefan insisted. It'd be what you deserve for all you put your mother through. I stiffened as I smelled something in the wind. Had to be a stag, a big one. Finally, we found something. I motioned for the others to get down and stay silent as I changed into a wolven following the scent of the deer. I caught the silhouette of the deer against the moonlight. It was only a few feet ahead and hadn't noticed my approach. I charged before the deer could move and went to pounce. As I landed on the deer, it gave way beneath me and I dove my fangs down. I felt something soft against my tongue. Instead of feeling the crunch of bone and the warmth of blood, my teeth met cotton. I gagged on a mass of fabric in my mouth and dropped the body. It was stuffed. Some asshole had placed this toy deer in the middle of the woods and sprayed it down with deer scent to trick me. The others were dying laughing. I spat a bit of fluff out of my mouth and transformed back. All right, whose bright idea was that? Oh, gods, your face, Stefan heckled, bending over his knees. I can't believe you fell for it. Told you he wouldn't notice, Alexei hissed. Arthur let out a few humored chuckles. Ha ha, I'm very amused. I kicked the toy deer to the side and said, Let's go back to the campsite. No use wasting time out here hunting teddy bears. We romped back to the campsite. There was a crackle in the bushes ahead, and Arthur looked up. He changed into a wolven instantly and bounded ahead, until we heard the sounds of a dying animal be cut off as Arthur silenced it. The rest of us ran forward. We came upon the sight of a dead doe, throat bitten out. Arthur transformed back, wiping his mouth of blood. Good job, Arthur. Now we'll eat tonight, Alexei said. I'm impressed. You managed to stumble upon the one deer in this god's cursed forest, I said. I was coming to the funeral of his stuffed cousin, slain by our noble lord and king, Stefan offered. Fuck off. I reached down and hefted the doe onto my shoulder. When we got back to the campsite, I got to work on butchering the doe, while Stefan got the fire roaring again. Alexei gasped when he unzipped his tent. He reached in and cried out, Look what I found! I cringed when he displayed an ugly creature to the group. It looked like a cross between a tarantula and a scorpion, with a big furry body, hundreds of eyes, beetle-like wings, and a large stinger. The beast fit in the palm of his hand, and scuttled from left to right. Oh, it's a spider, Scorpius. A type of bug fakin', Arthur said as he observed it. Watch out, it can be poisonous. One sting will have you sick for days. It's awesome, Alexei said, holding it up. You were supposed to freak out, not make it a pet, Stefan complained. Took me days to find one. Good to know you're busy planning pranks instead of worrying about the fate of our nation, Lord Slasky, I told him. I was killing two birds with one stone. We could plant it in Gabby's bedchamber, Stefan said with a shrug. No way. I want to take it back to Kiara. She'll find it so interesting, Alexei said, as the insect crawled along his palm. 
What should we name it? Bartholomew, Arthur offered. No, that's stupid, Alexei frowned. Arthur sighed and dropped his head. Yeah, Vera said that too. I was thinking more like fuzzy, Alexei said. Call it bacon, because that's what it's going to smell like when we toss it in the fire, Stefan joked. Let's have a vote, Arthur suggested. As they were debating names, Theo tried to set up his tent and fell in it. He let out a loud snore. He looked comfortable, so no one bothered to wake him. We got a few prime cuts of meat roasting on the spit. It smelled delicious. I couldn't wait to taste it. While I was cooking, Stefan had gotten the brilliant idea to draw a dick mustache on Theo's face with a marker he'd found in his camper bag. This was who I chose to surround myself with. Arthur sat beside me on a nearby rock. I began handing out strips of meat, and he took a bite, looking contemplative. Something on your mind? I offered. It's nothing, Arthur said. Enjoy your night, Ethan. You've earned it. He didn't seem keen to talk, so I distributed the meat. We feasted on the deer while working our way through what was left of the ale, and there was much ale to be had. A couple hours passed until it was close to four in the morning. Stefan and Alexei had gone through a few tankards each until they could drink no more and had passed out on top of Theo. The three of them slept in a pile, snoring and making grunting sounds. Don't they look cute? I'd gone through a few rounds of ale, and my head was pleasantly buzzing, but I had no desire to drink more. I didn't wish to sport a hangover from hell like those three would have in the morning. Arthur was clutching his mug and staring into the flames. His eyes were so haggard it became bothersome. I wasn't sure he'd heard my earlier comment. Arthur, you've had that same look on your face since dinner. What's going on? I prodded. He hunched over. I didn't want to bring it up at your bachelor party. Party's pretty much over, I said, gesturing to the pile of drunken, sleeping shifters on my right. That's true. Arthur rubbed his chin before he gave a sigh and said, I've been thinking about how we can get to the Spring Princess's Island, and for all my theories, I still don't have any ideas. Well, what do we know? I offered. It's on an island, right? I'm assuming we'll have to sail there. Sail there how? He adjusted his glasses. The Spring Princess is a powerful fay, so I'm guessing she has wards around her island. We won't be able to portal onto it, not even if we find out where it is, I pointed out. So we'll have to take a ship. Crossing the sea is the only way to find the island. Arthur gasped and nearly fell off his seat. Ethan, you're a genius. I didn't know why I didn't think of that. Think of what? All water is interconnected. It has memory. Arthur explained. The molecules in water react to human and supernatural consciousness as well as action. Tears of various kinds have a different molecular structure. Tears of sadness are structured differently on a molecular level than tears of joy because they contain different experiences of emotion and memory. Alchemists in the magical world know that water can transmit and store information, though we haven't figured out how to harness that knowledge yet, even as supernaturals. But there are some creatures that can. I'm not following, I said slowly. Water itself could tell us where the island is. All we need is to find a faken that could summon the knowledge from the water itself. So, you're looking for a type of faken that could use her connection to the water to tell us where we might find the Spring Princess's island. Like a well spirit, a fey sprite of the water. Exactly. All fey come from Edenmire, and well spirits are eternal. They brought some of their water here from Edenmire and incorporated it into Earth's water system, thus mixing that knowledge with ours. If there's a well spirit nearby, she has memory of the sea in Edenmire and probably knows how we can find the island, Arthur said. Are there any well spirits in Dolinska that you know of? There's a well spirit close by the castle, a water sprite. She's lived there for centuries. She's harmless, an amusement for the royals, I explained. My father used to take me there to toss coins in. She'd grant small wishes as a gift, nothing powerful, things like candies and treats in exchange for gold. Of course, Arthur adjusted his glasses. I always thought water sprites were just fanciful spirits for children, but in this case, this one might be able to help us. Are you sure? Yes, but we'd have to give her an offering. Well, spirits don't give out information for free, and the price of what we're asking for is worth more than a few coins. It'll take the deer head, 
I said, gesturing to it. Water sprites will do anything for food. What about them? Arthur jerked his thumb at Theo, Stefan, and Alexei. Just leave them. We'll be back by the time they're whining for breakfast. We took the deer head and set off. The woods appeared especially eerie ahead. It was the darkest part of night, and if I wasn't mistaken, a haunting voice seemed to follow us through these trees, almost echoing our quest. A couple of thin snowflakes began to fall from the sky, dotting the ground with their presence. Strange, isn't it? How close we are to succeeding, Arthur commented. Yes, I mused. And how close we are to failing. I hoped the water sprite would be able to give us a lead. Winter was setting upon us, and after this one, there would be only one more before Emma's prophecy came true. I had vowed to Emma I would let her go if the time came, that I would not interfere if this war caused her death. And yet, I had also promised myself I would do everything I could to avoid that fate. I promised Emma I would go on to rule without her, if the gods warranted her death. Didn't mean I would allow her to pass from my arms without a good fight. We came to the well. It was decently kept, a round stone monument that was covered with dead ivy, which had passed from the onsetting cold. I peered inside. The water wasn't yet frozen, but in a few more nightfalls it would be. The water sprite would cease to appear after the water in the well froze over, so we were just in time to summon her. I placed the deer head on the ground, then pulled a gold coin out of my pocket. I tossed it into the well, and I heard the coin land with a soft splash. Arthur and I stood beside the well, waiting. A few moments later, the sprite emerged from the well, perching on the stone edge. She was beautiful, skin blue and translucent, with shimmering scales that reflected the moonlight. A ribbed fin ran from the top of her head all the way down her back. Her fingers were webbed, and instead of feet, she had two fanned fins attached to each leg. I had seen her many times before, though not in many years. She appeared as flawless as she ever had, and hadn't changed since I was a boy. "'What is it you ask in exchange for the coin?' the water sprite asked, batting her long eyelashes. "'A trinket? A bauble?' We've come to ask for information on the spring princess, I said. The water sprite's eyes flashed. I do not give such knowledge willingly without payment. She spoke as if the knowledge was a secret. I tossed the deer's head. The sprite caught it, clutching it to her chest. Blood from the head splayed over her scales. She dipped back into the well, diving in an arc. I heard another splash before the sprite reappeared, pulling herself onto the edge of the well once more. Her mouth was ringed with blood. Payment has been received, the sprite said. What is it you wish to know? The spring princess lives on an island somewhere in Edenmire. We need to sail to it so we may make a bargain with her, I said. A dangerous thing, making a bargain with the spring princess. Even so, do you know how to get to this island? The water sprite turned over her palm and wiggled her fingers, a few droplets of water rose from her palm, shimmering in the air and turning in place. The Spring Princess's island can only be found by sailing on the Sea of Stars, the water sprite began. You must leave from the shores of Ithriel at twilight and sail west. From there, you will discover the Spring Princess's domain. Is there more you can tell us? I demanded. That didn't seem like enough. The elves were friends of the Spring Princess, and therefore disguised her island at her request. Their power enabled the island to move from one place to another within this sea of stars, bouncing from this place to that, never in the same location twice. The cycle repeats each day, with the island moving to a new spot every sunrise. The sprite blinked at us. Then how are we supposed to find it? I kept my voice even though frustration welled inside of me. How could we find an island that moved? With fey power, to get to the island itself, you must believe you are going the right direction, and therefore you are. Your intention will guide the way. Illusion magic, of course, Arthur murmured. It was the same way we'd found the gate that led us to the Alicorn Court. Is there anything more? No, that is all I can tell you. For well, that is all I and the water knows. Go to Ithriel and sail upon the Sea of Stars. 
believe that you will arrive at your destination by dawn, and you will. The water sprite turned to jump back into her well. I wish you well upon your journey. I hope your offering is sufficient for the spring princess, for if not, it will bring your doom. She dove back into the well, and I turned to Arthur. I haven't heard of Ithriel. Do you know it? Somewhat. It is an old elven settlement, from when the elves lived amongst us in Edenmire millennia ago, Arthur said. The city is long gone, but I'm sure the beach is still there. All the elves are dead now. Yes, but their magic still leaves traces. It's alive, even though they are gone. If it wasn't, the island wouldn't continue to move, and yet it does. I crossed my arms, deep in thought. If Emma can portal us to that beach, and we set sail at twilight, we could be in the Spring Princess's court sooner than we imagined. The Sealy Stone could be in our grasp before the wedding even happens. That is, if she accepts your gift, Arthur reminded me. Do you think the Rusalka scale is a sufficient trade for the Sealy Stone, one of the most powerful magical objects of all time? I gave a heavy sigh. We're about to find out. Chapter 16 Emma Now that we had directions on how to get to the Spring Princess's Island, we couldn't wait. We had to leave immediately to obtain the Seely Stone and get that much closer to completing our quest. It was debated if Ethan and I should go at all, as we were the king and queen, and we couldn't go missing in an otherworldly fey realm while a war was going on. But I was the world weaver, and this was my responsibility, so it didn't feel like we had any other choice. We waited another day, then left before twilight. The others had stayed behind to remain inconspicuous and make excuses for our absence if we weren't back by morning. Arthur and Vara insisted on coming with us. I would have preferred to go there with just my mate, as I couldn't be sure that all of us would return from the Spring Princess's island. Yet Arthur insisted that we would need his extensive knowledge, and as Vara was his mate, she refused to let him go without her, even while six months pregnant. Where do I need to go, Arthur? We stood in my study, a parchment map of Edenmire spread over the table. It was old, several centuries. It had been made by a druid in the Middle Ages and was fading in several places. Since we'd lost our connection to Edenmire, the Fae hadn't been there since, so I wasn't even sure if this map was still accurate. Ethriel is here. Arthur pointed to a spot on the map, a dot on the southern end of Edenmire that faced the western sea. In all our meditations and your travels, we've explored the heart of Edemire. Our cottages are over here. We've never been this close to this side of Edemire. Arthur's finger drew across the other side of the map. It had to be a distance of a hundred miles. I was nervous about transporting us somewhere on Edemire I'd never been before. How do I portal us there? I asked. Just tear the portal to open up on the shores of Ithriel. With luck, we won't be too far off. Arthur rolled up the map and tucked it into his pack. I'd gone back to my cottage to grab my sword, just in case we needed it, and we probably would. Open up the portal, Emma. There's no time to lose, Arthur said. I took a deep breath. I went to summon the portal, but a little buzzing in my ear distracted me. Tigris whizzed around my head, bobbing up and down and making mewing noises. You want to come? I asked, and Tigris flew in a circle. All right, then. Stay close to me. Tigris landed on my shoulder, and I closed my eyes. I began to conjure the portal, thinking about my destination. Ithriel, Ithriel, Ithriel. I repeated it in my mind over and over, until I felt the connection between me and Edemire begin to blossom, and a portal expanded in front of us. The spinning portal glowed with my blue magic, though the darkness that showed within seemed foreboding. I wasted no time, because if I hesitated, I would lose my nerve. I stepped through the portal and left Earth behind me as I entered Edmire's welcoming arms. The melding colors of sunset encompassed me, and my feet hit sand. I heard the waves of the sea and inhaled the smell of salt water. Twilight illuminated the trees that surrounded the beach I'd landed on, and as I looked to my right, I saw the outline of a settlement a few miles off. 
buildings the elves had left behind, a monument to a city long abandoned years past. I hadn't noticed it before, but being an Edenmire physically, instead of just having your spirit there, felt so real. The difference was palpable. The air was richer, and the ground felt solid beneath my feet. Every molecule of my body was filled with magical energy. Again, I felt that longing to never leave here, and knew it couldn't be so. Tigress let out a little squeak of joy as he flew off my shoulder, darting from this way to that. Ethan, Arthur, and Vara stepped through the portal after me. My portal closed behind them, sealing us off from Earth and leaving us on the stark, cold beach. You did it, Emma, Ethan said, looking around with wonder. He and Arthur were in their woven bodies, as they couldn't maintain human forms while in Edenmire. Was there any doubt? Vara teased. She put a hand on her stomach and smiled. She wasn't carrying any weapons, as she couldn't use them. She'd have to rely on her magic if we got into trouble. The ocean was calling to me. I stepped up to the shoreline and let the waves wash over my boots. Unlike the sea back on Earth, Edenmire's waters literally looked like starlight. They were an expansion of space, black waters coated with the reflection of diamonds within. The glittering water literally looked like a mirror of galaxies. I dipped down to run my fingers through it and found the liquid thicker than I expected. It was some kind of black substance that stuck to my fingers. When I lifted my hand, I noticed it was covered in a stardust-like glimmer that shone similar to gemstones. That's the sea of stars, I breathed. It was gorgeous. Vara lit two torches and handed one to me. Well, we're here. What now? I've got it, Arthur said. Hold on. My brother closed his eyes, creating a complicated spell. With his magic, a long ship conjured within the waves. It was wooden, with two oars and a large red sail. The front of the long ship was carved like the head of a wolven, snarling into the waves. It was big enough to hold four people, but no more. Nice job, Arthur, I praised. Will it hold? My magic is stronger here in Edmire. The illusion will remain solid, at least until we get to our destination, Arthur said. We might as well set off. We climbed into the longship, mounted the torches against the mast of the ship, and began to row out to sea. Vara and I had to row, as Ethan and Arthur couldn't in their shifter forms. When we'd gotten far away from the shore, I adjusted the sail. The wind surged us forward, directly to the west. Tigris perched on the wolf's head at the top of the ship, the wind blowing his fur back. Now what do we do? I asked. We keep sailing west, Vara said. We'll get there eventually. How can you be so sure? Anxiety was eating up my insides. Now that the shoreline was gone, the only thing I could see around me was the black sea of stars, so beautiful and yet so deadly. I couldn't imagine what lurked beneath. We have to believe we're going to get there, or we won't. It's how the magic works, remember? Vara said. But how do we know if we've gone too far? I asked. We won't miss it, I'm sure, Vara said. How can you be so confident? Her faith was unwavering. Because this is where we belong. This is Edenmire. This is our home, and this land will respond to our magic, Vara said, jutting out her chin. It's the way it's always been. I loved her enthusiasm, but belief was always something that was a problem for me. I could do incredible illusion magic when I found the faith, but whenever it was lacking, my magic failed to provide. Here, on this dark night in this sea of stars, belief seemed silly and foolish. There wasn't a guiding light to lead us anywhere, just the torches blazing against the black. But all four of us had to believe we were going to get there, so I did my best to try. If I couldn't find my faith, I could at least hope that we'd arrive there by morning, so we wouldn't miss our chance to find the Sealy Stone. We sailed for about an hour. I knew our location had to be different, but our surroundings looked the same. Nothing had changed. I thought we'd never find this place. Then there was a strange sound in the air. The beating of wings, 
and a screeching noise that sounded like nails grinding against steel. My gut sank. That was a monster. Look there! Arthur pointed with his nose, and I spun around. My heart dropped as I saw a flock of large black birds the size of griffins flying toward us, letting out awful screeches. The rest of their features were shrouded by darkness. Tigris let out a growl as he faced them, beating his tiny wings. Alconosts, Arthur growled. He was already bristling, ready to attack. What are those? I hadn't learned about them in my classes. Demonic spirits of women who murdered their children, Arthur hissed. It is the fate of every sorceress who commits such a crime. Once she dies and her soul ventures to the great hunting grounds, she is cast out of the afterlife and changed by the goddess Neva as punishment. They'll feed on anything. We should have known that the Spring Princess would have monsters to guard her island, Ethan said. We'll have to fight them to get through. My sword sang as I unsheathed it. I quickly counted that there were five monsters. Not many, but they outnumbered us. Ethan gave a growl and jumped at the alkanost that approached. It screamed as Ethan's fangs sank into its belly and jerked backward. Arthur snarled at a group of alkanosts who had surrounded him, although his teeth missed. Vara sat in the back corner of the boat, an arm around her belly and a magical shield aloft. An alkanost flew above me, illuminated by the torchlight. Now that it was closer, I could observe the alkanost more carefully. It resembled a massive crow and had the upper half of a woman, breasts exposed, face jarring and pointed. Black, string-like hair ran down its gaunt face. The eyes were nothing more than empty sockets. In place of arms were dark wings, and the beast had spindly legs like that of a raven's, talons curved and sharp. The Elkanoth screeched at me, and I saw within its mouth that its teeth were pointed, meant to rip apart flesh. I had an immediate urge to kill it and swung my sword. The Elkanoth flew backward and let out a hiss. It attacked with its talons. One scraped me across the face, causing a gash. Wet blood oozed over my skin, and I cried out as some of it got into my eyes. The Elkanas dove again, but Tigris let out a fierce cry and flew forward. He hovered before me, letting out a fierce telekinetic blast. Once it hit the Elkanas that was attacking me, the bird burst into pieces, chunks of its body crashing onto the ship's floor and into the sea. Good boy! Tigris, protect Vara! I told him. Tigris flicked his tail and zoomed to Vara's side. He hovered in front of her shield, forcing the Alkanost that was attacking her to stay back with more telekinetic blasts. One of the Alkanosts landed on the ship and had Ethan backed against the side. Ethan darted out with his claws, but the Alkanost avoided his hits, trading Ethan's slashes with strikes from its talons. Ethan remained unharmed, but without room to move, he was cornered. While Ethan was keeping it distracted, I came up behind the Alkanost and severed its head. The body collapsed to the side, spewing blood as the head rolled this way and that with the roll of the sea. You okay? I asked. I looked at his shoulder. The Alkanost had cut him deeply with its talons. I'll be fine. Your brother needs us, Ethan said. Arthur had backed away against the front of the ship. Two Alkanosts had him trapped. One Alkanost dug its talons into Arthur's chest, and he gave a painful cry as blood gushed from his torso. Arthur! I ran forward. With a yell, I jumped into the air and cut my sword into the thigh of the Elkanos that had hurt him. The bird screeched, turning its attention to me. I swung my sword in an arc and backed away, beckoning it to come closer. The Elkanos dove. I stabbed upward at just the right moment and jerked my sword back. I cringed as organs fell out of the Elkanos's body from above and slopped onto the deck of the ship. The Elkanost went spiraling into the sea, its wings beating helplessly against the spray of the ocean as it sank under the waves and died. I tried to catch my breath as I turned toward Ethan and Arthur. They'd killed the other Elkanost together and were throwing the hacked remains of the bird back into the ocean. The last Elkanost had given up. It was fleeing east in the direction of land. Tigris watched it fly away with a satisfied huff. 
The boys busied themselves with tossing over the corpses of the Elkanosts that hadn't landed in the water, though the deck had been permanently stained. The whole ship stank of organs and blood made me want to heave. We got rid of them, Ethan said. He breathed heavily as he hung his head over the side of the ship, watching the pieces of the Elkanost flock sink to the bottom of the sea. But will they be the last? Arthur asked. He walked to the other side of the ship to help Vara to her feet. You okay? I asked her. I'm fine, Vara said with a wince. Usually, my magic would have been of more help, but my babies are restless. They have been since we started this trip. Their arrival in Edenmire is making them jump in my womb and press on my organs. Oh, I knew you shouldn't have come, Arthur said worryingly. I am here now, Vara replied. We have to make the most of it. I took a rag out of my pocket to clean my sword of blood before I added, We must be getting close, or at least close to some sort of island. The Elkanoths wouldn't have attacked if we were in the middle of the sea. I doubt they can fly far from shore. This is a positive sign. Perhaps the Spring Princess isn't as far away as we thought, Arthur offered. I was beginning to think so, but time soon changed my mind. Hours passed, until I was sure it was close to sunrise. We'd been sailing in silence for what felt like forever. We hadn't run into another living thing or another sign of the island since we had battled the Elkanosts hours ago. Both Arthur and Ethan had healed by now, and were looking just as concerned as I felt. We're going in circles. I couldn't help the despair that plagued my voice. I paced from one end of the longship to the other, feeling like there was nowhere to go. Vara was the only one who had any confidence left. She sat at the helm and said, Patience, we'll get there. Will we? It doesn't feel like it. The sea was wide and lonely, and I just wanted to go home. I was cold, wet, tired, and covered in blood. Yet we were no closer to the Sealy Stone than we'd been when we started. You can't rely on your feelings right now. You can only rely on what you know to be true, which is the magic in your blood, Vara insisted. We are close to the island. Can't you feel it? No. I crossed my arms. I was starting to think the well spirit had lied to us. You're ignoring what's right in front of you. Can't you see the truth? Vara asked. The sun is starting to come up. There's only a short time left until dawn. I pointed to the horizon. There, a thin red line was beginning to bloom, casting a tiny ray of light over Edenmire. The well spirit said we had to reach the island before sunrise. Otherwise, it'll move again. Then what are we going to do? You have to have faith in your destiny. Vara responded calmly. I snorted. Have faith. I have faith that we're going to be endlessly sailing on this ocean forever. My words were cut off as the ship abruptly rocked to the side. I fell to the floor and hit my head. I cried out, and Ethan scampered to help me. Are you all right, Onawilka? Ethan asked. He dragged me upright. I blinked a few times as the boat rocked violently underneath me. I think so. I shook myself out of it. Tigris was hovering before my face, mewling in worry. Arthur was trembling. He was looking behind me, face completely white. Irritation overpowered any fear I might have felt. I was tired of this. Gods, what is it now? Oh, Vodanoi, Arthur whimpered. Huh? Big fish. Ethan froze beside me, and I had the balls to turn around. I immediately wish I hadn't. Towering over us was a monstrous water creature. The monster was humanoid, standing on two legs. It had spines protruding from its back and webbed hands. It had scaly green skin and a long, reptilian face with giant lips and stringy seaweed for hair. If I had to guess... The monster was at least 60 feet tall. I physically felt the air whoosh out of my lungs as I observed the monster, who was most certainly the largest creature I'd ever seen. Um, yeah, that was one hell of a big fish. Row! Vara and I scrambled for the oars. It was a futile effort. 
but the only thing we could do was to escape. The longship moved forward at a snail's pace as the Vodanoi reared its head back, letting out a guttural sound before reaching out with one of its webbed hands. Hit the deck! I screamed. Tigris held on to my hair, and Vara and I lunged for the floor as the monster's hand swept into the ocean. A huge wave carried the ship, tossing it into the air. The ship roughly jerked to the side as it came crashing down upon the surface again. I had to dig in with my nails to keep from flying off while Ethan and Arthur were slammed against the hull. I thought for sure Vara had been tossed over until I looked to the side and saw that she was still here. How had she managed to remain on the ship? I had no time to wonder because the ocean churned again and clouds gathered overhead. Lightning flashed and the sound of thunder merged with the screams of the Vodanoi as the ship was yanked up and down. It's creating a storm, Vara called out. Pull the oars in and hold on, I ordered. Vara did as I said, and we flattened against the floor. The boys laid against the deck of the ship alongside us, clutching to the sides of the boat for dear life as it was tossed back and forth amongst the tumult of the Vodanoi storm. We hadn't had time to bring the sail in, and that was a cataclysmic mistake. The sail caught the wind and was ripped from one side to the other, the ship jerking against the fifty-foot waves. I thought for sure we'd go under, until the ship was pulled in another direction, and the process was repeated all over again. It was like being on the worst kind of roller coaster, not knowing whether you were going to live or drown by the end of it. Such a great wind whipped through the mast that it snapped in two. The sail was blown away, and the ship began spinning like a top. I felt queasy as the world turned into a blur around me, praying with all my might the gods had the mercy to spare us our fate. Ethan's choked noise beside me told me that the gods had no interest in stopping this. The Vodanoi was swirling his hands, creating a whirlpool. The whirlpool grew bigger and bigger, becoming an inescapable vortex that captured whatever it wished inside its domain. With horror, I realized that we were getting sucked inside, dragged to the bottom of the sea. This was my fault. If I had believed enough, we'd be at the Spring Princess's island by now. We wouldn't be getting sucked down into the depths of the ocean by some ugly-ass swamp monster wannabe. This was my fault. I tried to think of a spell that might save us, but none came. I desperately thought of my warm, comfortable room back at the palace and tried to create a portal there, but my magic flickered out and faded when I did my best to summon it. I was too scared. We were all going to die. The maelstrom sucked us in faster, and the ship broke in half. Vara, Tigris, and I were sent spiraling to one end, while Ethan and Arthur ricocheted to another. I held on to the fragmented deck of the longship, but Vara wasn't so lucky. She was sucked downward into the depths of the whirlpool. Even over the roar of the storm, I heard my brother's panicked cries. I caught a flash of red fur, then felt an intense pang of grief as I realized my brother had thrown himself into the whirlpool after her. We were dead. We were all dead. I sought out Ethan. My eyes caught his as his half of the longship ripped by mine, neither of us knowing what we should or even could do. There was a little growl in my ear. I felt tiny paws pad against my hair as Tigris pulled himself to the top of my head. Tigris, what are you doing? I screamed. My breath caught in my throat as I saw Tigris leap into the center of the maelstrom, his tiny fey body being yanked to the bottom of the sea. My jaw hung open. Tigris jumped into the whirlpool, on purpose. Fakin were supposed to be our guides. Tigris wanted me to follow him. He was my protector. He wouldn't lead me astray. Could have asked me to do something easier, damn it. I had to believe that I'd find the island in order to get to it, but how could I do that? I couldn't believe in something I couldn't touch, see, or feel, not in the middle of this monstrous storm. I didn't believe hard enough in the magic of the island, and now we were all going to die. But maybe there was another way. 
you couldn't believe something into existence, right? Things didn't just materialize out of nowhere because you believed hard enough in them. Even illusion magic had its limits. The spell could be cast only if you believed, but if there was fear, the magic failed to perform at all. I was so afraid right now, more scared than I had ever been in my entire life. And yet, perhaps I could still get past this, and the magic would save me, whether I believed or not. I had to take action, no matter what my emotions or logic was telling me. I'd be pulled down into the whirlpool whether I chose to or not. Might as well go willingly. Gotta have faith, right? Except this was the craziest thing I'd ever done. I looked at Ethan, and he caught the desperation in my gaze. Come on! I wasn't sure if he could hear me, but he'd get the message. I gritted my teeth and prayed that I was right as I launched myself off the remains of the longship and into the center of the whirlpool. Immediately, the water took control. I became completely submerged, my body trapped within the confines of the maelstrom. My limbs were ripped from side to side so harshly, I thought they might be yanked off, and I closed my eyes to deal with the pain as the water engulfed me. It was like being swallowed whole by some great beast. I was wondering if I'd be ripped apart or drowned first before I felt my body connect with solid land. My skin hit sand, and I gasped, coughing up water. My eyes opened. Sunlight was all around me as I struggled to my knees, looking around. I'd landed on an island. I had no idea how I'd gotten here. Seconds ago, I'd been caught up in the spray of the storm, and now I was lounging on a beach in the middle of the morning. There were beautiful, swaying trees all around me, and a forest bloomed just a short distance away. The entire island smelled like flowers. It was some sort of deciduous forest. There was a coughing sound next to me. Ethan had appeared where he wasn't before. His eyes were crazed as he gazed at me, spitting up water, his fur completely soaked. Down the shoreline, Vara and Arthur were already waiting, letting the waves wash over them as they attempted to recover from the whirlpool's power. Tigris buzzed above my head in circles and kissed my head, pleased that I'd followed him. The whirlpool must have been some sort of portal. It was a test to see if you took action despite your lack of belief. It only worked if you chose to face your fears willingly, despite the obvious reality looming over you. Amazing magic. I took some time to steady myself and catch my breath. When the world stopped spinning, I got to my feet and turned in place. I finally decided to start listening to Vara and tuned into my magic. The sensations pounding through my blood told me we'd landed in a realm of someone with great power. This was it. We'd made it to the island of the Spring Princess in one piece. But would we be able to leave? Chapter 17 Ethan Well, that was a new experience I never wanted to have. I staggered to my paws and helped Emma up. Both of us were covered in cuts and bruises from the maelstrom. Arthur looked similarly worn, though Vera appeared to have escaped the whirlpool mostly unscathed. Do you think the babies are all right? Arthur asked. He was crouching at Vera's side, nose pressed to her belly in concern. I believe so. I can still feel them moving inside of me, Vera said. I don't think the storm hurt them. Thank the gods, Arthur turned to us. We made it to the island. Now all we have to do is find the Spring Princess. Good, Emma grumbled. Let's get at it. Emma stumbled forward and nearly fell over. I had to catch her before she hit the sand. Tigris gave a tiny growl of concern. Emma, you need to rest, I insisted. You're exhausted. There's no time. She tried to rip her arm out of my grasp, but the attempt was frail at best. We can rest once we get this Seely Stone. Edmire's time is unpredictable. We don't know how much time has passed back on Earth. That much was true. We couldn't linger here. Even so, I worried about the repercussions to Emma's health if we continued forward. Get on my back. At least you won't have to walk, I offered. Emma didn't object, pulling herself onto my back. Her head hung as if she was having trouble staying upright. 
I certainly hoped the Spring Princess didn't desire a fight once we entered her court. Emma was in no shape for it. I could feel her hands shaking as she clung to my fur to stay on. You should ride too, Vera. Arthur used his head to help boost his mate onto his back. We ventured into the forest, keeping our wits about us. It wasn't hot on the island, as I expected. Rather, a cool breeze drifted through the air, making the temperature moderate. The very air seemed to glitter, a golden hue setting over the forest as we roamed down a twisting dirt path. As we headed farther in, the foliage grew more colorful. Cherry blossoms floated upon the wind, and tulips sprouted in mismatched rows alongside wildflowers and hydrangeas. Mushrooms dotted the path, marking their way up tree trunks covered in moss. Tigris flocked from flower to flower, collecting nectar and dusting his antenna with pollen. Yadviga Valdemar did not lie. It really is a land of eternal spring here, I noted, sticking my nose into a large flower. Do you hear that music? Arthur asked, lifting an ear. There were notes of flutes and harps upon the air. I figured we should follow the music and headed that way. The music got louder and more upbeat as the trees broke, and laughter drifted from the trees ahead. The court of the Spring Princess looked like one big garden. Ivy wound up the side of stone walls which made a fence around the area. Flowers grew in precise rows here, beside hedges that were trimmed in the shape of dancing sorceresses. There were a variety of orchards growing under rowan trees, thyme blooming beside hawthorn. Each plant in the garden was particularly beloved by the Fae, used in our spells and potions. I could feel my magic enhancing just being in the presence of these flowers and trees. In the center of the garden, a tea party was being held. Gossamer blankets made of what looked like sparkling dew were spread out along the grass. Lounging upon them were women, their skin a variety of bright colors, from pink to yellow to green. They ate figs, pomegranates, and decorated breads. They drank elderberry tea from precious china and spoke in sing-song voices. The women had pointed ears that curled at the ends and wore dresses sewn from foxglove and bluebell. In fact, I wasn't so sure the dresses they wore were actually clothing, but rather plants sprouting from their skin. Their wings were on full display, fluttering softly like those of butterflies as the breeze kissed their membranes. Their hair was pure white and nearly transparent, floating upon the air like it was made of cobwebs and sunlight. I wasn't sure what kind of fake in they were, but they were beautiful, and I knew that made them dangerous. There were no men here, besides Arthur and I. The Spring Princess only had ladies in her court. Besides the Fakin, there were dogs, dozens of them, all breeds and kinds. The Fakin tossed leather balls for big dogs to catch and cuddled tiny lap dogs in their arms. A couple of girls giggled as they played with a group of puppies who were tugging at the ends of their dresses with little growls. Tigris gave a weary growl, hiding behind Emma's hair at the sight of all the canines. I searched the party until my magic resonated with an individual near a picnic basket at the head of the group. It was a girl who couldn't be more than sixteen. She had a dotting of freckles across her face with doe-like eyes and long hair that spanned down her back. A crown made of flowers sat upon her head. Her dress was made of apple blossoms, spanning out around her in a magnificent train. The Fakin doted on her, laughing at her jokes and placing gentle touches on her arms. That had to be the Spring Princess. I was certain there was none other in this garden that shared her power, save for Emma herself. Though the girl looked harmless, I was sure she could blow us all to pieces if she wanted to. She was as old as time itself, and therefore we had to respect her if we wanted to earn her good graces and the Seely Stone. When we entered the garden, the Fakin looked up. Conversation bubbled as the female Fay watched us stroll toward the Spring Princess, whispering behind their long fingers. These Fakin weren't malevolent, but they were mischievous, which was just as bad, for a Fay, anyhow. Jokes our kind pulled usually ended up more fatal than fun. We had to keep our wits about us. Don't accept anything from anyone while we're here, I reminded everyone. Don't give any of them your name, either. No thank yous while we're at it, Emma added with a grumble. I gave a huff of agreement. All three of those situations could lead to bad contracts, and we didn't want to accidentally stumble into one while we were here. 
The dogs were jumping at Tigris as he fluttered by. A few almost caught him in their jaws, and he gave loud squeaks of displeasure. "'Tigris, get in my pocket,' Emma ordered. Tigris flew into the safety of Emma's jacket, and the dogs whined at the loss of their new game. The spring princess looked up as we ventured near. Emma and Vera slid to their feet. Arthur and I sank into bows, and the girls into curtsies. It was important we gave the proper respect. "'Your Highness,' I began, "'it is an honor to be in your court.' "'You have no need to bow, King of the Arcania,' the spring princess replied. "'My court has been preparing for your arrival and the arrival of the World Weaver.' I figured that she knew we'd be coming, but it was still unsettling. She spread her hand out and said, "'Come, sit among us. We were just enjoying breakfast.' Vera and Emma took seats on the gossamer blankets across from the spring princess, and Arthur and I laid beside them. Lavender bread was passed around. I was starving, but I knew better than to eat food here in Edinburgh, especially if it was prepared by these strange women. It'd get us stuck here. The spring princess caught our curious looks as we watched her court frolic among us. They are my villa, the spring princess said. I brought them here from the mountain range known as the Alps in your world many years ago, after the humans forgot what magic was, and there was no longer a place for them on earth. They remain virgins, as I, and live together with me in this female's paradise. Ah, Vila. I should have known. There were beautiful nymphs who had great affection for dogs, and were known to be one of the few amongst Fakin who could heal. As I was a fae myself, I was immune to their power, but other men, even supernatural, would fall victim to their charms. The blue-skinned Vila shuffled up to us and offered Emma an apple. For you, my dear. No, but I'll remember the offer, Emma replied kindly. The Vila retreated the apple and took a bite, giving a sly smirk. You desire something else, the spring princess said. The Seely Stone. That is what we are here for, Emma said, trailing off. She wasn't quite sure what to say. One wrong word could incur the Spring Princess's wrath. And you shall have it, the Spring Princess said. That is, if you have something to trade. Emma dug in her pocket. I nearly panicked for a moment, thinking we'd lost the Rusaka scale in the storm. But my shoulders relaxed as I watched her withdraw the scale from her wet clothes and set it before the princess. The Vila let out a collective coo, impressed with the stone's beauty. The spring princess's eyes glittered as she reached out to take the scale, observing the dazzling colors that reflected within. Yes, this will be a sufficient trade, the spring princess said, rising to her feet. World Weaver... You shall come with me. Your mate may follow, but the others will not. Splitting up sounded like a horrible idea, but we didn't have much of a choice. Emma and I got up to follow the spring princess into the forest, leaving Vera and Arthur alone with the villa. Arthur gave me a nervous glance, but I shook my head, telling him to stay calm. I made sure to stand beside Emma as we followed the spring princess through the forest. I wasn't sure what I could do to protect her if the Spring Princess attacked, but this place made me nervous. It was almost scarier than being in the middle of the Maelstrom, and that was awfully terrifying. This is how the Fae used to live, the Spring Princess said idly as we continued our walk. In peace and harmony, feasting daily and enjoying nature, not battling for power or killing for glory. The world of humans has infected us. But can we be saved? Emma dared to ask the question, tucking a strand of hair behind her ear. It's why you're here, isn't it? The trees created a circular exit into a small grove. Sitting on a tree trunk was a small wooden box. The spring princess picked up the box and turned toward us. You sailed across the sea of storms, fought my alkanosts, and traveled willingly through the portal that the Vodanoi created displaying your action in spite of your fear, the spring princess said. Therefore, you have proven yourself worthy and earned the Seely Stone. 
The spring princess pressed the wooden box into Emma's hands, and she opened it. Sitting upon a velvet pillow was a silver circlet. Set into the middle was a dazzling square emerald. My heart pounded as I looked upon the illustrious gem, and Emma's face shone with a mixture of worry and hope. One more. Just one more stone, and we'd have all six. We could open the portal to Edinburgh again. The Fay wouldn't die. We could still save our people, save our country. The end was so close to being in sight. And yet, there was danger. We had five stones. We couldn't risk losing a single one. Emma closed the lid and clutched the box to her chest. You have no idea what this means to us, how much we've had to go through just to get here. I am aware of the trials you have suffered, and I have knowledge of all that is yet to come, the spring princess replied. Your task is far from over, world weaver. I suggest you summon your courage, for the path you are sure to walk is still heavy with dangers. Let this be a warning not to get too comfortable and not to claim victory before it is won. Emma nodded slowly. The spring princess gestured for us to follow. It is time for you to return home. Come. I let out an anxious breath. I wasn't sure if she was going to let us leave, but so far she'd been nothing but helpful. And yet, I still felt like something wasn't right. My suspicions were confirmed when we returned to the tea party and saw that all of the Vila, along with their dogs, had trapped Arthur in a circle. He'd somehow been changed back into his human form and was stuck in the middle of all those women. The band had struck up a fast tune. The Vila were dancing, twirling in circles, while Arthur waltzed from one girl to the other. Vera stood on the outside of the circle, holding her belly and looking furious. Emma's face whitened when she saw her brother, who appeared red-faced and exhausted. Arthur's eyes were clearly muddled over, a blank expression on his face, glasses and hair askew. He'd been bewitched. His breath was labored as he danced faster and faster, tripping over his own feet in an attempt to keep up with the Vila's wild movements. The spring princess watched the dance with a vague satisfaction, looking amused. Vera saw the spring princess and waddled over. You! Stop this at once! She barked. My mouth dropped open at her insolence. How could she challenge such a powerful being, one who was practically a goddess without fear? Vera's expression remained hard, but the spring princess let out a tinkling laugh. It's just a bit of fun. They're going to dance him to death, Vera demanded. That was a likely possibility. I feared Arthur's heart would burst, or he'd break a leg trying to keep up. He was wheezing as the Vila tossed him from one way to the other. The music increased in intensity, going faster and faster. The spring princess shrugged. He would be able to keep up, if not for the diluted humanity of his blood. The Fae should have never been made mortal. Call them off! I insist! Vera nearly screamed. I protect my Vila, but I do not control them. They are free creatures to do as they please, and bringing men into my court was very foolish. You should have known they would find him interesting. The spring princess replied. So what are you asking? Vera said through clenched teeth. A gift is needed. What shall you offer them? in exchange for your mate's life, the spring princess asked. Vera's upper lip stiffened, her hands clenched as if she knew this provocation was coming. She took a long sigh, then she clutched her stomach, looking regretful as she replied. Years off my life. It was the same thing Lucian had offered, to leave the island when he'd been stolen here as a child. Vera, no, Emma started. Vera slashed a hand through the air. We need to get home, Emma. This is my offering, years off my life in exchange for the life of my mate. We leave your court and go back to Earth free. The spring princess smiled. A proper exchange. Very well. She clapped her hands and the band ended the song. The Vila stopped dancing. The enchantment broke from Arthur's eyes. He gave a gasp, collapsing on his knees. He bent over as he gagged, body shuddering in exhaustion. Vera hurried to him, though her pregnancy prevented her from kneeling at his side. I may heal him, <laughs> Avila offered, strutting forward with a giggle. You will heal him, Vera demanded, expression burning as she glowered at the Vila.
and you shall ask for nothing in return. The Vila nodded weakly at Vera's ire, then put a hand on Arthur's shoulder. A soft glow emitted there. I watched carefully, for I had never seen healing magic in person and wanted to observe how it worked. As the white glow of the healing magic settled over him, Arthur straightened, although his body still slackened with exhaustion as he mumbled, What? What happened, Vera? It is nothing, she said. She jerked her head at me, and I hurried forward to help Arthur to his feet. You were under a spell for a bit, that's all. Arthur shook his head, dazed. Emma clutched the box that held the sealy stone to her chest, looking pissed off as the spring princess spread her fingers wide. A portal grew in front of us, the edges of it spinning like flower petals within the garden's center. Enter through my portal, and you shall find yourself back where you belong, the spring princess said. Let's go, Vera muttered. I'm tired of these games. Vera took Arthur's arm and pulled him off of me. They stepped through the portal together, vanishing from our sight. Heed my words, world weaver, the spring princess said, as Emma and I stepped up to the portal. Your quest is nearly complete, but the hardest part of your journey is still ahead. You will have to exhibit more than strength and courage to obtain what you desire. You are moments away from claiming victory, and yet you could still fail. Don't underestimate what's inside you, for if you do, the Fae are surely doomed. I'll keep that in mind, Emma said flatly, a very sassy response for such a gloomy warning. We walked side by side into the portal. As we emerged on the other side, spring turned into winter. I inhaled a crisp, frozen breeze as we appeared on palace grounds, snowflakes trickling down from above. It was still dark. Couldn't be more than one in the morning. We'd been gone for nearly a day in Edmire time, but on Earth, only an hour had passed. No one would even notice our absence. A very rare stroke of luck. There was a soft mewling as Tigris zoomed out of Emma's pocket, happy he didn't have to hide from the dogs anymore. I changed back, stretching out my arms. Being in one form for too long, shifter or otherwise, was maddening. Arthur was able to stand on his own, but he still looked weary. He and Vera pressed in around us as the portal closed. He asked, Did you get it? Emma opened the lid to the box. Arthur adjusted his glasses to look closer at the emerald's sheen and gave a resolute nod. Thank the gods. We have five crystals now. The last shouldn't be difficult to find. Don't get too comfortable, Emma said. If anything, I bet the unseely stone will be the hardest to obtain, and we still have to find it yet. We will, Onovilke, just like we found all the others, I told her. There are two winters before your prophecy is destined to be fulfilled. We have plenty of time. Or perhaps not enough, Vera whispered. Her gaze seemed dark. She held tightly to Arthur's arm as she pulled him toward the palace. You need sleep, Arthur, and so do I, for all that is to come. Arthur and Vera walked off, their footsteps crunching in the snow. I crossed my arms and said, I hope Vera's offering to save Arthur's life doesn't cost her something dear. It's a tragedy to die young. Emma gave a shrug. I'm not too worried. My father offered the Spring Princess years off his life to leave her island, and he's still around. Maybe that will also be Vera's fate, I mused. Lord Lucian was still living, and perfectly healthy besides, despite his bargain with the Spring Princess. Though Vera had made a trade for Arthur's life, I didn't think she was going anywhere. She was young, and I was certain her demise wasn't any time soon. I waited until they were out of earshot before I said to Emma, I think there's something Vera isn't telling us. A horrid thought had crossed my mind as Vera had left. Emma had just realized it, because she let out a dramatic gasp. No, she started. It can't be. Can it? My tone was hard. Vera could be the one betraying us to Gabby. Emma turned to me. I refuse to believe it. She's our friend, Ethan. And we know one of our friends has betrayed us. Don't you think how Vera spoke to the Spring Princess was strange? No, Emma quipped harshly. Well, I do. It was nearly as if she knew the Spring Princess personally, like they'd met before and her anger with her was justified. Emma paused. It does bother me that she knew the island so well. 
Maybe a changeling also took her to the spring princess's land when she was a child? Like Lucian? Then she must have told Arthur about it, and he's keeping secrets from us too, I insisted. No, he would tell me. Emma took a step back, like the idea of her twin keeping secrets was repulsive. People don't come back from the spring princess's island, remember? How can she and Lucian have both escaped? It might not be as hard as the legends say. After all, we came back, Emma pointed out. But it wasn't easy. We nearly lost Arthur while doing so. I shoved my hands in my pockets because there were just too many coincidences for this not to line up. Vera was awfully calm when we were sailing to the island. She jumped into the whirlpool first of her own accord before any of us. She knew how to get there. It has to be something innocent. Fay crossbreed all the time. What if she's part Vila and that's how she knows the Spring Princess, Emma suggested. The Spring Princess said her Vila were all virgins. That can't be it. One could have run off with a shifter. I hardly believe the Spring Princess would allow such a thing to happen, I growled. I know you don't want to face facts, but the evidence all points to Vera. We need to imprison her before she hurts anyone else. This is my twin's mate you're talking about, Emma said, an edge of hardness to her voice. We know the traitor is in our inner circle. Vera's your handmaiden. She volunteered to take the job and lower her station in the eyes of the court. What do you think that means? That she wants to help us, Emma growled. No, she has access to all of our rooms. She's one of the few people who does. It wouldn't be strange to think that she planted the doll in Kiara's chamber. More than that, she's always around whenever we have important conversations about the war. She could have slipped information about Pruska's siege to Gabby easily. Tie that in with the fact she had more information about the Spring Princess than we did, and it's a certainty she's hiding something. She's so sweet and kind. I refuse to believe it, Emma insisted. Kindness can be faked. Her friendship could be a ruse to get our guard down, I said. Arthur is loyal to us. It's hard to keep things from your mate. If Vera is betraying us, he would know and he'd tell me, Emma said. They might not have a choice, I reasoned. What if Gabby is threatening their children, saying she'll hurt them once they're born if Vera doesn't do what she says? Vera might not want to betray us, but what if she's being coerced? We don't have any real proof. I'm not accusing my brothers mate of something that vile unless we know for sure, Emma insisted. I scowled. We need to talk to them about it, at the very least. Like hell! That's going to start a war between me and my brother, Emma said. Arthur's been vital to our mission so far. He's helped us out so much. We wouldn't have found the Seely Stone without him. I'm not pissing him off now when we're this close to uniting the crystals. Then we need to keep an eye on her, I said. As the saying goes, we keep our friends close, but our enemies closer. We watch her every move, and now that we're on to her, we just have to catch her in the act. I still think there's more to this story, Emma grumbled, turning away. There might be, but until we know for sure, we can't take any chances. Something about Vera just didn't add up. Emma wasn't convinced, but I was all but certain Vera was ferrying information to the enemy. She was the traitor. She had betrayed us and taken Gabby's side. The only question I still had was, why? Chapter 18 Emma Do you have the authoring? Delmare asked. She smeared black paint over my eyes as Kiara gave the finishing touches on the runes written across my cheeks. Odette draped a white fur shawl over my shoulders to keep out the cold. My quarters were dimly lit as I slipped into a pair of fur boots and fixed my white cotton dress. I nodded at Delmare's question, though I wasn't sure if what I was about to offer was adequate. It was the night before my wedding, and I was to go to the sacred gathering to give an offering to Ethan's ancestors in the hope that they'd accept me into their family. It was a tradition every sorceress followed before her wedding, though as Kiara explained to me, it could have terrible consequences if Ethan's ancestors didn't find me worthy. If they liked me, they'd accept our union and send good things along the way to bless our marriage. If not, well, they'd sure do whatever they could to make things difficult along the way. I really hoped I impressed them. 
I didn't need bad luck sent by Ethan's ancestors along with everything else. I was nervous enough about the wedding tomorrow. My stomach was in knots. It's midnight, Kiara said. Let's go. We left the palace and entered the woods. It was a pitch black night, full of stars and the sight of the waning crescent moon. All I could see ahead of me was the gently falling snow and the illusion I'd cast in my hand for light. Guards trailed our movements, but they kept a respectable distance. Tonight was a sacred night in our religion, and they didn't wish to compromise things for me. They were only there for protection in the event that Gabby sent anyone to try and stop me. And she'd already tried. Two assassins had been caught waiting in the woods outside the sacred gathering, lying in wait for me to walk by. We couldn't marry without me performing the ritual, and Gabby knew that. I was certain the woods had been cleared by soldiers, but I still kept my wits about me as I walked through the trees. As I came to the edge of the gathering, I looked back. My friends did not follow. This is something you must do alone, Kiara said, but we will be in the woods behind you. I nodded again. I didn't seem to have words. I left my friends behind me as I made my way through the rest of the trees until I came to the site of the circular clearing I'd grown so familiar with. A lantern had been hung from a tree branch. I placed my illusion inside for light as I proceeded toward the center of the sacred gathering. The cauldron still hung in the middle, but before it was an altar that I'd set up that morning. The wooden table was coated with a soft layer of snow and contained two candles, a white and a black. I placed my offering on the ground as I took a match and lit the two candles, speaking the beginning of the ceremony. Ancestors of one I hold so dear, draw me close and bring me near. I stepped away from the table and shivered. Maybe it was a good thing Queen Antonia wasn't dead yet. She wouldn't be able to curse me from the beyond for being with her son. I took a few gold coins from my pocket and put them beside the candles. I call upon the ancestors of Ethan Nowak, king of the Arcania and my true mate, I said. Come into the sacred gathering, and I shall bring you gifts of goodwill. It felt like I was talking to no one, and that wasn't a good sign. It was as if the area surrounding the sacred gathering grew even colder as I said, I bring you this offering. Bless our union and our marriage. Protect us from evil shield us from misfortune, and surround us with love as we continue onward in life. Bless our children, our home, and the life we will create together. I nearly stumbled over the part about children. I wasn't sure if Ethan and I would ever be parents, and I didn't know if his ancestors would be mad at me for failing to provide any heirs. But I was his true mate, and they knew that. I just hope they accepted it. I began placing items on the table. I'd brought a jar of mead, which was a favorite of King Lycus's, and a plate full of food that I'd made by hand, including pierogies and kielbasa. I'd done my best to research his ancestors as far back as I could, so I could bring things I'd know they like. Most ancestors on his father's side had been peasants, but as I expected, on his mother's side, there were a host of snooty nobles I had to impress. I placed a necklace of pearls on the table for one of his great aunts, as well as a diamond brooch for his maternal grandmother, who died before Ethan ever had the chance to meet her. I'd saved no expense in trying to impress these people, but as I laid the offerings on the altar, I wondered if I'd made a mistake. Would they think I was trying to buy them off? Once I was done placing the offerings, I got to my knees before the altar. I give you this offering as a humble gesture. Accept me into your family, and I will use my magic to protect my shifter, my descendants, and my home. Now I had to wait for a sign. I really hoped these people didn't take all night. It was freezing out here. My knees grew wet from the snow as I began to shiver as the night pressed in. The candles began to burn low, running out of wax. Nothing happened until I heard a howl on the wind, and all went still. The candles suddenly blazed to life. It was as if I could feel the presence of King Lycus as I knelt in the glade. I could tell it was him, because he had this fatherly presence about him that was warm and comforting. 
His spirit reminded me of Ethan, brave and gentle. Although I couldn't see him, I was certain he was there. I felt a firm weight on my shoulder, as if someone's hand was resting there. I'd felt something similar over a year ago, when I'd sat vigil at King Lycus's grave during Heim's Canoon and was instantly put at ease. I heard whispers, the presence of other spirits, although I didn't feel them as strongly as King Lycus's soul. Where I'd felt alone before, I was certain there were dozens of spirits around me now, swarming around the altar and muttering profusely. Abruptly, the candles went out. The weight from my shoulder was gone, and the only sound was the whispering of the wind. I immediately felt alone again. I stood, approaching the altar and looking for anything substantial, but nothing had changed. I wouldn't really know if they'd accepted my offering until good or bad things started showing up in my life, but nothing had been thrown off the table or broken, which I'd heard had happened to other sorceresses, so that was a good sign. I took the offerings of food, riches, and drink and buried them in the forest, far beyond the sacred gathering and deep in the ground. It was hard digging a hole in the frozen earth, but the illusion shovel I'd conjured was able to cut through the hard dirt without too much trouble. Did it go well? Kiara asked as I returned to the woods. I believe so, I told her. I felt King Lycus. I think he liked me. Of course he likes you, Delmare said. What about the rest of them? I'm not sure. I didn't get confirmation either way, I said. That's probably a good thing, Kiara said. Lady Alva told me when she made the offering before her wedding day, the altar split in two. She had nothing but poor luck until her husband died. Well, who would want that rotten old crone in their family? Odat asked. Certainly not me. There was still another ceremony I had to get through before I was able to walk down the aisle, and my friends had to help me with it. We returned to the palace grounds. We shed our cloaks once we entered the beautiful garden that was always springtime, under the lure of a powerful illusion. Ethan had taken me here years ago, the night we'd written the Windfarers all over the city. The wicker bench and the stone table had been moved to make room for an intricately carved wooden chair, incense holders, a cauldron filled with cold water, and a stone fire pit. There was already a small fire blazing in the pit. I sat on the chair while Kiara lit the lavender incense. Odette sprinkled dried rose petals into the water, and Delmer withdrew from her pocket a bottle of Siberian cedar oil. In many pagan cultures, as well as the Arcanias, they had the concept of the triple goddess, the maiden, mother, and crone. The maiden represented youth, virginity, and the freedom of unmarried women. The mother represented fertility, married life, and patience with the struggles and joys of adulthood. The crone represented wisdom, transformation, and powerful magic. The crone was the strongest, as she held the height of a woman's abilities at the end of her life, gained from all the knowledge she'd acquired over the years. Tonight, I was stepping away from the maiden stage of my life and becoming the mother by preparing to marry Ethan. Kiara faced me. As she was studying to be a priestess, she was leading the ceremony. Emmeline Sosna. Are you ready to grieve for the life of the maiden you are leaving behind, and willing to receive the blessing of the mother you are about to become? I am, I said. I let go of my maiden life. With this ritual, I transform into the mother and become the wife that my family needs me to be. Then let us begin. With handkerchiefs, Kiara and Odette used the rose water to wipe my face of the black paint before cleaning my hands and arms. Odette took a few drops of cedar oil and massaged it into my hair, muttering an incantation to her goddess, Vesna, in Malovian. As they worked, I felt sadness wash over me. I was leaving my childhood behind. The semblance of life I'd had while a student at Arcania University was something I hadn't lived for a while now, but up until this point, I was still clinging to it. I missed it. I missed the freedom of being unbound of being responsible only to myself and what I wanted. And yet, even as the tears welled up in my eyes at the thought of what I'd left behind, I didn't long for it like I had in the past. I'd been a victim to fate, fighting with all my might against the will the gods had for me. Not so anymore. As of now, 
I finally felt ready to let that old life go and step into my full potential as a wife and as queen. I was no longer a victim. I was a powerful ruler now, and I wasn't afraid of the future anymore. Whatever happened, be it my life or death, I was prepared to face it. As they finished applying the rose water and cedar oil, the girls made a half circle around me. I lifted my arm to display the charm bracelet Odette had made me long ago, the key Professor Calliope gave me dangling from the end. Gifts were provided by the bride's friends on the night before her wedding, as a symbol of what she'd learned on her journey to womanhood. We'd chosen charms to add to my bracelet, so I'd always remember the lessons I'd learned during my time here in Malovia. Odette bounced forward first. She latched a charm of a Celtic friendship knot onto my bracelet. The most valuable lesson I've learned as a woman is that friendship is necessary for a woman to survive. The bond between women is just as strong, sometimes even stronger, than the bond between a sorceress and her mate. Love comes in many forms, and one is just as valuable as another. Remember that no matter where you find yourself, you will always have friends there to support you on your journey. All you have to do is be willing to reach out to them with an open heart. Odette's message was so sweet and kind, just like her. I loved how sincere her words were. I knew my friends would always be there for me whenever I needed them. She moved aside so Delmer could give her offering. Delmer gifted me a charm of a tree, its branches growing in complicated knots until it formed a circle. She said, The most valuable lesson I've learned as a woman is that my journey comes in cycles. Let this charm be a reminder that life moves in circles from one season to the next, and one is never the same as the other. Good times will end, as well as bad, and things will always change. Remember that the cycles of life will continue to teach you as you move forward on your journey. Be willing to honor each season as it arrives, no matter what's to come. Delmer put a hand on her growing belly, and I gave a solemn nod. Life was always changing. Things were even changing between Ethan and I, and they always would. Our relationship wouldn't stay the same forever, and neither would the relationships between me and my friends. But they'd evolve and grow, and those cycles would always offer something new to learn, appreciate, and cherish. Kiara was last. She took a pause before she clipped on the charm of a seven-pointed star, the Star of the Fae and a symbol of the Seven Gods, onto my bracelet. She sighed before she spoke. The most valuable lesson I've learned as a woman is you need help to survive. Without hope, power and riches are meaningless. Hope is the thing that keeps us going and that promises life is worth living. It always endures, even in the worst of times. If you don't have hope, you cannot believe in anyone else, and you especially can't believe in yourself. Remember that hope will always be your greatest ally because it drives us onward to do the impossible and teaches us that you shouldn't give up on the world, even if the world has given up on you. Kiara's message made me tear up. So many times on my quest as the world weaver, I'd given up hope. I thought there was no escaping whatever awful path I'd found myself on. But however grim things had seemed, holding on to just a shred of hope that we weren't all damned to darkness had gotten me through it. The war was coming to a head. Things would only get worse from this point out, but if I held on to hope, Ethan and I just might be able to keep Malovia together. You are blessed by the warmth and the love of our goddesses. Leave your maidenhood behind and arise a mother, Kiara stated. I got to my feet just as Kiara, Delmer, and Odette used the rose water to put the fire out. The smoke filtered into the air, and I raised my head to the sky finally feeling ready for whatever was out there for me to face. I felt... different. I was a changed person again, and I would continue to change as life cycled onward so long as I had hope and friendship to guide the way. Yay! Odette clapped her hands eagerly. Now for the fun part! Now for sleep, I complained, rubbing my eyes. You do need your beauty rest, Kiara said. You have a big day tomorrow. And we have to get up early, Delmer added. 
Do you feel ready to take your vows? Odette squeaked as we made our way back to the palace. I gave a wide smile. For the first time, excitement, instead of nervousness, bloomed in my chest. Absolutely. Tomorrow, I was marrying my soulmate. I'd never been more ready for a new chapter of my life to begin. I awoke to birdsong on my wedding day, the sun lightly tickling my face as it squeezed through a crack in the curtains. I'd actually slept really good. Since I'd given the offering last night, any worries or fears about my wedding had melted away. I was certain nothing could get me down. I was half convinced the reception could catch on a fire and it wouldn't matter because Ethan Nowak was mine. Ethan had spent the night in one of the royal guest rooms. I bet he was already up. I couldn't wait to see him today. I wasn't supposed to have any contact with him, but I couldn't resist brushing up against his consciousness just once. I immediately got a teasing sensation. He thought I was being naughty. He was excited too. I was counting the minutes until I could get down that aisle to see him. Emma, wake up! My peaceful morning was immediately ruined by Odette breaking the door down. I think she actually kicked it. She jumped onto bed and sprawled on top of me, giving me a very squeezy hug. You're getting married today! Yeah, if you don't choke me, I forced out. I pushed her off me, only to be tackled by Down There and Kiara next. The girl smushed me into a giant group hug, which was kind of hard to do with Del Mare's baby belly in the way. Today's the day, Odette cheered, getting to her feet and bouncing up and down. Emma's going to be a wife, Kiara cried out. The girls jumped on the bed and started smacking each other with pillows. They broke open and feathers started flying everywhere. I laughed and grabbed a pillow, whacking Odette in the face before I socked Kiara in the gut. Feathers fell like snowflakes, coating the room. Delmare put her hands over her head and spat out feathers that landed in her mouth. The photographer was already here and had slipped in. She took a few pictures of our pillow fight, looking amused. What is this nonsense? Lady Wilmaette strode in, looking displeased. Her lips pinched as she saw the mess we'd made. Just letting out a bit of nerves, I chuckled. My queen, I beg you to get down from there before you break an ankle, Wilma Ed said shortly. Today is no day for tomfoolery. Oh, God, she was already starting. To her, this was a day for battle, not a day for celebrating. She had the highest intentions to pull off the noblest royal wedding without a single flaw. I hopped off the bed and said, Fine. How do I look? Fit to be a bride? I'd said it mostly to annoy her because it was funny. My red hair was a wild mess, and my nails, which had been manicured yesterday, already had a chip in them that needed to be fixed. Wilma at nose twitched. Perfectly adequate, though I swear you had more freckles this morning than you did last night. And they're beautiful freckles, Delmare shot at her. Of course they are. Wilmat replied. We'll accent them. Now, time is short, ladies. We have much to do and so little day to finish it. We had a nice breakfast of tea with avocado toast before the stylists rushed in to do our hair and makeup. My hair was pulled back to a high bun at the top of my head, with a few curls framing my face. I opted for light makeup, although Wilma Ed and I got into an argument about wearing false eyelashes. She won that one. The false eyelashes were annoying at first, but I grew used to them quickly and found I liked the way they looked. Kiara, Delmer, and Odette chattered eagerly as they placed small white flowers around the base of my bun. The flowers were an important tradition. They were placed in my hair by my bridesmaids and would be a big part of the ceremony later. As the girls finished fastening the last of the flowers around my bun, I sipped on champagne and tried not to ruin my lipstick. Afterward, my bridesmaids busied themselves with placing flower crowns around their own heads, fussing that they weren't straight. It wasn't long after that Farah slipped in. She'd already had her hair and makeup done and looked perfect as always. Is there anything you need from me, my queen? She asked. As your handmaiden, I am here to serve. More company is always welcome, I said. 
I'm so jittery, I feel like I'm going to jump out of my skin. If you can sit with me for a while, it would help. Vara gave a kind smile. I can do that. I was a little wary around her. Unlike Ethan, I didn't believe Vara was the traitor. That didn't mean there wasn't a concerning amount of evidence that ruled against her. I tried to monitor myself around her and paid attention to her behavior, though I felt guilty about it. This was my brother's mate, after all. I wanted to trust her, though I wasn't sure if I could. She sat on the stool beside me. We were getting a short break for lunch before my dress arrived. Servants placed chicken salad on allergy-friendly croissants before us. I eagerly dug in. I was hungry again. While Odette and Delmer tried to remove a champagne stain from Kiara's dress in a panic. How are you feeling after our little trip? I asked Vara. I dropped my voice and leaned in so the servants wouldn't hear. She shifted in discomfort. To be honest, I'm a little uneasy. The babies have hardly stopped moving since we returned. Do you think something's wrong? I asked. Vara shouldn't have promised the Spring Princess years of her life. I'm not sure, but I'm trying to keep quiet. I haven't told Arthur about the deal I made, Vara said. It would only upset him. You'll have to be honest with him eventually, Vara. I know, Vara said. After the babies are born, I'll tell him. I didn't like hiding things from my brother, but I also knew better than to interfere with what went on between mates, so I resolved to keep Vara's secret. For now, at least. This made me wonder further if Ethan was right and Vara wasn't who I thought she was. Odette loudly cleared her throat, and the room's attention turned to her. The double doors to the royal quarters opened, and Odette did a little twirl. Ta-da! Odette sang, flourishing her hands. I am proud to present the queen's wedding gown. The mannequin was wheeled into the room by servants. As I first caught sight of my wedding dress, I gasped aloud. I'd never seen a more eye-catching dress. It was off the shoulder and had long sleeves that billowed outward, made of sheer white fabric. The skirt blossomed into an A-line. On top of the ivory satin were lace snowflakes accented with crystals. Pearls and diamonds had been stitched into the corset's front. I observed the gown with an open mouth. Wilmette looked very concerned. Do you like it, my queen? I love it, I insisted. I rushed forward and dared to skim my fingers along the magical gown. This is perfect, Odette. How did you know? Because I know you, Odette gushed. I thought the snowflakes were very Emma. You made it just like I imagined, I said. I couldn't believe she'd pinned me so well. Oh, Emma, it's so lovely. There was a shrill scream as my mother waltzed into the room. She was already wearing her sapphire blue dress, her hair pinned up in a very casual way. She swept around my wedding gown, looking impressed before giving me a one-armed hug. You're going to be a stunning bride. Thanks, Mom. A couple of the stylists were giving my mother harsh glares, but I shot them dagger eyes, and they showed themselves out. It's time for the bride to slip into her dress, Wilmaat urged. We're already running late. The dress was wheeled into the bedroom. I changed, and my mother tied up the back of the corset. As I spun around to face myself in the mirror, a visage of shock took over my features. I couldn't believe that I appeared so beautiful. The dress was everything I imagined and more. I looked like the queen I wanted to become. I wasn't sure if I was her yet, but I aspired to be. I hoped Melovia would see that today. Mom wiped a tear away as she looked me up and down. My baby's all grown up. I've still got a lot of growing to do. I kissed her cheek, and my mother fastened the veil into my bun. The veil itself matched my dress, and was decorated with the same snowflakes that were on my skirt, but I thought it was kind of ridiculous. Because, you know, it was twenty feet long. I didn't know who needed a twenty-foot-long veil, besides pretentious people. And queens, apparently. The heavy thing weighed down my head as my mother folded up the tail end and held it off the ground. Five minutes from departure, my queen, Wilmaette said, poking her head in. My stomach jumbled. So much time had passed already, and now 
We were about to leave for the cathedral. Soon, the ceremony would start. I couldn't imagine dragging this event out any longer than pomp and circumstance would allow. Traditionally, fairy weddings took place over seven days, but I wasn't about to indulge the court in such a wasteful party, especially since the Black Claw was due to harvest my blood three days from now. We were having the wedding, then getting out of the country before the cult had a chance to kidnap me. The eclipse was drawing near, but instead of feeling afraid, I felt ready. I was making the biggest decision of my life. Not even the Black Claw could get in my way. Even so, we were trying to follow as many Fae traditions as we could. I wasn't taking Ethan's last name. Fae queens didn't share the surnames of their husbands, so I would remain Sosna even after we were wed. We departed from the royal quarters and made our way to the palace's entry hall. Ethan was already at the cathedral, waiting for me. My heart pounded just thinking about him. I wanted this to be over already so I could be with him. Near the palace's double doors, I saw Lord Lucian. He looked very dashing in his Melothian uniform. When he saw me, he lit up. He took my hand and kissed it as he said, You are absolutely stunning, Jika. Ethan is lucky to have you. A moment of panic rolled through me. Would Lucian be walking me down the aisle? We hadn't really discussed it beforehand. I avoided the topic every time it came up, because, honestly, I wasn't ready, and it didn't feel right to tell him no and break his heart. He was my father, after all, but I didn't feel comfortable with the thought of him giving me away. He loved me, but he hadn't been there when I was a child, and I was still getting to know him as an adult. But Lucian stepped aside. It was my brother who came forward to take my arm. He was wearing a gray tuxedo with an ice blue tie. His green eyes crinkled with humor as he took me in. Uh, you look better than you do most days. Fuck off. I smacked Arthur in the chest and he snickered. Lucian strolled out of the palace with my mother to join the royal caravan. As they slipped out the front door, tears spilled out the corner of my eyes. Lucian had understood and given me what I needed even at his own sacrifice. That gift was the best thing he could have offered me on my wedding day. People began hurrying into the cold. My bridesmaids, along with Vara, took their own coach. Soon, it was only me left waiting inside the palace. Arthur had ducked outside to double-check with the staff if we were ready to leave. The click of heels on the marble floor made me turn. Lady Magdalena strolled my way, wearing a sparkling silver gown and looking as elegant as ever, a feather tucked into her hair. Her eyes were approving as she surveyed me. She let out a soft sigh. How you've grown. Lady Magdalena reached out and squeezed my shoulders. To think that you arrived at my university three years ago not having a clue about our world, and here you are now, a sorceress in her own right, with a mate to claim and the world at her feet. I hope I've made you proud, I said. Prouder than you could imagine, Magdalena replied with a soft chuckle. She leaned in and gave me a peck on the cheek. Now go out there and put on a good show. You deserve this day. Her smile faltered a little as she whispered, It will be one of the last happy ones you have. My heart sank, but only a little as Lady Magdalena strode out to take her own carriage. Whatever the future held, Ethan and I were tied together for better or for worse. There was no fear ahead for me, only reassurance that I was doing the right thing, even if the ending result was sorrow. Hands pressed a bouquet of white roses into my hands, urging me forward. Into the carriage, Wilma Et ushered. The doors opened. Damn, it was a cold-ass day. Snow was falling like crazy. The clouds were overcast, and Dolinska was covered in a thin blanket of ice and snow. As soon as I stepped out of the palace, the city went nuts. People had already surrounded the palace to watch the royal caravan leave. My carriage was circular in build, painted white and gilded with gold. It certainly looked like something a queen would ride in. Two white alicorns stood at the head of the carriage. With my brother's help, I stepped inside the carriage and we tucked my massive veil inside. Nervous? 
Arthur asked as the carriage rattled. I could barely hear him over the roar of the crowd, which had gathered at the edges of the city streets. I shook my head, just ready to take my vows. The noise only got worse the closer we got to the Cathedra du Dabuina. By the time the carriage came to a stop in front of Milana's cathedral, my knees were shaking. Arthur stepped out of the carriage first, then held a hand out. I took it as I stepped down from the carriage, then looped my arm in Arthur's as we began the long climb up the cathedral steps. Vara, who was waiting at the base of the stairs, hurried forward to extend my veil. It splayed out behind me, creating a dazzling display as we ventured through the cathedral's double doors. The audience rose to stand, everyone turning my way to witness and gasp at my beautiful dress. My first thought was that the cathedral looked even more brilliant than it usually did. Wilma Ett had done a fantastic job of coordinating the decorations. Blue, silver, and white banners hung from the ceiling. Giant bouquets of white roses lined the aisle, accented with winter evergreens and pine cones, and candles burned on silver holders. I smelled birch incense wafting through the church, getting stronger with every step I took. From above, a heavenly choir sang en genre pour noi in angelic voices. I kept a firm grip on Arthur's arm, trying to take it all in. The moment was perfect. It couldn't be replicated, not even if the gods tried. There were journalists stationed in the lofts above the cathedral, but I didn't notice the cameras anymore. They were around so often now I barely acknowledged their presence. The only person in the room that my soul searched for was Ethan. I was halfway down the aisle, close enough we could make eye contact. When he saw me in my wedding gown, a hand went over his mouth, and a small tear leaked out of his eye to drip down his chin. It made my entire body tremble to watch him get emotional over my arrival. Gods, he was gorgeous. He was wearing the same Hussar's uniform he'd donned the night of the King's Ball, the night before the contest began. The longing look in his eyes took me back to that night the time we'd shared our first kiss as the clock struck midnight. Everything seemed as magical then as it was now, except we were totally different people. One thing that hadn't changed was how much we loved each other. That love had only grown. When Ethan looked at me now, there wasn't a huge flood of emotion or euphoric high like I'd been expecting. Instead, there was comfort. He gave me a gentle smile that was so reassuring that I wanted to fall into his arms and enjoy their coziness forever. I knew what he was saying to me without having to reach across our bond. The wedding, the big moments, it didn't matter because we'd always been this way, tied to each other. There were no tears, no surges of ecstasy or raw feeling. I didn't know why I figured there would be because there was nothing revolutionary or exceptional about coming home. And that's what Ethan was to me, my home. Inside of me was only happiness and the calm security that we wanted to spend our lives together. It's what I'd been looking for all along. We were making a family, a safe place for both of us to reside. Some might find it unromantic. As for me, I knew Ethan Nowak was my choice, now and always. Even before we decided to get married, I'd made the decision to love him, through the worst of times and the best. I decided that the day I met him. I knew he was mine, and always would be. And I found my choice to love him more powerful than any passionate feelings could ever be. Yes, Ethan loved me. But more than that, he vowed to stand by me, no matter what storms came our way. His pledge of devotion was stronger than any epic romance poets could write songs about. Not so long ago, I'd sat in this exact spot in the cathedral and asked King Lycus to help me save his son. I'd never imagined we'd make it to this moment, both of us alive and well, ready to make the commitment of a lifetime. We'd faced monsters, demons, and evil kings together, and none of it had done a damn thing to separate us. We were truly a love that was meant to last forever. Ethan took my hand, and the sensation sent goosebumps running over my skin. He squeezed my fingers, and we didn't have to utter words. We just had to lock eyes, and we knew. Arthur departed, taking my bouquet and maneuvering around my veil to sit beside Vara in the front row. 
The altar was surrounded by a circle of white rose petals, leaving Ethan and I in the center. The circle had been blessed by the high priestesses before the wedding began to keep out bad magic or any negative influence on our marriage. The high priestess raised her hands, and the music in the room became silent as people took their seats. Ethan grasped both of my hands as we locked eyes, and that was when the real magic began. People of Melovia, the high priestess boomed, we have come together under the light of the seven gods to witness the marriage of our king, Ethan Nowak, to his bride, the queen of the Arcania, Emmeline Sosna. The king and queen have already taken vows to each other during their choosing, declaring each other to be their true mates. Today, we solidify that bond with the power of marriage. At their choosing, the king chose Luca as his patron god and the queen, Milana, as her patron goddess. May each bless this union for the sake of Molovia rests on the bond that is between these two. Our people protected by the love that endures between the queen and our king. I was hardly focused on what she was saying. I was too captured in Ethan's eyes and the feeling of his thumbs massaging the backs of my hands. We will begin the ceremony with the burning of the flowers, the high priestess said. King Ethan will remove the flowers that have been placed into the queen's hair and burn them with holy fire, signaling the queen's transition from maiden to mother as she takes the hand of the king to be her husband. I turned back to Ethan. He gently began pulling flowers out of my hair gently whispering my name as he did so. The sensation made my scalp tingle and shivers run all over my body. The moment felt so intimate, too personal to be shared in a cathedral full of people, let alone on national television. Yet the discomfort fell away, and the feeling of Ethan and I being the only people in the room overtook me again as he delicately pulled out flower by flower, placing them into a smoldering pot of embers that was beside the high priestess. The flowers ignited, sending smoke into the lofts of the cathedral. I turned back toward Ethan as he pulled the last flower out. It ignited instantly once it hit the embers, signifying the end of my youth and the beginning of my new journey as a married woman. The high priestess brought forward a tray with two pieces of bread upon it, gluten-free for me, of course. The bride and the groom will feed each other salted bread. The bread is to show that they will provide for each other with all the abundance life brings. The salt is added to remind them that life can be bitter, and the good must be taken alongside the bad. We took the two pieces of bread off the tray and held it up to each other's lips. I took small bites, trying to look dignified, but Ethan ate his whole. The pieces weren't very big, only a mouthful. I did my best to try not to make a face. Damn, they really hadn't held back on the salt. I had to choke it down. My eyes were watering when the priestess offered us a goblet of wine, adding, The bride and groom will drink from the same cup, showing they are willing to share life's sweetness together. I drank first, a long gulp to get the taste of salt out of my mouth. Ethan finished off the goblet, and as he handed the goblet back to the priestess, we faced each other once more. He gave me a wink and in my mind, his voice resonated, You are becoming mine, Onawilka, and I am becoming yours, always and forevermore. I never thought I'd feel so free. I felt my insides shudder at his words. This ceremony felt deeper than a wedding. We were sealing our bond for life, and even for what came after. Ethan was so ready for that. I could feel his enthusiasm bleeding through our bond, and I bled for him, too. There wasn't a single thing I wouldn't do for this man in this lifetime or the next. Another priestess stepped forward. She held a velvet pillow, a coiled rope lying upon it that was seven feet long. I had made the cord myself, braided it with ribbons in our wedding colors. It had taken some time to make, embedded with all my prayers and hopes for the future. I placed my hand on top of Ethan's, and we held our hands before the high priestess, as she grabbed the rope and showed it to the congregation. The bride and groom will participate in a hand-fasting ceremony as they take their vows, in tradition with our ancestors, the high priestess said. A knot of cords will be tied around their hands, signifying a bond that can never be undone. 
The priestess began looping the cord around our wrists. My king, say your vows. Ethan inclined his head to me as the priestess began binding our hands. His voice trembled, on the verge of breaking down as he swore his life to me. Like the sun and the stars pledge themselves to the moon, I so pledge myself to you, and give of myself so that we may be one. With each new moon, my love for you will be born again, finding solace in the beginning of every dawn. Like the waxing moon, my compassion for you will grow, becoming endless in its depth. As the full moon rises, so my desire for you will be complete, lacking nothing, cherishing all we share. And as the moon wanes, we shall remain together in times of sickness, pain, and lack, until the cycle begins again and I circle back to you. Ethan had spoken the traditional woven vows, words that thousands of other shifters had said thousands of times before. But when he said it, it was magical. I couldn't shake off the knowing that he meant every syllable with every fiber of his soul. The cathedral was awfully quiet. The high priestess leaned in to whisper, My queen, your vows? I gave a start, and the audience let out a tiny laugh. I'd been so enraptured by what Ethan had said, I'd forgotten to talk. I cleared my throat and said, As the gods bless our marriage, I will bless you and our home. Like Vesna, I will be wise in judgment and slow to anger. Like Radic, I shall fight for you every day. Like Neva, I will lend you my time and always fight for just one more moment. Like Luca, I will give you my body to worship. Like Daroga, I will stay beside you through darkness and through loss. Like Tomir, I will do what is best for us and not what is best for myself. And like Milana, I will lend you my heart, taking you exactly as you are, giving generously until our lives are complete and the circle begins again. There were a couple of sniffs from the audience, and a few loud wails from my mother. I heard Lord Lucian gently shushing her as the priestess said, Pull your hands from the cord, then yank it tight. With difficulty, Ethan and I managed to wrench our hands free of the knot the High Priestess had created. We both grabbed the end of the cord and pulled, tying the knot. As I looked at the complex knot that had been created, I knew that it could never be undone, no matter how hard someone tried. It was stuck like that for life. We gave the knot to a priestess, who put it back on the pillow and left. The knot would remain a treasured wedding heirloom for us, one we would keep in the royal quarters. Ethan and I knelt before the high priestess, as we had during our coronation. Another priestess came forward with another pillow. Two crowns sat upon it. They looked tarnished and centuries old. They were simple, nothing like the ornate crowns that had been placed on our heads during our coronation. The two priestesses lifted the crowns to the audience, and the high priestess said, In ancient times, long before the Fae left Edenmire, Couples were pronounced married once a crown of ivy had been placed on their heads by a high priestess. These particular crowns date back to the Middle Ages, to the marriage of the first king and queen of Melovia that we had on this earth. At every royal wedding since, these crowns have been used to officially unite royal couples. They are never worn, save for when a king and queen are married. They are kept safe within the royal treasury, waiting for another mated pair to wed and lead Melovia under a new reign. The priestess placed the crown on Ethan's head and nestled the other into my hair. With this crowning, I pronounce you married. Arise as husband and wife and claim your future together as one. As we stood, Ethan kissed me. The world fell apart and came together all at once. If people were applauding, I didn't hear them. All that rose to my ears was static, and all I could feel were Ethan's soft lips caressing my own as we shared our first kiss as husband and wife. He put a gentle hand to the side of my face, and I leaned into it, feeling like this was what I'd been waiting for my entire life. When the kiss broke, I stopped floating, gently trickling back down to reality. 
I took Ethan's arm and we began our walk back down the aisle. White petals fell from the ceiling, tossed by guests sitting in the lofts. They coated Ethan's shoulders and my dress. It was like something out of a fairy tale. And then I realized this was my fairy tale. My life. I'd gotten my Prince Charming and everything I ever wanted. A kingdom, a home, a family. Ethan was my family. We were tied, now and forever. If there was a more beautiful realization than that, I'd never know it. I leaned over and placed my head on Ethan's shoulder as we walked, feeling more blessed than I'd ever been. We'd made it. Despite all that had tried to stop us, we'd won. Then I saw Lady Magdalena's face in the crowd. Her eyes were joyful and yet sad. So sad. You deserve this day. It will be one of the last happy ones you'll have. My heart tumbled violently inside of me. I wanted her to be wrong. Ethan and I could find a way to maintain our happily ever after. This wasn't the beginning of the end. It was mine, and I was his. What mattered is that we were alive and we were together. I couldn't stop the soft voice in my head that uttered, for now. Chapter 19 Ethan I was married. I could hardly believe it. The carriage ride back to the palace felt so sentimental. Emma's head remained on my shoulder, and our hands were conjoined as the crowd outside applauded our union. What are you thinking about? I asked. She lifted her gaze. I feel so happy. It's like nothing could get me down. Do you think this is a sign that things will be better for us from now on? Whether life gets easier or harder from this point on is of no consequence to me. I care only that you are at my side. The rest is minor details. I reached under the carriage's seat and pulled out a thin wrapped box. I set it on her lap and said, Your wedding present. What did you get me now? She gave me a teasing smile. Something befitting a queen. She unwrapped the paper and opened the box. Her eyes lit up as she held a white gold rose before her eyes. This is beautiful. And one of a kind. It's made from a real rose, dipped in gold. It will last through the ages, as will our love. It's absolutely amazing. She leaned in to kiss me. I'll keep it on my desk in my office. It's such a priceless gift. We pulled up in front of the palace. I placed the rose back under the carriage seat for the servants to fetch before I stood. Our public awaits. And so does the party, Emma said, fluffing her skirts. I disembarked the carriage. The cheers from the crowd surrounding the palace were so loud it nearly hurt my ears. The noise only got louder as I took Emma's hand and helped her out of the carriage. Her long veil dragged the snow behind her as we ventured up the palace steps to the enthusiasm of the crowd. When we got inside, Emma's veil was removed by Lady Wilma Ett, along with the silver crowns we'd been given. We're running on time, Wilma Ett fretted, but we'll be behind if dinner doesn't begin with the next five minutes, and you still have to be announced. It'll be fine, Wilma Ett, Emma said with a laugh. I loved her carefree nature. That she wasn't stressed about such a big day made me enjoy it all the more. Wilma Ett sniffed. It may be fine, but it won't be perfect, my queen, which is what we strive for in Melovia. Your guests are waiting. We strolled down the hallway and toward the grand ballroom. The double doors opened, and the herald announced, I introduce King Ethan Nowak of the Arcania and his bride, Emmeline Sosna, Queen of the Arcania. There was polite applause, and we walked inside. I had the idea that the grand ballroom looked more impressive than my wildest daydreams could imagine. Towering vases of white roses stood on every table, which were swathed with claws of ice blue. Bare trees stuck in glittering pots dangled icicles from their limbs, while the plates and champagne glasses were edged with designs of white frost. An illusion had been cast over the room to make snow fall from the ceiling. The illusion became grander as I realized the spell had formed to make the surface of a lake above our heads, edges appearing on the surface as if someone was skating on it. The lighting in the room shifted from light blue to dark sapphire and back again. 
The dance floor was swathed by a projection of snowflakes, which coordinated with the music the string band was playing. Even the cake was elaborate. It was six feet tall in the focus piece of the room, adorned with frost snowflakes and towering over the guests on a silver pedestal. The entire space had been transformed into a winter wonderland. Wilma Aunt outdid herself, Emma muttered, looking around the room. That she did, I agreed. Let's enjoy dinner, shall we? I was starving. I'd been too nervous to eat before the ceremony, but with my new wife by my side and the rituals over, it was time to loosen up. We sat at the bride and groom's table, which had been placed on the stage of the ballroom where the thrones usually sat. We were immediately served French onion soup with honey mead, which I was heartily grateful for. It was the first of many courses. Whenever we were finished with one dish, we started on another. There were dumplings with quail, salmon with pine nut salad, crab legs with asparagus, and my personal favorite, prime rib with a side of seared steak. It was all delicious, and by the time the servants cleared away our plates, I was certainly satisfied. Near the end of the last course, Odette bustled up from the bridal party's table and hurried to a small platform that had been set up by the cake. She took a microphone from a servant and waved to the audience. "'What's Odette doing?' Emma asked. "'The meal's entertainment,' Wilmayette grumbled from nearby, as if this had been a favor she'd owed to Odette for getting Emma's dress done on time, and so had no choice but to grant her. Odette waved eagerly to the crowd. "'Hello, everyone. So, um, if you'd all like to know, I'm one of the Queen's bridesmaids, and... I'd like to sing a little song for the groom and bride. The crowd gave a little chuckle. Odette brought the microphone closer to her face and whispered, Anyway, this is for Emma and Ethan. I love you guys. The band struck up, and Odette began belting out a very awful rendition of I Will Always Love You. I tried not to cringe, though I'm sure the reaction was visible on my face. Whitney Houston, she was not. I'd heard Odette sing before at the Poetry Slam last semester, and sadly, had never wished to hear her sing again. She said she'd been taking voice lessons. The instructor needed to be hanged. The faces of our guests turned from warm smiles to awkward grimaces, and I found myself grinning. Never mind. The fact that she was making the nobles uncomfortable was amazing. This was a great wedding present. Odette let out a screech that sounded more like a parrot. Emma gave a little laugh beside me, like she found Odette's show amusing and a little heartwarming. Personally, I was touched that Odette had taken the time to sing us a song, even if she was off pitch. When Odette finished, there was kindly applause. No one dared to be rude to the Queen's best friend at her own wedding, but it was safe to say Odette wasn't getting any record deals any time soon. Theo jumped to his feet to give her a standing ovation, but he was the only one. After dinner, we formed a long receiving line to talk to each of the nobles and thank them for coming, very boring, before the first dance. Emma danced in my arms to the violin as the crowd watched, but we only had eyes for each other. I remembered how we'd skated on the pond at Arcania University during our first date together, and how an illusion of snowflakes had skated around us. This moment felt very similar, as if we'd gone back in time to that very special day. If I was honest... That first date with her had been one of the most wonderful nights of my life. We hadn't found any time to go skating recently, but I promised myself we would soon. The pond in the gardens was frozen over, and winter had arrived. We'd soon be back on the ice again, right where we'd fallen in love. As our dance ended, more couples flooded the floor, swaying to the beat of the orchestra. Besides the dancing, there were a variety of activities at fay weddings, including fortune-telling and games. A couple of dragon shifters kicked around a ball in the corner, while a sorceress read tea leaves by the door. Arthur had gotten a bunch of shifters around to sing an Irish sea shanty, fists banging on the table for rhythm, while sorceresses danced to the sound of his lilting brogue rising and falling over the reception. Our friends had gathered near the cake. Stefan let out a snort as he looked at Emma. Ethan deflowered you. His pun wasn't very amusing, at least not to me. That happened a long time ago, Emma said, taking another sip of champagne. Not in front of everyone, he said. Delmare elbowed him. Ooh, don't Ozzy and Jasper look so cute? Odette peeped. 
She pointed at the couple, who were hand in hand on the dance floor and wearing matching tuxedos. Jasper twirled Ozzy around, and the little dragon fell onto Jasper's chest with a giggle. A couple of nobles wrinkled their noses and moved away from them. Inviting them was a must, as they were close friends, but it definitely raised a few eyebrows. Same-sex relationships were legal now in Malovia, but they'd hardly been accepted. I'd given strict orders to the guards that anyone who spoke anything derogatory about Ozzy and Jasper, to their faces or otherwise, be immediately thrown out. Yet it was clear that nothing had to be said. The disgust on the faces of the Alicorn guests in particular was clear. They're enjoying the night, as we all should, Theo said, taking Odette's hand. Come, let's join the dancing. There would be no clubbing tunes or dirty songs here at the royal wedding. It was to be a very pompous event, despite the disappointment of my friends. However, just because the songs were old-fashioned didn't mean they couldn't be fun. My friends and I danced the polka, the waltz, and the tango, switching partners every so often and enjoying the music. I heard Emma's laugh trickle over the ballroom as she was passed from Arthur to Stefan during a group ballroom dance, and I swore it never made me so happy. The hours flew by so quickly that the midnight course was being served before I knew it. Delmer and Vera were both tired from dancing. They had babies to carry, unlike the rest of us. Stefan knelt before Delmer, removing her shoes and rubbing her feet while saying, It's too bad you can't play the next game. It's fine, Delmer said with a wave. The unveiling is a stupid tradition. But it's such a funny game, Alexei insisted. I had to sit this one out. I took a seat between Delmer and Vera as the unveiling began. Emma had been given another veil, a short one that was clipped into her hair. Odette and Kiara stood in front of Emma, facing off against Stefan, Theo, Arthur, and Alexei. They're totally outnumbered, Vera laughed. This should be a short game. A bell rang from somewhere in the audience. The boys sprung and Emma ran away. Kiara and Odette jumped to protect her. Odette smashed her shoulder into Alexei's gut, ramming him to the ground while Kiara shoved Arthur backward. Odette cheered in victory before Theo tackled her, pinning her arms to her sides. Kiara went to defend Emma, but Alexei scrambled to his feet and nabbed her, swinging her off her feet. Emma ran like mad, but she couldn't get very far in a giant dress. Stefan easily caught up, wrapping one arm around her waist while unclipping the veil from her hair. Ha! I win! Stefan cried, waving the veil over his head. There were cheers, and he passed the veil back to Emma. She turned her back to the crowd and shouted, Okay, first girl who catches it gets married next. A clamor of unmarried women rushed to form a crowd behind Emma, cackling and shoving one another. She tossed it. Though everyone leapt into the air at once, the veil soared over the crowd and landed on Delmare's lap. Her mouth fell open in shock. The crowd erupted into laughter. I chuckled. I rejoined my bride and wrapped my arm around her waist. By her side, Stefan looked puzzled. He turned to me. You think that's some kind of sign? Only an obvious one, I said. You gonna do it? His face was unsure. I feel like that's tacky to do at someone else's wedding, especially a royal wedding. Go ahead. We don't care, Emma insisted. Give the papers some other scandal to talk about. Stefan took a deep breath. Okay, fine. Here it goes. He strode to Delmare with purpose. Knowingly, Theo clinked a glass to get everyone's attention. The room quieted, and eyes fell on Stefan as he stood before his mate. Delmare's eyes widened as she took him in. A hand fell on her throat, almost by instinct. Stefan cleared his throat. I've been thinking of a million and one ways to do this, and frankly, all of them fell short of you. Nothing seemed to be perfect. The moment never seemed to be right. So... I decided to screw the moment. Might as well get on with it, because, baby cakes, there's never going to be anyone for me but you. Stefan got on one knee, and Delmer immediately choked up. He procured a ring from his pocket, a square ruby on a twisting black band. A very good choice. A few tables down, Miroslava dotted her eyes with a napkin, while Jonathan puffed out his chest with pride. Irina, you are the love of my life, the mate of my heart and the mother of our child. I want us to start our life together, and I want to do it now, Stefan said, the deepest sincerity in his voice. So, what do you say, babe? You want to get hitched? Delmer was speechless. She nodded frantically, 
and tears streamed down her face. Stefan slipped the ring on and leaned forward to kiss her. The cameras started going off like mad, and journalists started babbling. Everyone in our group rushed forward to surround them. Wow, what a pretty ring, Ozzy said, his eyes growing huge at the new rock on Delmare's hand. Congratulations, Emma cheered. I'm so happy for you guys. You got me with pregnancy hormones, you bastard, Delmare wept, wiping tears off her face. Stefan gave a mischievous grin. Never said I was going to play fair. Emma and I cut the cake next, a monumental task with how tall it was. We nearly tipped it over, but thankfully, Alexei rushed forward to save the day before it splattered all over the place. After the cake was served, the bride and groom's table was cleared out of the way for actors to perform a short play. The crowd gathered around the stage to watch the show, while Emma and I pressed together in the back of the crowd. It's crazy it's almost midnight, Emma said as she watched the actors perform. Feels like we just got here. We still have plenty of time to celebrate. Fay wedding's gone until dawn. The party's just beginning, I told her. Their party, maybe, Emma said, and she grabbed my tie. Why don't we have a personal party of our own? That sounded like a plan to me. We'll be back before they even notice we're gone. With the play to distract our guests, Emma and I slipped off. We wandered down the hallway hand in hand, snickering and kissing as we fell against the walls. As we were wrapped up in each other's lips, we came close to a familiar spiraling staircase. Emma pulled away and said, The Hall of Wonders. That's perfect. We took the stairs downward, I pushed open the door, and we stepped on through. The Hall of Wonders had changed into a beautiful mountain scene. It was midsummer, somewhere far north. The skies were dark with stars, the mystique picture of mountains in the distance, alpine trees lining a shimmering lake underneath the light of the moon. Within the Hall of Wonders, Emma and Ethan consummate their marriage as husband and wife. I was very sure this was one of the best nights of our lives, but I wasn't about to be certain. After all, we had a whole life together left to live, and this was only the beginning. I wish every day could feel like this, Emma whispered lifting her hand to run her fingers along the stars. There will be some days happier than this day, and others that are sadder, I said. What's important is that we have each other. Yes, Emma agreed with a smile, turning into me. Forever. Chapter 20 Emma After our little rendezvous, Ethan and I made our way back to the reception, not that anyone had been fooled on what we were doing. After all, my hair was a mess. It was a good thing, though, and part of tradition. The Fae expected you to sneak away with your new spouse sometime during the nightly festivities. It harkened back to the old days when royals had to be, you, watched by nobles for their first time in order to prove they'd consummated their marriage. No thanks. Ethan and I doing the walk of shame back to our reception was good enough for me. The dancing, dining, and celebration had continued until dawn. Once the sun rose, we were sent off by wedding guests and taken by royal escort to Dolinska International Airport. Most of our friends were coming with us, more protection. It was odd for a honeymoon, as the papers had noted, but the reporters didn't realize what was at stake. We didn't want to take a portal, as we thought it best to save our magical energy, just in case we would need it in the upcoming days. So, we took the Royal Jetliner. Yes, Ethan literally had a plane. I'd been queen for a while and was getting used to royal life, but that was a little nuts. We'd chosen Juneau, Alaska for our honeymoon. I would be uncomfortable if we honeymooned anywhere hot and we thought that was far enough away from Melovia to avoid the Black Claw, as well as remote enough that they'd have a hard time finding us. We'd rented a big cabin on the edge of a lake, mountains surrounding us in the background. It reminded me very much of our time in the Hall of Wonders. Alaska was absolutely beautiful. Ethan and I spent our time wandering the woods, hiking the mountainside and looking for bears. We found all kinds of wildlife, including Arctic foxes, hares, and even a wolf pack in the distance. The pack stood and watched us with reverence as Ethan passed, as if they knew what he was. We hiked through the snow and made love in the woods without a care in the world, 
as the peaceful forest around us beckoned Ethan and I into a world of our own. At night, we sat around the fireside and made s'mores with our friends. I drank hot chocolate and thought this was a perfect life. I'd missed America. I'd missed just being us. The camaraderie that my friends and I shared without feeling the weight of the world on our shoulders was magical. I knew dark days were drawing closer, and yet, this was a little slice of the world that I could share with just my loved ones. There was no better peace than that. On the second day of my honeymoon, we were all on edge. It was December 3rd, and the day before the Black Claw was supposed to take my blood. Ethan and I took a morning hike, but I just couldn't shake the feeling that something was wrong. We made our way back to the cabin, where the smell of cooking bacon and fragrant waffles wafted to our nose. I was hungry from our hike and ready to eat, but as I went to sit down at the table, pain radiated throughout my bones. I let out a cry of pain and collapsed onto the floor without a bit of warning. Immediately, I knew something was deeply wrong. Emma! Ethan rushed to my side. He helped me sit up, but the effort made my head spin. I could feel an ache deep in my chest where my magic was. It made my stomach churn. This wasn't my disease. It was something else, something connected deeply to my powers. My hearthfire, I gasped. It's been tampered with. I winced and put a hand to my chest as the aching became more prominent. My grandmother had told me that if a Fae's hearthfire was destroyed, it would weaken them. I was certain something horrible had happened. I'll check on your hearthfire in Edenmire, Kiara offered. Kiara vanished into another room to meditate. I laid in Ethan's arms and felt for the cool steadiness of the floor, cursing whoever had done this to me. Moments later, Kiara returned to the kitchen. Your hearthfire in Edenmire is intact. Nothing's touched it. That means someone must have snuck into my office and destroyed my hearth fire on Earth. I didn't need confirmation or someone to check. I just knew. How could they? Your quarters are closely guarded, Theo said. Well, somebody got in there, I said crossly. That's impossible, Delmere objected. There's a ward around your hearth fire that protects it. My friends can get past it. The ward keeps out enemies, not people who are close to me. I gave a cry, then cringed again. The traitor, Ethan said darkly, as if picturing them now. He didn't say it, but I knew he was thinking of Vara. She was back at the castle with Arthur, while the rest of our friends were here. His words struck me deeply. If my hearthfire had been damaged, Vara was the most likely culprit. She had access to my office. Ethan boosted me into his arms and carried me to the bedroom. You need to lie down and recover your strength. I'll call for the guards, order them to use their shifter sight to investigate the area. Tell them to leave whatever's broken, I mumbled. I need to clean up the pieces myself. More people touching them just means more of my magical energy wasted. Ethan laid me on the bed and tucked a blanket around me. Is there anything I can do? Stay close to me, I said. I need to borrow what energy I can to recover. Ethan nodded and laid beside me pulling me close to his chest. My eyes closed, and I shivered against his shifter warmth. I thought my office at the palace would be safe, but apparently I couldn't trust the people around me. That my earthly hearthfire had been destroyed damaged my connection to Edenmire. All the spells I'd done there, including the protection spell against Queen Antonia, were broken now. It wasn't very comforting the day before the eclipse was about to happen. I knew this had been done on purpose, at a very meaningful time. These bastards were coming for me. But they had to find me first. Good luck, assholes. I slept for some time. When I awoke, Ethan was gone, although the spot next to me was still warm. He must have just gotten up. I still felt weak, but at least I was able to walk again. I shuffled into the kitchen and opened the fridge to munch on some cold waffles before I glanced out the window. Everyone was outside, huddled around the campfire. By their grim expressions, I knew they were discussing something important. Silly of me to think my honeymoon would be full of fun adventures outdoors and lots of sex. I sighed and wrapped a blanket from the couch around me as I pushed the door open. As I came out to sit by the fire, Odette gave me a worried look. What is it? I asked grumpily. I wasn't getting laid, nor was I relaxing. In fact, I was sick again. This wasn't what I had in mind for our vacation. Theo held a letter in his hand. His fingers trembled as he looked at me and said, 
Gabby has had her baby early. What? I snarled. Several people in the room visibly bristled. She delivered a baby girl the night of your wedding. It would seem the stress of the event triggered an early labor. Theo folded up the note. Princess Signia, they're calling her. She has raven hair and dark eyes, just as Elijah did. There's no doubt to the public that she is his child. Great. That was just what we needed. Theo swallowed as he added. The alleycorn spy said the labor was hard on Gabby. She's lost a lot of blood. Without Elijah, she nearly died delivering the child. Is that common in the Fey world? I asked. Mates make the process easier, Delmare said. The sorceresses that lose their companions to death before they give birth often don't make it through delivery. That Gabby didn't perish shows how strong she is. Ethan's eyes were murky. He leaned forward, thinking, We could use this. How so? Alexi asked. Ethan rubbed his chin. We go to the fortress and mount an attack. Hit Gabby with all we've got. She won't see this coming, and she'll be unprepared. So will her forces. We'll have a chance. I frowned. We'd been making plans to overtake Gabby's fortress for months, and had operations in place, but I hadn't expected to launch an attack right this second. We just got married. I know this is our honeymoon, and I'm sorry, but we can't afford to miss this opportunity. Ethan insisted. Gabby's guard is down. She's weak and distracted with a new infant. This could be a chance to end the war for good, right here, right now. I nodded and winced as I stood. Fine. Let's go. I'd barely gotten the words out before I collapsed again. Delmer and Odette caught me to prevent me from falling backward off the bench. No, Emma, you're weak from your hearth fire being destroyed, Ethan said. I am the king. I vowed that I would never allow my soldiers to head into battle without me leading the charge, and I meant it. I will go back and mount the assault. We're strongest together, I pleaded. Don't go without me. I must. You have to stay here to protect yourself from the Black Claw. They're no doubt looking for you, Ethan insisted. Then stay, Kiara argued. Leave after the eclipse and attack the fortress once Emma gets her strength back. Every moment we waste is another second for Gabby to grow stronger, and we cannot wait that long, Ethan insisted. Even one more day is more time for her to consider we could use her weakness against her. She's cunning that way. If she panics and fortifies her fortress before we have time to mount an attack, we'll never win. We have to attack when her guard is down, when she figures we're busy enjoying our honeymoon and avoiding the Black Claw. He's right, I said warily. Gabby would think we'd be too afraid to attack now. It's the day before my blood is supposed to be used to raise Droga. She knows we're trying to run away from the cult. She'd figure Ethan and I would stick together and stay far away from Melovia. Which you should, Kiara argued. This is a reckless plan. But you have to take risks in war, Stefan insisted. Ethan's plan is the best we've got. We haven't had a chance like this before, and we won't get one again. I'm with Kiara, Odette spoke up. Ethan needs to stay here and protect Emma. Have you had any visions regarding it? Theo asked. No, but... Odette bit her lip. Mates should never be separated for any reason. And Gabby is vulnerable, but Emma is vulnerable right now, too. Why not wait until the eclipse passes and Emma is safe? Because Gabby will figure it out. You know she will, Stefan said forcefully. We need to attack and attack now. What do you think, Emma? Ethan's eyes burned into me. I will not part from you unless you ask me to but I implore you to think of the opportunity that's being presented to us. There was only one decision to make. We attack now, and we end this war. Then all we need to focus on is uniting the Crystals of Harmony so the portal to Edemire can stay open, and our quest will be done. Ethan stood. Then I will return to the Circle and tell them to make preparations. We will march on the fortress as soon as I set foot back in Melovia. I'm coming, I insisted, attempting to stand again. I wavered. Odette jumped up to steady me on my feet. No, Emma, 
This is something I must do alone. Ethan insisted. You are staying here where it's safe. That's final. Ethan swept away. The boys followed to pack their things and take a portal back to Melovia. It was cute. Ethan thought he could boss me around. I went to go after him, but Odette's grip was tight on my arm. Delmer and Kiara stepped in front of me. Oh, I see. He's putting you girls up to being my jailers until the fight's over. I put a hand on my hip. You know that's not going to work, right? You're stronger than all of us, but you can't take on the three of us at once, Kiara said forcefully. We're not letting the Black Claw get their hands on you. You're staying. Fuck all I am! My voice was high. I knew the boys could hear me inside the cabin, but I didn't care. We can't fight anyway, Delmere argued. You're sick. I'm pregnant. Odette has sworn to not fight again, and Kiara won't go into battle without us. It's better if we just stay out of the way. I turned toward Kiara. Are you really okay with letting Alexi go off on his own? He asked me to stay here, and I'm going to honor his wishes. He's going to worry if he knows I'm not in a safe place. It's better if he keeps his mind to the fight, and that's where Ethan's mind should be too, Kiara insisted. We just need to relax. I threw my arms up. How can we relax when we're going to be sitting around worrying our heads off about our mates? I know, but in this situation, doing nothing is better than doing something, Delmer said. I promise that the day after the eclipse, you can take your happy little ass back to Melovia and help Ethan if it's still needed. But until then, you need to stay here, got it? Fucking make me, I growled. I'd be damned before I let Ethan fight alone. He was my mate. He needed me at his side, and Melovia needed a queen to lead them into battle. Emma, there's more at stake than your pride, Kiara begged. Say that the Black Claw gets their hands on you, and they use your blood to raise Droga. What then? That caused me to pause. That would be a far worse situation than the one we were in now. Whatever, I huffed. But the moment the eclipse is over, I'm taking a portal back to Melovia whether I'm still sick or not. My goodbye to Ethan was tense as he prepared to drive back to the airport. He rubbed my arms as we stood outside the car, but it did little to dispel the fear inside of me. I'm scared. You shouldn't be going to war without me. I worried. I'll make it back to you once this war is over and Gabby is dealt with, Ethan said. He gave me a kiss and lifted my chin. It'll be all right. I didn't know. There was some twisted feeling gnawing at my heart since we'd made this decision, and it had nothing to do with my hearth fire being destroyed. I couldn't help it. I cried once Ethan was gone. Being without him just felt wrong. We had dinner, and although it was my favorite, spaghetti and meatballs, it tasted bland in my mouth. The cabin was quiet without the obnoxious noises of the men to fill it up. We didn't talk much. I think we were all wondering what our mates were doing now and if they were out of harm's way. I couldn't accuse the girls of not having my best interests at heart. After all, they were making a sacrifice too. Their mates were fighting alongside Ethan. Delmer stared out the window, watching the falling snow and rubbing her belly as Odette knitted anxiously and Kiara read a book. I saw her turn a page, only to turn it backward and read it over again three times. I had nothing to do with my hands. I'd figured they'd be preoccupied with something else, mainly Ethan, on my honeymoon. But he was gone now, so I resorted to emotional eating, munching on snacks to try and regain my strength. I tried to watch a movie, but I couldn't pay attention to it, knowing that our forces had to be marching on Gabby's fortress by now. For all I knew, the battle had already begun. Once it got dark, Odette yawned. We should get some sleep. I didn't know if I could, but I had to try. I stood from the armchair and shut the TV off. Coming, Kiara? I'm going to stay up a bit longer, Kiara said tiredly, head bobbing over her book. This chapter's very... interesting. Oh, gods. They were taking shifts to make sure I didn't leave. This was ridiculous. I rolled my eyes and hobbled back to bed. The California king felt empty and cold without my wolf here beside me. Minutes ticked past, but eventually, my eyes closed. I tossed and turned all night, unable to get comfortable as the hours droned on. It had to be the longest night of my life. 
Morning was creeping over the horizon. I wasn't asleep, more or less dozing, when a loud noise shook the cabin. It was loud, like a crack of thunder. I bolted upward in bed, chest heaving. There weren't any sounds of alarm from the rest of the cabin. I didn't think the girls heard it. I abruptly looked to my left and gasped. Looming in the darkness was the wizened face of the old hag I knew so well. Half of her features were cast in shadow, the other illuminated by the breaking dawn. The hag stared at me, her haggard old eyes glimmering with something forbidden. I hadn't seen her since the king's contest. Even all these years later, I couldn't forget a single line in the old woman's face. She'd been burned into my memory, as close to me as the semblance of my goddess was. The hag's lips parted, uttering a single word. Go. I sprang out of bed. I cast off my pajamas and donned my warmest fur clothes, along with my leather boots and winter cloak. I rummaged through my things until I found the woven necklace infused with unseenly power that Ethan had given me last Christmas. I knew I would have to call upon its power and fastened it around my neck. I would get a spare sword and some armor from my cottage in Edenmire first. As the world weaver, I could take physical items back and forth between the two worlds. Leather armor would have to do. I was too tired to wear anything heavier. I wouldn't bring Lord Razan into this battle. As much as I longed for my own weapon, taking the woven stone anywhere near Gabby was too big a risk. My own sword would stay in Edenmire, at my cottage where it was safe. The hag watched me as I dressed. I was slowed up by the tiredness permeating my bones. I was so weak and exhausted from my hearth fire being destroyed. But I had to push through it. I had to keep going and ignore the pain in my body. There was no time to rest, even though that's what my body begged and pleaded for me to give it. I was the world weaver. People were depending on me, and the only way this war would end is if I brought it to a close myself. My arms shook as I braided my hair, for even that took a tremendous effort. I clenched my teeth and forced myself not to cry out as I summoned a portal. The hag remained even then, watching me as I stepped on through. I'd just married Ethan. I couldn't lose my husband days after our wedding. And Blacklaw or not, I wouldn't let him face Gabby alone. Chapter 21 Ethan The air was brisk. It was a dreadfully cold day, colder than most in Malovia. I prowled through the trees in my woven form, an entire army behind me. It was overcast and near dawn. We had been marching all night through the forests. Now the tree line was breaking. In a valley below stood the fortress, tall and intimidating as ever. People had said the fortress of towers was formidable in stature, enough to make the bravest shifter cower, and I thought they were right. It was a monstrous structure, surrounded by four tall spires that spiraled into the clouds in a great black wall that was at least a hundred feet high. Scaling it would be impossible, but we had sorceresses at the ready to break the wards down. Upon closer inspection, I surveyed a few guards on the towers and a small patrol on the walls, but nothing else to greet us. Gabby had no idea we were here. Once the sorceresses had broken the wards, the plan was to send dragons overhead to storm the fortress and shatter the walls. Once Gabby's forces came out to defend it, we'd meet her on the battlefield. While my soldiers were keeping her army busy, my team would swarm into the fortress and find Gabby. Once we did, we'd kill her. Then the war would be over. We deemed it best to keep it simple. There had never been a successful siege on the Fortress of Towers before, but I was damn determined to make this the first. Crows gathered in the branches above, cackling and squawking. They knew it was near time for a meal. The High Priestesses had offered sacrifices to the gods before we left, pleading for it to be a quick and successful battle. Finlay was on my left side, and Arthur was on my right. I hadn't yet accused Vera of betraying us. That would rouse Arthur's anger, and I needed to keep him close. Vera, along with Amantha, Ozzy, and Jasper, were at the palace. I'd asked the other three privately to keep an eye on Vera while we were fighting, though Vera herself had seemed very shocked when we'd announced that we were going to war. She was either a good actress, or we were spectacularly wrong about her being the traitor. 
I wasn't sure which it could be. Alexei crossed our path, transforming from griffin to man as he faced us. We changed, too, and I put a hand on the hilt of my sword as Finlay and Arthur flanked me. Do you have a report? I asked Alexei. The soldiers are stationed around the fortress. General Bani is ready to move on your command, Alexei said. He hesitated, and I said, You found something. During the march, soldiers happened upon a couple of underground entrances, Alexei said. Gabby has multiple tunnels leading out into the woods. That's how she's been getting supplies in and out of the fortress without being seen. Interesting. We'd speculated portals, but tunnels required far less energy. The tunnels must be the way she snuck soldiers out to overtake Pruska. If we had found them earlier, we could have starved them, Alexei said. Still could be the plan, Arthur said, looking at me. No. We launch our offense immediately, I said, before I paused. Though these tunnels could be our way in. We could use the tunnels, Finlay theorized. Sneak into them, infiltrate the fortress and find Gabby. That's a good idea, I reasoned. Part of our army can follow us through the tunnels, and the rest can remain outside to distract Gabby's forces. But is it wise to split our warriors? Alexei asked. At least half of the soldiers will have to stay behind and fight them outside the fortress walls. That's suicide for those soldiers, Arthur argued. They'll be run down while the rest of us are trying to get inside. What do you think we should do, my king? Finlay turned toward me. It was the first time Finlay had addressed me with any kind of respect. We didn't often get along. He was a pain in the ass on my council and reckless to boot. But he was willing to follow me into battle and carry out my commands. He'd go along with whatever I decided. I will take Finlay and Arthur. We will take one tunnel, I said. The woven soldiers will take the others and slip into the fortress unseen. By the time Gabby knows we're inside, the battle will already be won. Agreed, Alexei said. I will lead you to the nearest tunnel. Alexei took us a half mile into the woods until we came to a carved out entrance in the ground near a cropping of trees. It was close to the fortress, near enough to make me nervous but the woodland shielded us from sight. I've already walked down this tunnel myself. It leads straight to the fortress courtyard, Alexei said. Reports from other sentries agree. The tunnels all go to the same place. Excellent. Tell General Bani that his troops will have to lead an offensive attack outside the fortress, I said. We wolvens will be going in. Alexei nodded and changed to run back through the trees. I felt confident in our plan. Even so, as I gave the order... I knew I was condemning thousands of shifters to their deaths, but how could we win without sacrifice? We could not. Arthur's mouth was thin, but he didn't advise me further. Arthur didn't agree with my judgment. He thought mounting any kind of attack on the Fortress of Towers was a foolhardy idea, especially without Emma here to back us up. Emma needed to stay safe and out of the reach of Black Claw oppressors. The eclipse was upon us. It would rise tonight, and if she was caught... Her blood would be used to raise Droga. I would not risk her life to chance winning this fight. We would be victorious without her. Nearly an hour passed before Stefan clambered out of the bush. There's fucking snow everywhere, he bitched, brushing off his pants. We'll freeze our pricks off before we approach the gates. Frostbite was a concern, which was why we needed to mount this attack quickly. Shifters had natural warmth and could withstand the worst of cold. But the sorceresses who were with them were vulnerable to the harsh elements. Be patient. You'll get your chance to spill blood. Alexei sent me to tell you that the wolvens are positioned at the other tunnels. Everyone is ready to move on your say-so, Stefan said. Stefan would be in the air with the dragons. Theo would remain in the valley, leading the alicorns in a charge against the fortress's walls. Alexei was staying with General Bani and assisting the griffins wherever the other two battalions needed help be it in the air or on the ground. Through a break in the trees, I saw someone come out of one of the tower doors, walking along the wall's edge. He was a tall, stern-looking man with a great fur cloak. He towered over the soldiers behind him and barked orders loudly at a sentry standing watch. He had to be a commander of some sort. I didn't think we were close enough to recognize him, but Stefan peered closer and sneered. Him, Stefan snarled. Who is he? I cocked an eyebrow. That's General Davor, Irina's father, the one who abandoned her. Stefan seethed. 
I did not know he was working for Gabby. Well, now would be a great time to get acquainted with your new father-in-law, I suggested, knowing what he had in mind. I will take great joy in ripping him apart. Just give me the word, Stefan growled. There was no point in waiting any longer. Go, I said. I'll see you once we've won. Stefan nodded. The snarl bubbling in his throat erupted as he burst forth from the trees as a dragon and took to the skies. With him rose the cries of hundreds of dragons. The sounds of trees breaking and toppling over echoed through the valley, and the sight of membraned wings and shimmering scales broke against the dawn as our army soared upon the air. There were shouts from the fortress, and a trumpet resounded over the area. Dragons flew out from the inside of the fortress and crashed against our brethren in the sky. The sounds of the huge reptiles colliding rivaled a thunderstorm as shifters began tearing into each other while the alicorns below charged. There was a monstrous roar from the fortress that shook the earth as a titan emerged. I watched Davor shift from a man into a terrifying behemoth. General Davor had to be the biggest dragon I'd ever seen, larger than Stefan at least by half. He was a wretched sight. Blood-red scales against the cloudy morning as he led his army against our own. On the ground, the alicorns were giving it all they had. The heavy snow in the valley slowed them up, giving Gabby's army time to gather along the walls and take aim. Sorceresses fired magical arrows, launching them downward at the lines of riders approaching the wall. The arrows hit the first line of alicorns and riders. Some went down, but most remained on their hooves. The sorceresses on the backs of the alicorns threw their hands up, using their magic in an attempt to break the wards around the fortress. On the wall's edge, sorceresses who worked for Gabby called their magic to strengthen the wards, tossing down battle orbs that exploded on impact. Alicorns went flying, their riders tossed off of them and into the snow. The griffins divided, going to the aid of both the alicorns and the dragons. Gabby's army started to break as our warriors forced them to buckle, falling off the edge of the wall in droves. In the mess, I could not find Alexei nor Theo. But we had already gained the upper hand. Our soldiers held strong and gave a strong assault against Gabby's forces. Her dragons and griffins were dropping out of the air at the strength of our battalions. Her shifters slammed onto the battlefield and died, while her sorceresses attempted to defend the fortress wall and failed. By the gods, we were winning this fight. A roar in the sky tore my attention away from the wall. Stefan had found General Daver and greeted him in the sky with a smack to the face. Stefan spun around and slapped his tail against the red dragon's snout, and it sent the beast spiraling. Daver quickly righted himself and blew a jet of flame Stefan's way, which he avoided. Stefan swooped down and latched his claws onto the bigger dragon's chest, gripping on tight. Davor wasted no time in lashing out with his own claws, tearing Stefan's scales to shreds. Stefan must have not felt the pain through his rage, for he held on, biting his fangs into Davor's neck. Come, Finlay said, and he nudged me with my nose. We've already lingered too long. There is no time to lose. You must lead the woven in the secret charge from the tunnels. I was worried for my friend, but I didn't have time to stay and watch the fight. Stefan was a big boy. He could take care of himself. I blocked out the roars of fury from Stefan and Davor as I ran into the tunnel. We became enveloped in darkness as our paws went from snow to dirt. My shifter sight adjusted to the lack of light, and we forged on ahead. This tunnel is newly made, Arthur said. The dirt is soft beneath my paws. It was hardly dug a few days ago. Nonsense, Finlay said. You're being paranoid. Gabby must have multiple tunnels so she has more options to get supplies into the fortress. It's a safety measure for her in case one of them is discovered, I commented. We ran until I saw a crack of light that shone through a door at the end of the tunnel. We changed into men, and I pulled my sword loose as I opened the door. There were multitudes of armed soldiers the moment we entered the fortress. I ran one through, and we shoved our way in. I speared a man through the chest the moment I entered, and Finlay's sword met the same fate. I heard howls and snarls as I watched our woven troops bust through the doorways that led to the tunnels, overfilling the area. They put up a good fight, but the overwhelm was too much for the enemy to fight back. Gabby's soldiers immediately fell under the onslaught of our army. Swords clashed and blood spilled. Her warriors died beneath the fangs and claws of our own. I didn't know how many I slayed. Dozens, perhaps. 
My mind went into a kind of haze as we overtook the fortress bit by bit, my excitement mounting as I realized that we had conquered the area. I stood breathing raggedly in the middle of the courtyard. The fight was winding down. Most of Gabby's soldiers had been pressed back by our wolvens, fleeing to the tower walls. Our soldiers followed them, though Gabby's sorceresses put up shields to hold them back. What should we do now? We've overtaken the fortress, Finlay said, breathing heavily. We press onward. If Gabby is dead, then this thing is done, I insisted. We keep going and find her. She has to be somewhere in this fortress. But, Arthur Rasp, find Gabby, I cried. This isn't over until she falls. She was here, along with that cursed child. We would strip this fortress down brick by brick if we had to, and we would end this war. Today. I changed back into a woven and put my nose to the ground. Finlay and Arthur followed me as the scent of a newborn babe wafted into my nose. It was faint, but had overtaken the area. I followed the weak scent, and it led me downward around a twisting set of stone hallways into a room in the middle of the fortress. It had been fortified by guards, but none were here now. I knew this had to be her room. As we burst into Gabby's quarters, I inhaled the rich scent of blood covered up by cleaner and disinfectant. There was a variety of elaborate furniture placed here and there. A four-poster bed, luxurious armchairs around a smoldering fire, and a crib. This was the room she'd delivered the child in. She must have lost at least a quart of blood. I used my shifter sight and saw clues. A small compression in a blanket where an infant had laid, a stain on the floor, washed invisible to the naked eye, a few used bottles. You're wasting your time. The three of us whipped around. Hatred ignited within my chest as I saw Gabby looming across from us. Despite the battle, her face was clean, dress untorn. She hadn't lifted a finger to help her soldiers, like I was surprised. A dark battle orb hovered in her palm, and it was clear by the mean look in her eyes she was intent on using it. "'Where is your child?' I snarled. "'I already took her to a safe place. She's far away from here,' Gabby promised." But you won't escape this fortress alive. I had enough of these games. The longer she spoke, the more chance she had to trick us in some way. It was time to take her life. I changed into a woven immediately. Gabby tossed the battle orb at me, but I dodged it, and it flew out the open window. She cast up a shield to defend herself, but Arthur's magic shattered it as he flung out a spell. Finlay rushed forward to stab her with his sword, but she ducked, and her magic blasted him backward. He slammed against the wardrobe, which fell over. He grunted as he forced himself to get up. I charged forward on my paws, teeth bared. This will be your last fight. I'm here to end you. I pounced. I extended my paws so they landed on Gabby's shoulders, and I slammed her to the ground. She let out a cry of pain, face pale and gaunt with terror as I lunged my jaws forward to take her life. Gabby let out an agonizing screech as my teeth crushed her spine. I was nearly shocked as my jaws latched onto her jugular and ripped out her throat. My body went still, blood cold with the realization that I'd done it. Gabby was dead, and we'd defeated her army. The war was over. After months of brother fighting brother, the Fae could get back to living in peace again. But instead of the warm taste of blood, something rotten entered my mouth. Mud. I gagged and immediately stepped backward. I changed and wiped the dirt from my mouth as Gabby's body deteriorated underneath me into nothing more than a great pile of muck on the carpet. A golem! I snarled in revulsion. That wasn't the real Gabby. This golem had been placed here to trick us. If that's not her, then she must have fled the fortress already, Finlay said quickly, clutching his side and wincing. I let out a great cry of rage. I thought this was done, that the war had finally ended and Gabby was defeated at my hand. But this was just another trap. My rage turned to panic as I considered our next move. We'd already overtaken the fortress, and yet we hadn't managed to find her. If Gabby isn't here, then where could she be? Finlay asked. I ceased to breathe as I understood the obvious. We'd been set up. The golem was a cruel player in another one of Gabby's schemes to get what she wanted, and we'd taken the bait. This couldn't be all there was to her plan. She was out there somewhere, waiting for us to walk into her next trap. Our top priority was discovering where she was hiding and bringing an end to the carnage before she lured us to our doom.
Chapter 22 Emma With the woven necklace around my neck, I felt prepared. That feeling of preparation only got stronger as I stepped out of the portal and onto the battlefield. War had begun, and with a quick analysis of the fight, I was thrilled to see that we were holding out. Our sides looked equal, and if we kept pressing Gabby's forces, we'd defeat them completely. We could actually win this thing. I had no idea where Ethan was in all this mess, but I was determined to find him. I called out through our mating bond, searching for him through our connection, but I didn't get a response. He was either too distracted to hear me, or he was too far away. The battlefield spanned miles. I'd have to find him the old-fashioned way. I went to walk forward, but a surge of pain raked up my spine and I winced. I could hardly walk, let alone run. I needed a mount if I was to locate him. I cast my thoughts out through the forest. I mentally searched the area, until my magic latched onto a monster nearby, one that was roaming the woods alone. I used my magic to enter its mind, overpowering the creature's senses. Come to me. I heard the trot of hoofbeats through the snow. I was surprised to see a puka, the dark fey horse that all were terrified of. Its red eyes pierced through me as its black mane hovered in the wind. There was an unexpected familiarity about it as the creature ventured near. Breaking into its mind had been far too easy for me. Could this monster possibly be the same one Lady Magdalena summoned during my first practice? I grabbed the monster's mane and pulled myself onto his back. I steered the horse toward the battlefield and shouted, hee The puka charged forward. I held on to the puka's mane and flattened myself to its back as we ran through the battle. I formed a shield over my head, and arrows from the soldiers above bounced off of it. As I surged by, people began crying out, The queen! The queen is here! Is she riding a monster? Someone shouted in astonishment, but I didn't stop to explain. My attention was on the line of sorceresses on top of the fortress wall. If I got that wall down, it was all over for Gabby. We'd overtake her fortress, and she'd be forced to surrender. Her army knew it. The sorceresses were focusing their efforts on me now, blasting off arrow after arrow to get me off my horse. They were in for a rude surprise. I overpowered their sight and caused the archers and sorceresses on the wall to see illusions. They began screaming, clawing at their eyes as they shouted they'd gone blind. Without their eyes, they had no idea where to shoot, giving our soldiers a chance to regroup. Our soldiers hastily came together on the ground and in the skies, while Gabby's army panicked, unsure of what to do. Ugh. I slumped forward onto the puka's back. My own vision faltered for a moment, and black dots swarmed in my eyes before I shakily righted myself. I was forced to drop the illusion, and Gabby's soldiers got their sight back. The terror of losing their eyes for a minute caused them to pause. They wouldn't stay shell-shocked for long. I had to get that wall down. I used the power of the woven necklace to summon unseely magic. It welled up inside of me, growing larger and fiercer. An orb welled between my hands, becoming a black orb of dark fire that was made of the purest unseely magic. It manifested with all my hatred for Gabby and my rage at everything she had done. I let out a carnal yell as magic burst from my fingers, and the black fire orb exploded outwards, sailing toward the fortress. The orb burst through the wards surrounding the fortress, breaking them completely. But it didn't stop there. The orb kept going, smashing into the fortress wall and causing it to topple. Terrifying yells lit up the morning, and there was a loud, crashing noise as stone toppled to the ground. Hundreds of soldiers were killed in the collapse, leaving a giant gap in the fortress wall. The two sides collided as our army rushed past the fallen wall. The sound of swords clanging together and the growls of shifters mingled with the noises of crackling magic inside the fortress gates. A pack of wolvens bounded toward me out of the rubble, sneering and yowling. I unleashed my sword and cut them down from my place on the puka's back. The puka gnashed its teeth and lashed out with its hoofs, breaking open the skulls of wolvens and crushing their bones underfoot. The puka's movements were so vicious and vile, I had to grip tightly with my free hand to remain on. Dragons flew in from above. I wasn't sure what side they were on as their flames began lighting up the battlefield. I turned the puka and charged away, flames hot on our heels as the corpses surrounding us ignited. The screams of sorceresses that were set ablaze permeated the area, and it crippled my insides to hear. 
There was a cry like an eagle from above. I looked up and saw several griffins flying at me. Their talons tore at my cloak and into my back, drawing blood. I gave a cry of pain and began swinging my sword upright to fend them off. The puka reared on its back legs, pawing at the skies as the griffins continued to swoop down. One griffin latched his claws in me. I cried out and managed to lop off one of his legs with my sword. He screeched, but tore me off my mount before flying away. I landed on the beaten snow and rolled. The toss knocked the wind out of me and also caused the spell holding the puka's mind to break. When I let go of control of the monster's mind, the puka went mad. It changed from the dark horse into the goat-headed man and began devouring Fay alive. The sick creature ran wild throughout the battlefield, grabbing Fay by the torso with its long fingers and biting their heads off with its disgusting jaws. I attempted to call the puka back, but it was no use. I had lost control, and now the puka was ravaging whoever it could get its claws in. At that moment, the wind picked up, and snow began falling faster than ever. The snow became blinding, turning the area around me into a haze of white. I couldn't see anything, not the fortress, the other soldiers, or even five feet in front of me. I staggered to my feet and clutched my sword with both hands, blindly walking into the blizzard without any sense of direction. Ethan, I called. Ethan! My cries drew attention. A couple of Gabby's soldiers came barreling in. I brought my sword up to stop them, cut the throat of one then ran through another. When sorceresses charged in from behind them, I knocked them down with battle orbs, exploding gaps in their chests. I heaved for air and tried to stay conscious. I felt trapped. This had been a horrible idea to come out here. This was nothing but chaos. I should have listened to my friends and stayed behind. And yet I'd chosen to follow the hag's command. Why did I always follow her judgment? She had only led me to misery time and time again, and yet... I was compelled to listen to her. I was an idiot. A shifter stepped out of the snowstorm. The dragon towered over me, his scales blue and his eyes pure white. He nearly blended in with the snowstorm. He displayed his fangs as he circled me, planning to go in for the kill. I didn't hesitate to defend myself. I shot out battle orbs, but they exploded against the dragon's scales with little effect. The dragon charged at me with his horns down, his giant footsteps spraying snow everywhere. I rolled out of the way, but his talon tore at my cloak, yanking me to the side. I was pulled underneath the dragon, completely at his mercy. He took a deep breath, spraying fire in my direction. I yelped and put up a shield. The dragon's fire bounced back against it, and he cried out as embers smashed into his eyes. My throat went raw as I screamed, plunging the sword upward into the dragon's throat before wrenching it away. Blood spilled out onto my clothes, and the dragon staggered backward. It stumbled to the left, collapsing from the hole in its throat. The dragon vanished into the snowstorm, but I was sure he'd be dead within minutes. I dropped the sword I was carrying and fell to my knees. After the fight with the dragon, I was too weak to lift it, let alone swing it. I forced myself to get up and attempted to conjure a spell. A blue battle orb flickered and died in my palm. I needed to try harder. I needed to keep fighting. But I couldn't. I couldn't fight anymore. I'd been weak at the start of this thing, and now I was on my last reserves. If I continued to use my magic, I'd kill myself. Losing my hearthfire had completely gutted me. The woven necklace was my only shot. I had to use the unseely power that remained in the necklace if I wanted to stay alive. It was the only reserve of power that I had left. I left the sword behind and continued onward. I'd never find Ethan, not in this storm. My goal to locate my mate had changed to simply leaving this battlefield alive. I knew there were soldiers all around me, as I could still hear them fighting, but whether they were Gabby's forces or my own was questionable. I couldn't be kidnapped by Gabby's soldiers. Not now. I had to get out of here. I moved through the snow at a snail's pace. The cold cut into my bones and caused me to shiver. For the first time, I wished I had my guard. They'd protect me and get me to a safe place. I wished Toman would come out of the snow, find me, and carry me out of this freezing hell. I'd become used to being queen, but I hadn't accepted that a queen always needed help. There were reasons she was constantly protected. I refused to succumb to that crucial fact, had been stubborn enough to insist I could do it on my own like I had before I became a royal. 
It would be my death out here. Black cloaks stood out against the whiteness. My stomach clenched and turned to stone as I recognized the skull masks looming out of the blizzard. I turned in place as a circle of them closed in on me from all sides. I recognized them. These were the real cultists, the Black Claws' oppressors, the ones Gabby had kept for her army within her fortress. And I was surrounded. The cultists closed in. Black clouds began swirling around me as the cultists summoned shadow magic. Their columns of shadow slammed into me, and I gave a shout of pain. It felt like being tackled by a dragon each time. I heard my ribs break and put a hand to my side as the black smoke columns grew larger and larger around me, blocking out the storm and surrounding me in darkness. Crack! 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 With each hit, my body grew numb. They were wearing me down so they could abduct me without much of a fight. Little did these bastards know I never gave up. No matter how many times you knocked me down. You won't take me. I refuse to be Gabby's sacrifice to Droga. With the hand that wasn't holding my ribs, I pulled unseely magic from the necklace. I tossed black fireballs at the cultists, and as their shadowy forms swept by, the orbs made them catch flame. The cultists screamed out as the black fire forced them to return to solid forms, eating up their cloaks and their bodies. I didn't even look where I was throwing. In a panic, I summoned black orb after black orb, ricocheting them outward. Most missed, but I was tossing so many that it achieved my goal. The circle of cultists around me turned into fiery pyres of black flames. The unseelie magic licked at their bodies, devouring them whole until all that was left of them was the remnants of their black cloaks slumped against the snow. The woven necklace grew hot against my neck, pressing against the old familiar burn that the dark necklace had left on me during the king's contest. I wept with pain. The cultists around me were dead, but more would come. I shuffled through the snow faster now, though I felt like an old woman. My knees shook on the verge of collapse. I just have to make it to the tree line, I told myself. If I get there, I'll be safe. Leaving the battlefield was no sure guarantee of safety. I'd be followed by cultists, and I could freeze to death before anyone found me, friend or foe. The storm began to let up a little, and relief welled within my center as I saw the woodland ahead. Cover! If I could just get out of sight! An ugly-ass man stepped into my path, and I felt disgust well up inside of me as I met the shifter's sinister sneer. Acolyte Vesper. Of course he was out here looking for me. But he was different since the last time I saw him in the woods months ago. His right arm was missing, cut off at the shoulder. I wasn't sure where he'd lost it. We finally found you, World Weaver, Vesper said. It's a very important day for you. Seems like you're missing something, I said cruelly, eyes locked on his lost limb. Vesper's lip curled. Yes. The queen took my arm after she discovered I failed to provide her the griffin stone when it was in my possession. A careless mistake. One I'm not keen to make again. Get out of my way, I snarled. Vesper cackled. I'm afraid that's not possible. You see, if I let you out of my grasp again, she'll take my other arm, and I'm quite fond of it. Vesper morphed into a griffin. He crouched down on three legs, beak spread wide as he began to pounce. I backed away, but really, where was there to go? He'd get me in his talons, then fly me off to Gabby. I prepared to draw upon the last reserves of the woven necklace as Vesper went to strike. Unseelie magic crackled in my fingers as Vesper jumped toward me. It died as a brown blur came swooping down from the skies, tackling Vesper to the ground. My jaw dropped open as a tawny woven faced Vesper, tucking his massive wings to his side. Run, Emma, Lucian cried. You must get somewhere safe. Lucian launched himself at Vesper and the griffin lashed out. Vesper rammed into Lucian's middle, knocking the wolf into the ground. Vesper latched his claws into Lucian's pelt, digging in and drawing blood. Dad, I cried out. It was the first time I'd called him that, and I meant it. I was terrified that Lucian was going to get hurt. Lucian emitted a ferocious growl and rolled to pin Vesper underneath him. The two began a wicked battle of fang and claw, yowls emitting, 
feathers and Fleur flying. I froze. How can I leave my father here to fight Vesper alone? Dad? I whimpered again. Leave, child. They cannot find you. Lucine tore into Vesper's neck and blood sprayed everywhere. Vesper smacked Lucine off of him with a taloned paw, and the two shifters circled each other, looking for an opening. Somehow, I found strength enough in me to flee. I left Lucien to his battle with Vesper as I ran into the woods. My broken ribs ached, laboring my breathing. I still clutched my side as I maneuvered around trees and climbed over logs and rocks. The need to survive and escape the cult kept me pressing onward as the sounds of battle faded into the background. Eventually, the forest grew silent. I heard birds chirping and the rushing of water. I kept going until I came to a waterfall, one that poured into a frozen pond. I knelt at the edge of it and drank from the water, taking deep gulps to restore my strength. I was safe, for now. There was no one out here. I could finally rest. My back hit a rock. The aches and pains of the battle overtook me, and my lips trembled as I forced myself not to cry. Help would come. My friends, my mate, my guard. Somebody would find me. I wouldn't die out here. I had paid for my terrible decision, but we could still rectify this. The cult wouldn't find me, the eclipse would pass, and everything would be all right, like Ethan had said. My heart became hopeful as I heard footsteps approaching. Those hopes were dashed when I saw Lady Corva emerge from the woods, wearing a blood-red velvet cloak and a look that would kill me if possible. It's been too long, she uttered, for months. I swore I would avenge my son's death. The day has finally come. I used the boulder to pull myself to my feet. You'll have to kill me, because I won't be taken prisoner. Trust me, girl, I'll get the chance. Corva seethed. She sent a battle orb spinning out at me. I ducked. It hit the rock face behind me, sending gravel flying. I was aware this wasn't a fair fight. She'd been my least favorite teacher. If I was at my peak, I'd make this bitch eat snow. Unfortunately, I was more vulnerable than I'd ever been, and Corva was no amateur. I hoped I had enough power left in my necklace to fight her off, because I couldn't run from her. Corva's battle orbs raced toward me, and I had to hide behind a boulder to avoid them. My arms shook as I conjured unseelie magic, shooting it out at Corva from behind the rock. They were like wisps of wind, ones that dissipated before they had a chance to hit her. I could feel the woven necklace weakening. I gasped as I conjured one last unseely fireball and tossed it at her. It was effective, but Corva dodged the fireball. It knocked over a tree behind her and unseely flames licked at the bark. With that last orb, the woven necklace broke. The shards of the crystal cut into my skin as it shattered, and I collapsed, giving a harsh cry. My entire body quivered against the snow. That was it. No more magic to use. I was as defenseless as I'd ever been. Lady Corva approached me with a sneer. Don't try to school me on unseely magic, girl, Corva spat. I studied it before you were even born. She bundled a hand in my hair and yanked at it, pulling me to my feet. I yelped as I felt a few strands break free. You took my son from me. Corva threw me down to the snow viciously. If Gabriella didn't need you, you'd already be dead. Corva sneered. But she won't need you after tonight. Then you'll be mine to toy with. Your nasty little friends will find you in pieces when I'm finished. No, I whimpered, but that's all I could do to fight back. She slapped me across the face and I fell over again. She tangled a hand in my hair once more and dragged me behind her. I reached up to tear at her wrists, but her grip was like iron. Corva swept her hand in a graceful circle, and a portal bloomed before us. Once the ceremony is complete and your blood has been taken to raise the Dark Lord, we'll have some fun. I will enjoy my nephew's torment once he finds your mangled body. Perhaps it will abate some of the pain I felt when I saw what his spriggan had done to my beautiful son. She placed two fingertips to my temple, and my body slumped. A trance overtook me as Corva hauled me through the portal, away from any hope of salvation, and directly to my fate. Chapter 23 Ethan 
What is this insanity? I scanned the room we stood in, trying to analyze the area despite the panic building within me. I stepped around the mess of the golem Gabby had made, attempting to make sense of it all. Do you think she even had the child, or was it a rumor she fed to us hoping we'd fall for it? Finlay asked. There are definitely remnants of a child here, I insisted. We can all smell it. It's not an illusion. The labor wasn't a lie, Arthur said angrily, but she used it to her advantage to lure us here. Arthur was right. Gabby had taken her daughter and fled before we'd even arrived. But why? Why would she willingly leave her only stronghold? What's our next move? Finley was already thinking ahead, urging me to make a call. We need to leave the fortress, I said immediately. Get those wovens back through the tunnels and start an immediate search for Gabby in the woods. I'll order it right away, Finlay said. I heard his telepathic call to the wovens echo across my mind, informing them that Gabby had left the fortress and was most likely hiding somewhere in the area. There were howls and barks as the wovens went back into the tunnels to return to the forests in a chase for Gabby. She could have taken a portal to anywhere, Finlay raged, hissing as his side continued to bother him. Perhaps, but that doesn't mean we can give up. Follow me. I changed into a woven, and the others followed my lead. We ran through the fortress, leaving behind the remainder of Gabby's soldiers that were still alive and returning to the tunnel we came through. The tunnel seemed even darker and more foreboding than it had the first time. Once we were halfway to the exit, the sound of our paws pounding against the dirt was cut off by a rumbling sound. We skidded to a stop, and my stomach jolted. The entire tunnel shook, and dirt rained from the ceiling. Vibrations skittered upward through my paws, and my ears began ringing. "'What's that noise?' Finlay shouted, and my nails dug into the dirt. The earth continued to shake like there was some sort of massive earthquake. Then, all of a sudden, it stopped. I sniffed the air but couldn't smell anything. There was a chill in my bones that had nothing to do with the cold. Come on. I ran along the twisting tunnel until my eyes saw something in the darkness. A small wooden box had fallen out of the wall, as if it had been concealed there by an illusion and the spell had broken. I smelled it and caught a variety of magical ingredients. There was a timer on the top of the box. It had stopped counting just before the last second. A magical explosive, Arthur said bitterly. One that malfunctioned and didn't go off to our great luck. Gabby gained an idea from our gunpowder plot last spring, Finlay said in horror. That's why this tunnel is new. What if all of them are? Arthur's voice was petrified. What if? I felt it in my gut that something was deeply, achingly wrong. I spun toward Finlay. We need to get in contact with the woven on the surface, I snarled. Someone find out what's going on. There weren't many wovens who hadn't gone into the tunnels. A small group had stayed behind to help the alicorns, but no more. Finlay paused to listen, cocking his head as he attempted to telepathically communicate with someone on the other side. He whimpered, and my stomach rolled with what I knew to be true. Gabby exploded the rest of the tunnels, Finlay said breathlessly. We're the only ones that made it out alive. My very heart felt sick. Back to the fortress, I ordered. There's something we missed. We turned around and went back the way we came. I felt the need to take action in some sort of way. Once we reached the fortress again, I began climbing steps upward, leaving the courtyard behind. There were soldiers on the wall opposite us, but they were very far away, and the three of us couldn't handle them alone. Instead, I headed toward one of the towers, desiring to get a better vantage point. We met soldiers along the way. I dispatched them quickly with my sword, and Finlay hacked to pieces the ones that got by me. Arthur took care of the reinforcements that came along the back, collapsing them to their knees with his magic. Even so, it wasn't the kind of pushback I was expecting. My heartbeat began picking up, getting quicker and quicker and drowning out the sounds of battle as blood rushed in my ears. For the first time, I'd noticed what I'd failed to recognize before. The excitement of the battle had masked it, but now that I was using my head, I realized, where were all the soldiers? There aren't enough troops here to defend the fort, Finlay said. Not nearly as many as we predicted. Where did they all go? I didn't answer. Instead, 
I climbed the tower we'd just cleared, praying there would be some sort of progress. I was completely gutted as I stood at the top of the tower, looking down upon the battlefield. All I saw was red staining the white snow, and hundreds of bodies. Arrows and spears littered the ground, sticking out of the corpses of dead soldiers. There were great holes in the earth where the tunnels had collapsed, burying shifters alive. The collapse of the tunnels had completely gutted our army. It had killed off more than just the shifters who'd been inside. Anyone standing above them had also been blown to pieces. All I saw below me was a disorganized mess. Alicorns and griffins scattered left and right, while dragons careened out of the sky, smashing into the bloodied earth. The neat, organized battalions we'd brought were gone. Amongst the bodies of the dead, the remainder of the living fought in chaos. And despite it all, Gabby wasn't here. The entire thing was a trap, Arthur spat. She played us like a fucking chessboard. She'd been expecting us to take advantage of her weakness after her labor, hoping we'd be foolhardy enough to leave Emma behind and attack the fortress. Gabby had used her weakness as a strength and the poor timing of the eclipse to divide us from our greatest weapon. My king, what should we do? Finlay's brusque voice snapped me out of it. He'd been trying to get my attention for minutes. I shook my head as if I was in a fog. Finlay's voice was rough. Do we turn back our armies and retreat, or continue the search for Gabby? Everyone was looking at me. I was the king. I had to make a decision. And yet, all I wanted to do was succumb to grief. Gabby had been cunning enough to outsmart all of us, and that infuriated me. We were smart, but she was craftier, and as I knew Gabby, she would do anything to win. There was nothing more dangerous than a marked scorned. I'd taken Elijah from her. She was going to make me suffer for it. Gabby's not here, I finally admitted. She saw us coming and left. Her guards will protect her now. She's out of our reach. But where did she go? Why has this fortress been abandoned? Finlay demanded. Arthur shrugged at a loss. Rage welled inside of me, threatening to spill over. Arthur, what's happening? I turned toward him, certain he knew. He had been so quiet since we defeated the golem. He remained silent, and I yelled, Arthur, answer me! Arthur's green eyes resembled his sister's. They took on an identical feature when Emma thought all was hopeless, and gods, it petrified me. She took her army to Dolinska. The effect of his confession was similar to a dagger being run through me, cut straight down my torso and through my organs. Even after all this time, I hadn't figured it out. I had been so impatient to get this war over with, I hadn't foreseen the obvious. Gabby had left General Davor and a portion of her soldiers behind to defend the fort and serve the ruse, counting on the strength of her walls and her sorceresses to keep us distracted long enough that we wouldn't realize we were being tricked. The rest of her army had left the fortress through the tunnels, most likely last night, placing explosives in them as they went. Then they'd snuck past us as we'd marched by, leaving Dolinska defenseless and for the taking. There were thousands of innocent people in that city. I was nearly certain she was already assaulting the palace. She'd gambled losing the fortress in order to beat us, and she had. There wasn't any way in hell we could make it back to Dolinska to defend the city not with the few broken soldiers that still remained. Martha was quiet again, and Finlay whispered, What shall we do? My mouth was dry, voice hollow as I replied, We save who we can. That is all there is left to do. My goal switched from winning this war to rescuing whatever lives were still able to be saved. Outside, the sounds of battle were beginning to die down, but the snow had picked up into such a torrent I could barely see the outline of my companions. Snow flew at a rapid rate through the tower's balcony, the wind whipping through me like a knife. We must return to the battlefield, I insisted. There are soldiers out there who need assistance. We can't go out in this. We'll get lost, Arthur insisted, gesturing angrily at the snow. We take shelter from the storm, then rescue who we can. I wanted to argue, but to do so would be pointless. Putting our own lives in danger wouldn't do us any good, and I wouldn't sacrifice anyone else today. Hours passed. We waited out the snowstorm inside the fortress. As time passed, the noise of the fight got quieter and quieter, then silent. As the day lengthened, I knew that the fighting was long over. 
The cries of dying men and women had faded into the wind. The snow finally let up, and we left the fortress. Outside we found a great hole had been blasted in the side of the fortress wall. I did not know how it had gotten there, nor what kind of magic had created it. But it was abandoned now. The snow covered up the bodies of fallen warriors like a shroud. Of the living, the area was more or less empty. Gabby's soldiers had marched onward, leaving the fort behind to join the rest of her army in Dolinska. Arthur, Finlay, and I picked around the contents of the battlefield, looking desperately for survivors. The stench of death reeked into my nose. The crows were already feasting, plucking out eyeballs and flesh. I checked another body, but the soldier beneath me remained unmoving. The sun was starting to set over the horizon. In hardly an hour, it'd be dark. There's no one alive out here, Finlay said in frustration as he stepped away from the body of a sorceress. I, Arthur agreed lonesomely. He'd been kneeling by the corpse of a young soldier who hadn't responded to his attempts to wake him. We keep looking. Each body that I came across was just as still as the last. With every corpse I approached, I was horrified that I might find the body of a friend, though I was relieved and guilty to find no faces I recognized among the dead. This was my greatest failure as king. There was no greater dishonor. An alicorn trotted out of the fortress, a large cut on his flank. He tossed his head before transforming, clutching his bleeding hip. You all right, Theo? Arthur asked. I will survive, though I'm sorry to say the rest of my alicorns did not, he said heavily. The arrows did us in. There were wing beats from above. I looked upward. Alexei hovered down, changing into a man as he landed on his feet. It's a good thing I found you, Alexei said. I was certain all of you are gone. There was silence until Finlay asked, Do you have a report? General Bonnie is dead, Alexei said reluctantly. Most of our army died when the tunnels collapsed, and the other battalions couldn't keep up. Our forces scattered in different directions once General Bonnie fell. I attempted to control them, but most fled into the woods. They've abandoned us. The last hope I had for a revival was dashed away. There was no saving Dolinska from Gabby's forces now. We couldn't fight them without an army, and ours had gone missing. The humiliated soldiers who'd survived were probably retreating back home to Dolinska. What they'd find when they got there. They'd be forced to surrender or flee the city. There'd be no other option once Gabby overtook the palace. Would she take pity on the soldiers who survived? No. They'd be executed for allying with me. Gabby showed no mercy. Dolinska was most certainly lost, and our army had been vanquished. I'd lost all hope to defend my country. There was no longer any doubt which monarch would rise to rule the nation. The war was over. We'd failed to protect the Fae. Gabby had won. We should have seen this coming, Alexei mused. But we did not, Theo said desperately. We failed. No one had to be told what had happened. Gabby's plan was perfectly clear to everyone. All was quiet until Arthur suggested. Perhaps the people will rise up. Maybe we can count on the citizens of Dolinska to fight her off. Alexei gave a brisk nod. I will fly to Dolinska and report back on what I see there. And I will go with you, Theo added. Both men transformed and took to the sky. I prayed they returned with good news, but at this point I was in too much despair to hope. We continued our search for survivors again until a black dot appeared in the sky. Stefan trailed down, landing with a heavy thud upon the earth. He was bleeding heavily from several cuts on his flank, but luckily he was alive. General Daver got away, Stefan growled, stomping his foot into the dirt. I have failed to avenge my mate's broken heart. You are not the only one who did not succeed, my friend, I told him lowly. Stefan transformed back and roamed toward me. His expression grew cold as he took in the blood-stained snow, the mangled corpses. I see the gods were not on our side. I gave a petty laugh. The gods were not here today. They did not so much as look our way. Finlay and Arthur went on ahead, but I stopped my search for survivors. I knew there was no one alive out there, and if there had been when they'd fallen, the cold had long since killed them off. This is pointless, I uttered. 
I'd never wasted so much time, so much life in one fell blow. What do you mean? Stefan gazed at me. All at once, a confession came tumbling out. I have been thinking over these past few months, ever since the battle at Pruska. I do not understand why war is necessary, I began. When I was younger, I would adamantly argue that without war, there can be no peace. I sighed. But now that I am older, I see that war is pointless. It has no meaning, only sacrifice. As a child, I saw patriotism and young men sacrificing themselves for their country. I thought it was a holy thing to do. Now, I only see it as a great waste of life. Patriotism and the worship of the military is nothing but posturing. It is a way for nations to pat themselves on the back and make themselves feel better about throwing away the lives of thousands and destroying families. I watched the crows fly over the remnants of frozen bodies as I continued. You know as well as I that I was raised in a very conservative household, one that was devoted to the gods. Religion and war tied together. They are two faces of the same coin, and urging that our lives on this planet mean nothing, and every sacrifice is built for the greater good, as a reward in the afterlife. Thus, religion disvalues life. If you live on, what consequence is it that you lose your life now? Do you mean to blaspheme the gods? Stefan asked in shock. Of course not. That's not to say that I don't believe in the afterlife. I do. But my perception of that afterlife has changed. I believe in the afterlife and in reincarnation, as all they do. But as your soul lives on, you only get one chance, one experience to be the person you are now before you change into someone or something else. So why throw that beautiful ride away for something as meaningless as war? Stefan observed me as I marched forward, shaking my head. I believed war was just. Then I learned the truth about what we did to the Unseelie people and to the other supernatural races. I learned we helped exterminate the elves. And I've been fighting this battle with Gabby for a year now, a war that has virtually accomplished little and cost much. There will be a reward for all of this loss, Stefan insisted. Your father changed Malovia for all he did to spare our country from the Black Claw. I scoffed. That victory was only one in the hearts of Fay who had precious little time to experience freedom before it was taken away from them once again by religious extremists who have framed war as a holy honor to gain favor in the afterlife. I realized the flaws in my own religion, the preaching from the pulpit that drove on the need to convert or kill those who are unlike us and became horrified by what I supported. I listened to the prejudiced rantings of my own family members against the sick, the poor, the dying, the different, and realized we'd all gone mad. I stared at my friend. What are we, Stefan? Them or us? What is the truth? They are us. War is sometimes necessary, Stefan insisted. Is that not a lie we tell ourselves? I demanded. How many wars have been fought on the basis of one lord wishing to claim land from another, one empire fighting for profit against a similar kingdom, both of which have tyrants who are willing to sacrifice their people for more gold, more countries, more wealth, and more abundance they won't even recognize? I scoffed. I realize the truth now. A king will not notice if you add a million coins to his treasury, but one family will notice the absence of a father, a mother, a child, or a spouse for many lifetimes. War is useless. It is horrid, unbelievable, cruel. And as long as there is greed on this planet and a need for people to prove themselves right, it will continue. I turned away from him. But as an individual, even as a king, I can do nothing. Power is absolute, and power will always have the desire to feed. Stefan dropped his head, and my tongue was still. I knew why I had come out here today. I wanted to prove to myself there was still some good in war, that for the greater good, sacrifices had to be made. A hard lesson learned, one that had cost the lives of hundreds. A sacrifice made in the name of the greater good was just an excuse to cause ruin. I knew that truth now as deeply as I knew my own reflection. It didn't take long for Alexei and Theo to return. They landed on the battlefield just before the sun dipped below the horizon. Alexei sounded broken. The city has fallen. Dolinska is under Gabby's control. 
If you could hear a hard break, ours would have sounded like gunshots across the battlefield. Stefan put his face into his arm, trying to shield it from view. What of Amantha? Finlay demanded. Did you find her, or any of the others? His voice ached with concern for his love. We'd left loved ones back at the palace. Amantha, Vera, Ozzy, and Jasper were still trapped there, for all we knew. I'm sorry, Finn. I did not. Alexei apologized. Finlay gave a yell of anguished grief. He tore the sword from his side and tossed it to the frozen earth before collapsing to his knees, putting his face in his hands. Arthur was trembling. Vera. I ached alongside him, for I felt his pain. What of Arthur's mate and his unborn children? Where were they now? I begged the gods they were in a safe place. Gabby would not permit children that were related to Emma in any way to live. Didn't the people fight back? Finlay asked hoarsely. A bit, Theo shrugged. But any rebellion was quenched quickly. From what we could tell, the people opened the gates and let them in. I felt betrayed in the worst way. Mere days ago, the country had cheered for us and celebrated our wedding. It had only taken them moments to switch sides. But I could not blame them. How could I ask them to resist when met with such a terrifying force? And where's Gabby? I demanded. Is she there? I do not know. Alexei shook his head. We flew over the palace but didn't see her or any of her personal staff. She's not around, Theo said. Gabby would enter the city with a variety of fanfare to make sure everyone knew she'd won and there was no such noise to be had. Why wouldn't she be in the palace by now? This didn't make any sense. A ragged cry echoed across the battlefield, that of a woman. My heart plummeted as I saw Kiara and Odette rushing our way, doing their best to help a very pregnant Delmare navigate the bodies. My veins became ice as I realized my mate was not with them. The shifters rushed forward to greet their mates. Odette threw herself upon Theo, while Kiara stumbled into Alexei. Delmare appeared on the verge of fainting, clutching her stomach with a wince. Stefan hoisted her into his arms, appearing gravely worried. "'Why didn't you do as I asked?' Alexei grabbed Kiara's arms and shook her. "'Why are you here?' "'We've been looking for you all day, but couldn't find you!' Kiara all but sobbed. "'Emma's gone!' My life came crashing down around me. I thought the world had ended seconds ago, but it was nothing compared to the possibility of this. She's been missing all day. We're certain she took a portal here to find Ethan. Odette wept. We came to the battlefield to look, but everything was so chaotic we just hid in the woods until it... Odette put her face in her hands. Theo rubbed her back while I struggled to remain on my feet. This had been another part of Gabby's plan. Destroying Emma's hearth fire had been no random attack. We must find Emma, I said with a start. She must be out here. She... I became petrified at the thought of her being one of these lifeless forms lying cold underneath the snow. I began turning over bodies in a panic, hands shaking as I feared each face I next observed would be the one of my wife. Find her, I growled. Someone help me. Ethan, they wouldn't have killed her. Stefan said in a strained voice. They would have. His voice cut off, and I remembered. The eclipse. It was tonight. I was senseless. I was her mate. I would know if she was dead, and our bond still pulsed with life. But would it last for long? What if the cultists had found her and brought her to Gabby? What if they used her blood for their dark purpose and made things worse in the world than it already was? What if they already had? I bet Emma made that hole in the fortress wall, Delmare said weakly. Who else could? She had to be right. I changed into a wolven and ran toward the fortress, putting my nose to the ground. Near the toppled wall, there was a whiff of something familiar underneath all this rubble. Emma had been here. I tried to catch the trail of my mate's scent, but it was muddled with all the different smells of blood and gore. There was no possible way to follow it. Emma! I called out, both with my voice and through our bond. Ona Wilke, where are you? The sound of snowflakes hitting the earth was my only answer. My breathing quickened, and my heartbeat began to pound so madly I was sure it would spill out of my chest. This was my worst nightmare. Emma, gone from me and in a place I did not know. I gave a loud howl of woe, and it echoed across the valley. Still, my mate did not respond. I staggered back into my human form, sat on a stone, and sobbed. 
What had I done? I knew mates should never be separated, and I'd willfully parted myself from her when she had needed my protection the most. Now she was a victim to cultists and a tool for Gabby to use. Worst of all, I could not find her, so I could not stop it. Once they took her blood, they would certainly kill her. Emma would be dead before dawn, and I'd cease to care what happened to me after. My country and my wife, both gone. What was there left to fight for? Nothing. Life did not matter, after all that. A woman came crawling out of the fortress wall. What are you sitting there crying for? She barked. This is no time for tears. Time is running short, and the eclipse is upon us. I lifted my head. Lady Magdalena swept her cloak behind her, appearing displeased and very, very worried. But, Emma, it was all I could say. She is somewhere nearby, I am sure of it, Magdalena said sharply. We cannot give up. We will search all of Malovia to find her. Do you think there's still a chance? I asked. Of course, we can't allow this to happen, Magdalena said in a rush. Droga cannot be resurrected. It would mean the doom of all Fey. But how can we prevent it? I asked weakly. By finding her and interrupting that ceremony, Magdalena insisted. Ethan, you'll come with me. Arthur, get your friends to the place we agreed upon. We're going to need everyone to be safe in case the worst happens. Arthur nodded. He conjured a portal and reached out a hand. In you go. He helped Kiara and Alexei through first. I did not know where my friends were going, but I did not care. My only concern was locating Emma and stopping the bastards from using her blood to raise the Dark Lord. Stay close to me, King Ethan, Magdalena ordered as we left the fortress behind us. Where we go, not even the gods dare wander, and only luck will see us back again. Chapter 24 Emma My head felt groggy as I slowly came out of the trance. Around me were noises, the shaking of wooden rattles, the thumping of leather drums, and the low voices of chanting men. I smelled smoke and burning incense. I forced my weary eyes to open. It was completely dark outside. There were trees everywhere. Somewhere in the distance, I smelled the crisp alpine scent of mountains. Where was this place? I didn't recognize it. Other features came into view. Black Claw oppressors were the ones playing the music, singing a malevolent song. Directly in front of me was a stone casket, one overgrown with vines and branches. The grave looked centuries old, completely ravaged by time. Carved into the side of the stone casket were designs. Malovian runes depicting a warning. Thou must not disturb this resting place, for to do so would be to incur the wrath of death. I was bound. Iron chains were around my wrists and ankles. They burned my skin and prevented me from using magic. Not that I had any left to use, anyway. I let out a gasp of pain as my arm rushed against the iron cuffs, causing my skin to bubble and blister. Already, there was blood oozing from the wounds. There was a black claw oppressor on my left side, and my right. As I struggled to sit up, I saw that Lady Corva and Queen Antonia were watching me closely from the trees outside the circle. Both would stop me if I tried to escape. You'd kill your son's wife? I asked Queen Antonia, directing all my hatred at her. I have no son, Antonia replied coldly. Just as you will have no father if you do not comply. My heart clenched as two cultists dragged Lord Lucian out of the woods. He was bound in iron, as I was, and looking grave. His face was marred with bruises, blood dripping from the wounds. Leave him alone, I said, voice rising. He doesn't have any part in this. We all have a part to play tonight, Lady Corva replied. His is to make sure you don't run off. My throat tightened. They'd captured Lord Lucian to be sure I'd comply. Even if I had the strength to run, I would stay, because I didn't want them to hurt my dad. Everything will be all right, Emma, Lucian told me. Just stay calm. I didn't know how he wasn't losing his mind at a time like this. A horrid laugh came from the woods. You are a hopeless optimist. 
Acolyte Vesper came waltzing out of the forest, looking rather pleased with himself. Disgust welled within me. Fuck off, Vesper. I spat at his feet. He jumped aside and wrinkled his nose. I thought a queen was supposed to have manners. She is no queen. Gabby emerged from the shadows, red cloak sweeping around her, her face set on malicious intent. The sight of her caused every rotten emotion I'd ever felt to well up inside of me. This bitch had caused me so much suffering, so much pain. I wished I had killed her on the rooftop of Arcania University months ago. I was no longer scared. I was fucking pissed. Didn't know you'd bother yourself to come down and finish the job. I shot at her. Figured you'd make one of your cronies do it. I have to perform the ceremony. I am the mate of the Hidden King and Droga's patron. I am the one who can accomplish the task, Gabby replied shortly, as if she were eager to get on with it. Gabby was paler than I remembered. She winced as she approached me and was slow to walk forward. She cringed as she began anointing the grave with oil. Her labor had taken a lot out of her. I wasn't the only one who wasn't at the top of my game. Where's your baby? I demanded. Or did you sacrifice her to Droga, too? Gabby spun around so fast I was surprised she didn't break her neck. Leave my child out of this. She is the only part of Eli I have left. Gabby drew herself up. But not after tonight. After so long apart, my love and I will finally be reunited. My jaw dropped open. Did Gabby intend to resurrect Elijah? To bring him back from the underworld? She was crazy. This is a mistake, I insisted. Elijah is dead. He is not dead, just in another place, one you sent him to, she raged. Once I resurrect Droga, he will bring my beloved back to life. You can't. Gabby, this is wrong. Do not judge me, she sneered. You would do the same if you were in my position. I wouldn't force Ethan to return to a world that... You have no idea what I've been through. Gabby's voice rose, screeching across the forest. You cannot comprehend the devastation I have felt, carrying a child whose father no longer roams this earth. The grief in her voice was nearly enough to make me feel sorry for her. The loss of Elijah had driven her half mad, and seeing how she'd been kind of nuts already before all this happened, now she was full-on insane. Gabriella, please, Lady Corva pleaded, as if to calm her. Gabby's eyes flared. Just keep your mouth shut, Sosna, before I find a way to silence you. I gave a cruel laugh. Go ahead and break my other knee. I just might. Gabby narrowed her eyes. It's funny that it takes you, your mate, and all your friends to outwit me, and you still lose. Because we make bad decisions... I growled, but you know what? Every time that happens, we get better because we learn from our mistakes. You think that's a threat? You won't have the opportunity to make another mistake, Sosna. This is the end for you. Gabby got right in my face. By the way, I know you're still bitter about what I did, and I don't regret it. She kicked my bad knee. I cried out as I fell onto my face the wound pounding with blinding agony. I heard Lord Lucian give a gasp. I didn't want my dad to see me give in, so I struggled upright and spat snow out of my mouth. I don't care what you say. I'm still a queen, I said through clenched teeth. This is my country, my land. It's not yours. Gabby's lip rose. Doesn't look like anyone's coming to save you. They'll come. Liar, did you honestly believe you would remain the false queen of the Arcania for long? Do you think you have what it takes to rule a shifter empire? Gabby cried. She turned her back on me. You know nothing. That I caught you in my trap proves it. You have failed at being queen, and tonight the Fae will know who the rightful monarch is. I will reign over them forever. Gabby indicated for the cultists to drag me to my feet. I was wrenched upright and yanked toward the grave. I fought, but there was no resisting the shifters containing me. The eclipse is in position, 
Lady Corva hissed. Gabriella, it is time. Gabby stepped before the grave. The music from the cultists became more intense as Gabby raised her hands to the sky and began a chant in Melovian. I'd been learning from Ethan, so I could decipher the words as she called them to the stars. Droga, black steg of wrath, your servant, she sings. Awaken from your prison and take this offering. Burst forth from your grave, for I am your believer, and I have come to give you the blood of a world weaver. Gabby withdrew a knife from her cloak. She grabbed me by the arm and yanked me forward. I let out a cry as she cut into my palm. She took my hand and smeared the blood upon the stone casket. My bleeding palm was dragged across the grave to Gabby's satisfaction until she pushed me down and placed her own palms over the stone. God of agony and suffering, by my prayer abide. I say to you, God of poor death, arise, arise, arise. The earth started to shake. There was a tearing sound as the stone grave broke in half. The cultists began babbling in wonderment, and I backed away from the casket, absolutely terrified. Thick smoke rose from the broken grave, and black fire licked at the edges of the stone. The sound of torturous screams from the underworld were on the wind as a hole in the ground opened wide, and the stone casket fell into it. My innards shuddered as I watched dark antlers emerge from the grave first. A powerful stag pulled himself from the grave, monstrous in size, hoofs digging into the dirt as he hefted himself upward. The stag took up the length of the clearing, body corded with muscle, a pelt darker than midnight. His eyes burned red, leaving a trail of ruby fog in the night as his head rose above the treetops and his antlers extended to the sky. Droga, the dark god. Everyone in the circle dropped to their knees. The cultists bowed before Droga. Lady Corva, along with Queen Antonia, curtsied. Gabby stared at Droga in reverence, like she'd never seen a more enchanting sight. Droga took a moment to survey the area, nostrils heaving smoke into the night, before his form changed into that of a man. I had to hold my breath at his appearance. He was beautiful, dark hair porcelain skin, and red eyes that gleamed bright. He might have been the most handsome man in the world. Anyone could fall in love with him. His neck turned, and I shuddered. The foreboding feeling only got worse as his burning gaze landed on me. A world weaver. His tone was gleeful. I haven't seen one in nearly an age. This fucker was definitely going to eat me the minute he got the chance. His attention turned to Gabby. You have done well, my servant. For your faithfulness, I shall give you one reward. Ask it, and it shall be yours. Gabby lowered herself to the ground and prostrated herself before the god. Droga, lord of the darkness and heir to the world, I beg of you to hear my request. I have been a devoted patron, and only have but one wish. Raise my mate from the dead and return him to me. Bring him back from the underworld's gates, and I shall serve you all my life. Her tone was desperate. Droga's look was full of pity. I cannot restore to you what you ask, for I do not have that power, he replied. To give life only lies with the goddess of creation, and I am one of death. Gabby blinked. Tears marred her eyes as she bowed her head and said, I understand. However, I do have an alternative, Droga said. You have been a good and faithful servant, and I am in need of a wife. Take my hand in marriage, and I will rear your child as my own and raise you to goddess status. You will want for nothing and live forever. No, I weakly whimpered. Gabby's look was astounded as Droga extended his hand to her. I could see in her eyes the choice she had to make, losing Elijah forever, or protecting her child by becoming a goddess. Finally, 
Gabby took Droga's hand and rose. I accept your offer of marriage, she said. I will become your bride. Any wish I'd have of saving the Fae died in that moment. Lady Corva, bold as she was, dared to step forward. Gabriella, now that the ceremony is complete, do what you wish with her, Gabby said, eyes still locked on Droga. I have no use for her anymore. Corva snaked out her hand and grabbed me around the neck. Lucian gave cries of protest, struggling to get out of the irons they put him in. I felt Corva's grip tighten around my neck and knew I was done for unless I came up with a plan. I had to stall them and hope someone came before they lost interest. You kill me, you'll never find the crystals, I screamed. Gabby remained unaffected, but I watched Droga's eyes glint. The crystals of harmony? Exactly, I seethed. I have five of them. Only I know where they are. The crystals mean nothing now. My lord has been resurrected, Gabby said. There could be no more power than what he holds. If the crystals of harmony aren't united, and if the portal to Edenmire remains closed, the Fae will turn to dust and cease to exist, I cried. You have to listen to me. How do we know that isn't just a story told to you by Milana to scare you into doing what she says? Gabby challenged. I'd like some proof. Droga swept toward me. Corva let me go and stepped away, bowing her head as the dark god approached. Droga's tone was very curious. I'd be interested to know where these crystals are. He ran a finger across my cheek, and I shivered. His touch was painful, like frostbite. Acolyte Vesper was a fucking moron, and it showed when he dared to interrupt. P pardon me, my lord, Vesper whimpered. I was hoping that... Be still, servant, Droga barked at him. I have no interest in your venomous false vows to me. Vesper gave a pathetic little murmur and stepped back. I swallowed as Droga took my chin in his hand and said, Now, where might these crystals be? I let out a nervous chuckle. That's the problem. I'm sworn to Milana, and I promised I'd gather these crystals for her, not you. Droga gave an eerie smile. My dear sister-in-law and I have often failed to see eye to eye. I have a bad habit of devouring her champions. Oh, great. That meant me. I somehow grew ovaries of steel as I looked Droga straight in the eye and said, You need me if you want to find them. Torture is not one of my favorite methods, though I am not afraid of using it. Droga replied, I will convince you to tell me where the crystals are willingly with enough time. All fey eventually fall for me. It is a talent of mine. No way I was gonna let Droga take me prisoner so I could develop Stockholm Syndrome. But at least I'd bought myself some time. Corva's eyes burned violently, furious she'd missed her chance to take my life. Droga strode away from me and turned in place, gesturing to the cultists. I thank you all for your patronage, but the time has come for you to serve your purpose. Know that each of you shall be rewarded in the underworld. All of the cultists collapsed at once, including Acolyte Vesper. They writhed on the ground, clutching at their throats as foam spewed out of their mouths. In seconds, they died. I watched as Vesper clawed at the earth, eyes popping out of his head as his body seized, then suddenly went still. My body shook. Droga had drained their magic without blinking an eye. I'd never seen such an incredible display of power. Droga inhaled deeply. Ah, it feels so good to feed again. Gabby strode forward. My lord? Sosna is yours. She pointed at me, and gods, I wanted to slap her. But Droga paid her no mind. The world weaver is a special treat. Her power is to be saved for a greater time, Droga said shortly. Besides, I want those crystals. 
Drogo reached out and put a hand on me. I screamed, thinking this was it, but my cries died in my throat as I recognized tall buildings and street lamps. Droga had transported us from the grave to the middle of Dolinska Square. We were in front of Milana's cathedral. He'd brought Gabby with us, but left Antonia, Corva, and Lucian behind, as if he found them too unimportant to bother with. At least my dad would be far away from this. Droga's eyes glimmered with greed as he took in the sights of the city. The theater, the cathedral, the palace in the distance. My, my... Things certainly look different. He morphed once again into the monstrous black stag. Time for me to gain my vengeance. These inferior mortals will pay for failing to worship me. Droga charged forward. He took to the skies, hoofs galloping on starlight and leaving behind a trail of fire and shadow. He put his antlers down and crashed into the nearest building. It smashed to pebbles in an instant, collapsing to the street. The people inside called out as they were crushed alive. Droga did that with the entire block. He flattened every building in the area before moving onward, galloping in the direction of the palace. Once he arrived, he rammed his antlers into it full speed. A sob of grief died in my throat as I watched Droga turn the palace to ruin flattening the place with no more effort than the wind directing a floating leaf. The palace crumbled underneath his weight, towers falling inward and smashing the outer walls. A massive cloud of dust rose over the place where the palace had once been, and Droga charged on. I had friends in there. Ozzy, Jasper, Amantha, Farah. Could they be gone? I couldn't imagine anyone had survived the collapse of the palace, servant, noble, or otherwise. Anyone who was inside that building when Droga hit it had been flattened in seconds. If my friends had been inside the palace when Droga struck it, they were certainly no more. A thought crossed my mind, and my heart was crushed. Tigris, I'd left my Faken behind at the palace. My poor little Maliludwe, he was dead along with all the others. Tears began running down my face, and I put a hand over my mouth to keep from crying out. Gabby looked elated at all the destruction. She turned in place with a joyful smile as she watched Droga stomp the theater underfoot, turning the shopping districts to rubble. I wanted to do something, but I was frozen in time as I watched Droga's hoofs and antlers smash each building to pieces. Faye ran out of their houses, grabbing children and screaming to the gods to save them. The streets became packed by the thousands, but for some strange reason, everyone avoided Gabby and I. It was as if they did not see us. I took a few steps forward, but was unable to go any further. I raised a hand and found some sort of invisible shield keeping me in. Droga must have put a ward around us to keep us protected from the falling rubble, or rather, keep me contained. We could not leave the area, nor could anyone see us. Hope gave a dying breath inside of me. Even if my friends arrived, they wouldn't be able to find me. Droga's shield made me invisible. I really was his prisoner. Faye took flight to the skies, escaping to the countryside, while carriages crashed into each other in a mad dash to leave the area. Anyone left standing in the streets was crushed by falling buildings. When I could see clear across the city to the mountain range beyond, the realization hit me. There was no more city. Dolinsko was gone. It'd been flattened in seconds. All that remained of Malovia's capital was a pile of concrete and all the bodies that lay underneath it. There was a massive crash above me. I looked up and let out an aching cry. Droga had smashed into the ceiling of the cathedral breaking its beautiful feature window and setting the building on fire. The dark fire licked at the sides of the cathedral eagerly. They were unlike normal flames, burning at a speed that was supernatural, turning wood and stone to dust in seconds. I fell to my knees as I watched the Cathedra da Duboyina burn. The greatest moments of my life had been in that cathedral, within Milana's sacred embrace. Now it was becoming embers and ash, 
hundreds of years of history going up in smoke. Priestesses fled from the inside of the cathedral, screaming like mad and weeping that it was on fire. The high priestess emerged from the cathedral, holding her headdress and appearing furious. Who has dared to set the cathedral ablaze? The high priestess raged. I will not tolerate this assault on the house of the gods. She ceased to speak as she saw Droga. Her mouth dropped open. Droga emitted a low laugh, and the high priestess collapsed on the ground. He absorbed her power with a deep rumble in his throat. The high priestess gave a dying sigh, her fingernails still clawing at the cobblestone as she perished. Droga dropped his head to the ground, gesturing for Gabby to climb his antlers. Come with me, new mate. I will show you the kingdom we have made. Gabby climbed Droga's antlers as if under some kind of grand delusion. She swung herself onto his back, and Droga took off into the air once more. The only thing in Dolinska that Droga had left standing was Arcania University. He soared above it, making a hellish circle of red clouds in the sky. This will be our home, dear wife. Droga boomed over the landscape. We shall make our palace here, and all shall bow before us. Gabby emitted a wicked laugh from Droga's back. She was having the time of her life. This was her revenge on the city. She blamed Dolinska for Elijah's death, and she would make them pay for it with a thousand lives. There was a shattering sound like glass breaking nearby. I ducked, but nothing hit me. Fear churned in my gut as I turned in place, wondering what had happened. Ona Wilka! Ethan's voice echoed across the square, and I never felt such a wave of relief. He ran toward me on three paws, Lady Magdalena trailing at his heels. Magdalena had somehow broken Droga's ward around me. At the sight of her, my courage intensified and hope returned. She was the most powerful sorceress in the world. Maybe she could stop this. Ethan skidded to a stop, and I took his head in my hands. You came too late. I sobbed as my fingers buried in his fur, stroking back his ears. Not too late to save you, he replied. His voice was aching and gaunt as he said, Dolinska is gone, but you are still alive, so there may still be a chance. Emmeline, give me your hands, Magdalena said, gesturing to the iron chains on my wrists. My mouth fell open as I watched her form a spell in her hand and use it to cut the iron stalks around my wrists and legs. They sliced open like butter, collapsing to the cobblestone and turning to dust. Beside me, Ethan looked on in shock. I thought fey magic didn't work on iron. What was going on? How could Magdalena overpower something the fey were weakened by? This made no sense. Magdalena's eyes dimmed with despair as she watched Droga surge over the university. A portal. Emmeline, you must get to... Magdalena let out a great cry as a spell slammed into her back, knocking her over. Ethan and I whipped around. Lady Corva and Queen Antonia were behind us. They brought Lord Lucian, who was still bound in chains. She's not going anywhere, Corva snarled. She kicked Lucian to the ground and stood before Lady Magdalena as she called battle magic to her hands. Queen Antonia summoned a spell, though her look was far less brave than Corva's. If anything, she looked terrified to face Magdalena in battle, even two-on-one. Magdalena flung her hand backward to cast a shield over Ethan and I before she began her assault. Illusion spells burst out of both of her palms in the direction of Antonia and Corva. Corva and Antonia dodged her attacks, responding with magic of their own. Spells bounced off the shield protecting Ethan and I, ricocheting in all directions. Ethan snarled and went to help Magdalena. When he did, I staggered forward and nearly fell to my knees. He rushed to catch me and I slumped across his back. I could no longer stand on my own. Don't leave me, I pleaded. I will not. Ethan pressed against my side, but his eyes flickered back and forth between the assault of his mother and Corva upon Lady Magdalena. Antonia was launching magical bombs at Magdalena, which my mentor flicked away with the back of her wrist. They went sailing in other directions, exploding against the pavement several blocks away. 
Corva had summoned a giant whip with several red tails that were thick with unseely magic. She snapped the whip in Magdalena's direction, but Magdalena dodged the blows. She conjured the illusion of a great snake, one that slithered up to Corva's whip and grabbed it by the ends. The snake devoured the whip, swallowing it whole. Corva snarled. She sent out a swirling jet of magic that cut off the snake's head. The snake vanished in an array of sparks, and Corva gave a giant cry, launching a pillar of magic at Magdalena's form. I shouted for Magdalena to watch out, but Magdalena turned her fiery gaze upon Corva. The spell instantly died as Corva's eyes went hazy. Corva faltered and blinked, as if she didn't realize what had happened. I'd spent enough training sessions with Magdalena to know exactly what had happened. If only for a brief moment, Magdalena had overpowered Corva's mind. But she had told me that was impossible. What the hell was going on? A spell Antonia had cast slipped past Magdalena's shield and slapped her across the cheek, leaving a bleeding cut. Magdalena turned her eyes upon Antonia, who realized with horror what she had done. I spared you once for killing my mate, Magdalena spat. I will not spare you a second time. Antonia let out a shriek and tried to run, but it was a hopeless attempt to save her life. Magdalena hurdled a battle orb. Antonia cast up a shield at the last second, but Magdalena's battle orb sailed straight through it, breaking the shield into dozens of pieces. The battle orb hit Antonia's body and smashed right through her, making a hole bigger than her head straight through the middle of her chest. Antonia gave a dying wail, then collapsed, fingers still grasping at the hole Magdalena had made. Ethan gasped as his mother's body hit the ground, but that was the conclusion of his grief. Lady Magdalena's magic ate away at Antonia's form, turning it into ash that the wind blew away. Magdalena approached Corva with a snarl. I suppose you want to be next. Corva came to her senses and fled. She knew when she'd been beat. She summoned a portal and vanished into it, disappearing from sight. Magdalena hurried toward Lucian. She used the same spell she conjured before to destroy the iron chains. They fell off of Lucian's limbs, setting him free. He appeared unbothered by Magdalena's incredible magic and simply stood, rubbing his wrists. He took me in in an embrace. Did they hurt you, Tika? No, I forced out, but even still, I trembled. I would have rather they tortured me than destroyed Dolinska in the manner they did. There was a loud crashing sound and I wondered if the fairy sky had broken. Instead, I watched in horror as Milana's cathedral came down, finally succumbing to the terror of Droga's black flames. Upon the horizon, my spirit convulsed as I watched Droga fly closer. Well, Weaver, Droga cried, I am coming for you. The three of you must leave, Lady Magdalena said shortly. I will handle this. You can't. I begged. Not even you can fight a god. Droga will never let you go. Someone has to stop him from following you. Her mouth was hard as she faced Droga like he was nothing at all. You'll die. I wept. Everything dies, Emmeline. The birds die, the fish die, and even someday you will die, though it is not this day. What is death except a departure into a new world? Magdalena asked. I am old. And I am tired. This body no longer serves my interests. Leave me be. No! I felt like a toddler protesting the departure of a grandmother. Magdalena had been my first introduction to the Fey world. She taught me so much about magic, about skating, about myself. She'd guided me along my quest and been more than my teacher. She'd been my protector. I wouldn't have survived this long without her and I was certain I wouldn't continue to survive if she wasn't at my side. She'll ask you to do things that are extremely difficult, and she expects success every time, my mother whispered yet again. The warning she'd given me before I'd come to Melovia echoed in my ears. This was the most impossible thing Lady Magdalena would ever ask of me, allowing her to become a sacrifice. How could I accept that she wanted to lay down her life for me? And yet, how could I stop her? Time halted as Magdalena swept her cloak behind her and forged onward, calling magic into her hands. 
Magdalena used her magic to forge stone golems out of the fallen stones. The stones jumbled together until they made men of concrete and steel, charging Droga as an army of giants. Magdalena created dozens of stone golems, forging a blockade of concrete soldiers I was sure not even Droga could get through. I was wrong, though. Droga put his antlers down and charged through the army of stone giants, shattering them to pieces. Gabby flattened herself to Droga's back and gave a wicked grin. Droga slowed to a stop as his hoofs touched the ground, standing before Lady Magdalena. I didn't expect you to be here, Droga lolled. What a charming situation. I prefer you in your grave, Magdalena said dryly, and I prefer you in yours. You are standing in my way, Droga said, impatience rattling his voice. It wouldn't be the first time. Magdalena cast her hand upward, and sparks emitted from her palm. They fell into Droga's eyes and he gave a cry of pain, shaking his head back and forth to scatter the sparks away. Gabby screamed, letting out curses. Lucian turned away from the fight. The iron has weakened me. I cannot forge a portal for our escape, Lucian said. We must flee on foot. We can't leave her, I screamed. Lucian changed into a wolven and cried, Ethan, with me. All my begging and protests didn't do any good because Ethan tossed me on his back with his head and began running after Lord Lucian. Against my better instincts, I looked back. Droga was bleeding from the eyes. His blood was black, thick like tar. He circled Lady Magdalena and blindly attempted to stomp her beneath his hoofs. Lady Magdalena cast up harsh spells, one that whipped Droga's legs and burned his feet. Droga howled, rearing backward. He almost toppled over. Gabby had to flounder to remain on his back. As he came back down on all fours, one of Magdalena's spells hit Gabby on the side of the head. She slumped forward and fell off of Droga's back limply onto a pile of rubble, completely knocked out. I had hope then. Maybe Magdalena could beat Droga. A spell of Magdalena's bounced off of one of Droga's antlers. It crashed into half of a building that was still standing. It teetered and began toppling over, its immense shadow looming over us as it began to fall at a rapid speed. Look out! Lucian roared. He spread his wings and took to the air to avoid being crushed. We couldn't outrun this. I closed my eyes, certain this was the end. But Ethan growled and my stomach suddenly dipped out. Weightlessness came over me, and I opened my eyes. My mouth hung open as I realized we were suspended high in the air, soaring over the ruins of the city. Ethan had sprouted two white wings. He pumped them vigorously, raising us into the air with all the beauty of an eagle in flight. Tears came to my eyes. Ethan, you're flying. The moment was mystical. He'd finally earned his wings. Of course I am flying, he replied. Rest now, Onowilka, and I will get you far away from here. I gripped tightly onto Ethan's pelt as I looked down. Even from this distance, I could still watch the fight. Droga had shifted into a man. He was covering his eyes with one hand, which still poured blood. Magdalena approached him with a killing spell in her palm, and I held my breath, thinking it was over with. Then Droga lifted a hand. A dark curse spread from his fingers, blooming toward Lady Magdalena. She didn't have time to stop it. The curse wrapped around her form like wicked vines, constricting her arms to her sides. The killing spell died in her fingers. Droga clenched his hand shut. I think I screamed, but the cry died in my throat. I watched as Lady Magdalena began pouring blood from the inside out. It came welling past her lips, out of her nose. Her life source spilled onto the cobblestone, making a red pool that ran along the city streets as her eyes wept blood and her heart emptied out her mouth. Lady Magdalena toppled forward, and her body splashed into the pool of blood. Droga's curse around her ended, and yet still, she remained motionless. My mind broke then. I just couldn't comprehend anymore. I'd never had a moment before where my mind hadn't conceived a single thought, so this was all very strange. Get up. I whispered to Magdalena, but she never did. Her form became smaller and smaller as we continued to fly away. I comprehended how rigid Ethan had gone beneath me, but other than that, no more. 
Drogo raged, waving his head back and forth. He was still wiping at his blinded eyes, smearing his face with black blood. Droga had lost us, and without his sight, couldn't see where we'd gone. World Weaver! He bellowed. Where are you? Quickly, Lucian urged. He beat his wings even faster. Ethan hurried to keep up with him as we flew away from the wrecked city, toward the mountains in the beyond. I went completely numb. I couldn't feel anything. Not the cold, or the ache in my body, or my exhaustion from the fight. I felt no sorrow for Dolinska or what we had lost. I was confused by my lack of emotion, and partly wondered if I'd made it all up. This had to be some kind of sick dream. I was still on my honeymoon, had to be. I was just caught up in a nightmare. Why hadn't I woken up yet? We didn't land until we were deep in the mountains, and Droga had long fallen out of our sight. Lucien tucked his wings to his sides as he came to a statue standing in the middle of the forest. It was overgrown an old sculpture of the goddess Vesna, the blue doe of knowledge. Lucian paced in front of it, clearly shaken up. Why are we here? Ethan asked. Arthur and I agreed on this spot in case anything happened and we were separated, Lucian said. I'm sure he'll turn up in time. Lucian let out a weary sigh as he changed back into a man. It's best we remain here and out of sight until our allies find us. Wrist up. It's about to be a long night. Ethan laid on the ground. I slid off his back, my body collapsing into the snow. He draped a wing over me to use as a blanket and curled around my body. His shifter heat was gentler than lying in a bed, and I found my eyes closing as I laid my head upon his soft shoulder. Ethan, I whimpered. I know, Onawilka. Ethan pressed his wet nose to my forehead. I instantly fell asleep, as if put under a spell. Maybe Ethan had cast one. I remained inside peaceful oblivion until the sounds of the forest woke me up the next morning. My heart stuttered, and my eyelids fluttered open. It was dawn. A small sprinkling of snowflakes fell from the sky, coating Ethan's back. Lucian was still awake, leaning against the statue and appearing woeful. Lady Magdalena. I squeezed my eyes shut and two tears leaked out. They froze before they made it down my chin. If there was ever a morning that felt so grief-stricken, I couldn't remember it. I didn't want to wallow in my misery, so I tried to go back to sleep. I kept my eyes closed, attempting to block out the world. Perhaps the dead were fortunate. They couldn't feel like this. There was the sound of a portal opening, footsteps crunching on the snow. Thank the gods you're alive! Arthur's voice was a deep comfort to me. There was noise above me as my father and twin embraced. News of, let's not speak of it now, Lucian replied. Your sister needs to be hidden. Ethan stirred beside me. He hadn't slept at all, I bet. Lucian stooped down to shake my shoulder. Emma, we must go. Ethan changed into a man and helped me up. I hung on to him as we walked to the portal together. Arthur took my other arm. It'll be fine, sis, he said, though I was certain it would never be. We walked through the portal, and Lucian followed. The atmosphere immediately changed when we stepped out of the portal. I heard the sound of waves crashing against rock and smelled the ocean. The air was crisp and clear, and the temperature was significantly warmer than what we'd left behind. And green. Everything looked so green, even in wintertime. The sky was overcast, blocking out the sun. We stood on a cliff face overlooking the sea, rolling emerald hills splayed out in front of us like a map. Below us was a massive estate, a historical manor house that was painted white, surrounded by hedges and fenced gardens. Ireland. Had to be. Arthur squeezed my shoulder and whispered, Welcome home. Chapter 25 Ethan I ignored the numbness in my chest as we continued our walk down the hill and toward the estate. I kept a firm grip on Emma as we descended, not just for her sake, but for my own. Arthur said this was home, and it had to be now, because our true home was gone. The palace was destroyed, Dolinska laid in ruin. Everything I loved about Malovia had been destroyed. Droga was free, and Gabby was fit to become his goddess. Reality sunk in. We had lost the crown and the war. 
We were arguably the worst king and queen in Malovian history for allowing this to happen. There had never been a bigger crisis among the Fae, and I didn't think there would ever be again. Except we weren't monarchs anymore. We couldn't be. There was nothing left to rule over, and what was left, Gabby would take for herself. This was surely the end of the world, and if it wasn't, then we were still cursed. The estate loomed overhead as we approached. It was a massive building. Had to have over a hundred rooms. Arthur opened the door for us. Lucian led the way through the halls, which were swathed in colors of emerald and gold. Flags bearing an insignia of white and red rose entwined and thorns hung on every wall. Where are we? I asked. Dumcha na Rosanna, Lucian replied. The estate of roses. This was the place where Lord Lucian and Arthur had grown up. It was far away from Malovia, which was the only comfort I could find at the moment. There were footsteps ahead. Emma's mother came running down the hallway, sobbing profusely. She flung her arms around Lucian's neck and squeezed, You're alive! Lucian hugged her back, but stiffly pulled away from her embrace. Ivonya, please, he began. It's been a long night for all of us. Ivonya sniffed and looked at her daughter. Yes, I... we've all heard the news. She kissed Arthur's cheek, then cupped Emma's face. We have room for you upstairs. Everything's been prepared. Emma didn't respond, and Lucian said, Wait for me in the library. We have things to discuss. Ivonya nodded, then hurried away. Lucian forged onward. As we proceeded down the hall, Lucian said, I'm sorry about your mother, Ethan. Emma squeezed my arm. I cleared my throat and said, She made her choice. I accepted her end long ago. There was no love left between us. But it is still painful all the same, Lucian replied. A loss remains a loss. I said nothing. Arthur pushed a grand door and it opened into a large foyer. There was a blazing fire in the hearth at the center of the room, surrounded by armchairs. Our friends, mercifully, were inside. There were elated cries of relief. Everyone swarmed us all at once. Their eyes were rimmed red and harried. They'd all been crying. God! Stefan croaked out as he hugged me. Odette hiccuped, and Theo massaged her shoulder, though he pinched the bridge between his nose and his eyes. Oh, we all thought you'd certainly been... Kiara turned into Alexi. He gave a helpless shrug like he'd already resigned himself to our deaths, and accepting that we'd survived was another hill he had to climb. Delmer rubbed her belly, looking pale. I wasn't going to forgive myself if Emma died. We made it out fine, I told her. I didn't add there were so many who didn't. Emma's color drained, and guilt overwhelmed her expression. She felt responsible for this. I could not offer her lies to dissuade her pain. She was responsible. We both were. Good to know you're all safe, a warm voice said. Vocek shuffled his way into the foyer with the use of a cane, followed by his wife. They were the only people that didn't appear bothered by the turn of events, as if they'd expected this to come. Had so many years of experiencing unseely prejudice hardened them that harshly? Emma didn't crack until she saw her grandmother. She broke into a sob and embraced Phelan. The old woman stroked Emma's hair and said, You're safe now. We're glad to see you come back to the homeland, though we wish it was under different circumstances. Phelan wiped Emma's tears away with the back of her thumb and put a hand on her back to guide her. Come, a warm breakfast will do you good. Everyone followed Phelan to what I presumed was the kitchen, but Stefan jerked his head. Ethan, a minute. We waited until the room emptied. Stefan put an arm on the hearth to lean on as he said, Arthur? And Finlay slipped back into Delinska to search for Vera, Amantha, Jasper, and Ozzy. Did they find them? I asked. No. Then he paused. But they did retrieve the body. It took a moment before I understood what he was saying. No, not here, I insisted. She deserves to be interred at Melonia's cathedral. There isn't a cathedral anymore, he said calmly. We can only do what we can. She was the greatest sorceress in the world. She deserves an honored burial. Keep your voice down. We all know it. Stefan looked into the flames. But her body has to be prepared for the journey to the great hunting grounds. This can't wait. 
We need to take a moment to grieve before we decide what to do next. What to do next? There was no going forward. Nothing else left to do. We'd lost. But I thought of Lady Magdalena's soul, trapped between this world and the next, because we'd failed to give her the proper rights, and my spirit withered. You're right. Her soul must journey on. Tonight, it has to be. Stefan nodded shortly. I followed him to the dining hall, where everyone was consuming porridge and toast quietly. I didn't eat. I couldn't stomach anything. Afterward, Arthur showed Emma and I to our room. It was large, grander than we deserved, and beautiful. We peeled off our ruined clothes, and Emma threw them in the fire to burn. There was a shower chair waiting for me, along with Emma's favorite soap in the bathroom. It took over an hour to clean off all the mud, grime, and blood from our skin. We found clothes in our size, and a stock of Emma's medicine in the cupboard. Everything had been prepared for us to come here. It was as if Phelan and Vocek knew we would arrive eventually. Displeased, I closed the curtains to block out the sun, and we turned in to bed. I didn't think we'd spoken a word since Arthur had left us a while ago. Although we'd slept all night, we dozed most of the day, too. It was like our very souls were tired, and we just couldn't stand any more suffering. I'd fear we'd close our eyes and succumb to death due to a broken heart. It would almost be comforting to never wake up. My fears were unfounded, for Kiara awoke us at sundown. Emma sat up and rubbed exhaustion from her eyes as I searched the wardrobe for clothes that were black. We must prepare for the funeral. My voice trailed off as Emma looked at me, doe-like eyes blinking. She had the look of a child that didn't understand. Was she even there anymore? I didn't know. I handed her clothes and she put them on, just for something to do. We proceeded downstairs. Stefan and Delmer were waiting for us. It's time, Stefan said. He put a hand on my shoulder, and Delmer wrapped her arm around Emma's waist as we ventured outside. The shifters had built a pyre on the cliffside. Chairs surrounded the area. Everyone was there to see Lady Magdalena off. Our friends and family turned our way as Emma and I wandered up the aisle. They bowed their heads, dipping their bodies as we passed. I hated that they still respected us. We weren't a king and queen anymore, and even if we were in their eyes, we didn't deserve to be. There was a shrouded figure lying on the pyre. It sickened me to look upon her, even though she was covered. I turned toward Kiara, who was beside the pyre. Kiara would be performing the rites, as she was the only one among us who had any priestess training. She held her staff in her hands, the one which contained the griffin stone. She must have hurried to Edmire to retrieve it, a risky endeavor, bringing one of the crystals back to earth, but Lady Magdalena deserved such an honor. As we came to the front, people lined up behind us. We tattoo ourselves when someone we dearly love has passed, Kiara said quietly. I promise it won't hurt. Emma shoved her arm out like she didn't care if it did. Kiara lightly grasped her forearm. When she pulled her hand away, there was a Malovian rune in the middle of her forearm, black and haunting against her skin. I'd never gotten a tattoo for my father. I should have at the time, but when he'd passed away, I couldn't bear to do so. Getting a tattoo meant acknowledging he was gone forever. I wouldn't be so cowardly with Lady Magdalena. I stuck my arm out, and Kiara gripped my forearm. I felt a tingling sensation there, as the ruin embedded in my skin, and I took a step back so someone else could receive one. Emma and I took our seats. She stared at the sea and at the death shroud. She was being so quiet. It bothered me. I wish she'd say something, if only so I could hear her voice. I worried my own Awilke was turning into a ghost. When everyone who had desired a tattoo had gotten one, the congregation sat down. Alexei, who would be helping Kiara, slowly pulled off the shroud. A dagger dug into my heart as I forced myself not to gasp. Lady Magdalena looked so peaceful lying upon the funeral pyre. The blood was gone from her face and eyes, replaced with light makeup, and she wore a navy robe of the finest embroidered silver thread. She appeared as regal as ever. I thought for certain she'd get up from the pyre and tell us this was all some giant ruse. It was so strange, seeing someone you'd spoken with mere hours before lie motionless and cold. I couldn't believe there was no longer life remaining in that body. How could such a vessel, one that had been moving and speaking just days ago, be turned into a statue now? I didn't understand death. I didn't understand life, either. We cleaned her up, Odette 
whispered from the other side of Emma. She clutched a tissue and dotted her eyes. She deserves to look pretty. She shouldn't have gone out like that. Theo's words were hoarse, but Stefan elbowed him, and he failed to say anything more. Kiara raised her hands to the sky. Seven gods, hear our prayer, she shouted. We offer you one of our own, a fay who is beloved and cherished. We send to you Lady Bianca Magdalena, a member of Melovia's circle, and a sorceress unlike any other. Find her soul amongst the dead, and guide her to the great hunting grounds, where she will live on in peace and wonder. I'd heard these words spoken many times before at other funerals, including my father's, but this time they seemed different somehow, as if the seven gods were actually present and not just looking downward upon us. Finlay was weeping loudly at the back. It was the first time I'd seen him express such emotion. It was difficult to endure. Kiara turned to the altar. She sprinkled oil upon Lady Magdalena's body, then lit a bowl of incense. She circled around the pyre seven times. She began to speak a chant as the incense wafted over Magdalena's body. My spirit flies to the great hunting grounds, and my body returns to the earth. My remains will feed the elements as my soul crosses over to paradise. I will go hunting with the gods and be waiting for you there. Kiara placed the bowl of incense at the head of the pyre and grabbed her staff. She walked throughout the congregation, touching each of us lightly with the griffin stone. Blood of my blood, heart of my heart, remember me as I live on. I fear not death, for I receive eternal life. Remember me within your spirit until we join again. Remember. Emma was the last to be touched by the staff. Kiara tapped it lightly upon her hand. Emma nearly flinched before Kiara backed away. Kiara took a short breath. If anyone wishes to say a few words, I invite them to come before the pyre now and speak your final goodbyes. No one got up at first, until I heard Lord Lucian whisper to Avonia. Lucian proceeded in front of the pyre and said, Lady Magdalena was an extraordinary woman, as all of you are aware. She was a fantastic sorceress, an incredible headmistress, and a friend to us all. In all my years, I've never met anyone like her, nor do I think I ever will again. There were sniffs and tears from the congregation. Lucian cleared his throat. Magdalena was accomplished in everything she did. She had no offspring, for she considered her students her children. Arcania University was her heart and soul, and she put everything she had into teaching and nurturing her students. Her greatest wish was to mentor young people and create out of them fay our nation would be proud of. Her compassion for her students and the wisdom she passed on will be her greatest legacy. Lucian took a pause. But, over everything else, her mission in life was to aid Emma and make sure my daughter survived. Emma stiffened beside me as Lucian locked eyes with her. This wasn't a mistake, my child. Magdalena knew what she was doing. She considered this a worthy sacrifice. As she said, we all must die, and this was her choice. You still have choices to make going forward, as do we all. I think we should all do our best to honor Magdalena as we move on. Lucian departed from the pyre and returned to his seat. No one else proceeded forward. Kiara turned toward my mate. Emma, is there anything you'd like to say? My wife shook her head, and Kiara nodded. Very well. Stefan, if you please. Stefan rose to stand and walked toward the pyre. He changed into a dragon and lightly blew flame upon the wood. It ignited instantly, and Lady Magdalena's body became swathed in fire. The heat of a dragon's flame was magical. It burned hotter than a normal flame, and thus devoured the body in seconds. A crackling sound swelled over the area as Magdalena's bones began to break and burn. A wind stirred up. As the ashes rose into the sky, people began wailing. I couldn't help it. I leaned over my knees and broke down. How could we manage this world without Magdalena? It wasn't just her power that we'd lost. It was her knowledge, her guidance. I didn't think we could go on after losing her like this. What would we do without her? Emma didn't cry, and that was the most heartbreaking thing of all. She just stared onward and watched the ashes drift into the sea below. Stefan's fire consumed the pyre in a matter of minutes, 
turning it into a pile of embers. There was nothing left of Magdalena's body, save for whatever was mixed up in the ashes. Lucian changed into a wolven and began digging into the ground. I shifted and went to help him. When we had a decent-sized hole, we pushed the ashes into the earth with our paws and buried them completely. Kiara scattered petals over the grave, and it was done. People began to return to the manor. Emma stood at the grave, looking down and appearing rigid, so cold. For nearly an hour, my friends and I remained, watching my mate at a distance. Should we get her? Odette asked. She's been standing there a long time. Leave her be, I said. She needs a moment. Finally, Emma turned her back on the grave and walked towards us. Throughout the whole thing, she hadn't shed one tear, but her expression was different. When we'd arrived, she'd been lonesome, sorrowful. Now, the blaze in her eyes, it spoke of something far more frightening. Her fists were clenched at her sides, mouth set in a hard line as she stomped past us. There was a small morning dinner that Phelan prepared. We ate, sharing stories around the table about Lady Magdalena, what kind of a person she was, and our fondest memories of her. And still, Emma did not speak. The night grew long. My friends and I found ourselves gathered in the foyer long after everyone else had gone to bed. "'What do we do now?' Alexei whispered. Kiara put a hand on his shoulder, and he grasped it tightly. "'What can we do?' I replied. "'It's over.' There was a loud sound of something breaking. Emma had jumped up from her seat. The remnants of her glass goblet remained on the floor. She jumped up and shattered it against the ground at my words. "'This is far from over.' Emma said lowly. It was the first time she'd spoken that day. She was seething, teeth clenched and face red. I swallowed. But fuck those assholes! Emma slammed her hand against the wall. Now I'm fucking pissed! We're done, Emma. I threw up a hand. Face it. We failed. No! Emma's voice shook the walls. I'm not going to let them get away with this. Are you... I'm ashamed to say I was too cowardly to answer. Emma made a vicious noise and began pacing in front of the fireplace. Droga wants the crystals of harmony, but they're in our hands. It's time we figured out how to use them. We still have a year left before the portal to Idenmire closes for good. We still have time. What's the point now? I asked hopelessly. How many fey are left after Droga destroyed the city? Doesn't matter, Emma insisted. If there is but one fey life left to save, we save it. We have five crystals. There's only one left to find. And, I demanded, have you seen what we've done? Why not just let the portal close and allow the fey to turn to dust, along with all of us? Perhaps it's better for the world if our race dies out. Why not let it end, for the gods' sake? Emma sighed in frustration and looked at our friends. Would someone please go find my husband? because it seems like someone's replaced him with an overdramatic crybaby. I sputtered. Over Emma, we lost. Gabby took everything. Big fucking deal, she shot at me. She played the game of power better. So what? What's our next move? Her resilience was incredible. I didn't think we could go on. Not after this. Don't you understand? I pleaded. We hunt monsters. But today proves that we are the monsters. The Fae are a curse upon this world. I'm not willing to give up. She shoved me, and I stumbled backward. You never are, I snarled. Even when it's clearly hopeless, you continue to fight destiny like a little child who refuses to accept fate. Because that's what I do. I make the impossible happen because I have no other choice, she hissed. You want to lie down and show your belly like a coward? Fine. I'm not going to. Our first marital fight. Never thought it would be over something as unbearable as this. I went to say something mean back, but Alexei came between us, pushing us away from each other. Cut it out, you two, Alexei said. But, Emma is right. The crystals are in our possession. That gives us an advantage, even small, against Droga. And not everyone's dead. My parents are still safe in the Dragon Village, Stefan said. Dolinska was destroyed, but the outlying neighborhoods around the city were spared. There are still thousands of fey in those communities that we need to protect. Stefan was right. The Dragon Village, the Alicorn Village, the Griffin Village, even the Wolven Pack, all were still standing. 
We had an obligation to them. We'd sworn an oath to defend them. Could I go back on that now? If we find the last crystal, we can open up the portal to Edenmire, then use the crystals themselves to stop Droga, Delmare offered. He was in prison before. Why can't he be stopped again? He was stopped by the other gods, Kiara argued. We don't have that kind of magic on our side. The crystals are insanely powerful magical objects. Droga wouldn't want them if they didn't rival his own power, Emma pointed out. That means we can use them to put him away. There must be a ritual of some kind, something we can do to imprison him again. I won't accept any alternative. I let out a harsh laugh. This is a fool's errand. Well, obviously we're all fucking stupid due to what happened yesterday, so I'd say we're certainly up for the task, Emma shouted. I huffed, but Stefan put a hand on my chest. Emma has a point. Okay, so we got our asses kicked. Gabby's beaten us before, but we always come back swinging. Time to wipe the dirt off our face and get back out there. I felt a vein in my head pulse. What happened was our fault. We were impulsive and impatient. We won't be going forward, Emma stated. We have one task only. Find the last crystal. That's all that matters now. And what if we manage to fuck that up too? I asked bitterly. You're just afraid of repeating your mistakes, Emma spat. I failed to respond, because I was. Taking action yesterday had been far worse than doing nothing. I was worried if we continued to fight, it'd just make everything worse. Theo turned toward Odette. My dear, do you have any insight? Odette didn't immediately respond. She bit her lip and played with her hands. She'd foreseen something. I was sure of it. Finally, Odette said, We have to fight back. Droga won't stop with Malovia. They'll want more and more. The Fae aren't the only ones at risk. The entire supernatural world will be destroyed if we don't find a way to put him back in his grave. So it's settled, Stefan said. The Unseelie Stone is the last to find. We get it, and we put a boot up Droga's ass. We have to find Vera and the others first, Emma insisted. My brother's mate is still out there, along with Jasper, Ozzy, and Amantha. Even if we only bring back their bodies, we have to give Finlay and Arthur some kind of peace. There were murmurs of agreement from everyone but me. I didn't like this plan. I considered it suicide. Emma's look was desperate. She'd been mad at me before, but now she needed me. Ethan, I can't do this without you. Her tone was so longing, and how could I deny her? It would be like turning my back on myself. So what if this plan was suicide, if I truly thought the end was near? The alternative was merely to wait for the end. I couldn't imagine tucking my tail between my legs and cowering away. If we were going to die anyway, why not give Droga a reckoning he'd never forget? I'd meant every word of my wedding vows. I'd promised for better or for worse, and this was definitely for the worst. Didn't matter. I wanted to be with her, and she didn't think her quest was over. I was soul-bound to fight beside her, even if things got rotten from this point out. I walked forward to grasp her hand. I'm with you. On Awilke, from now until the bitter end. And I was sure it would be just that. Bitter. We'd failed to save the Fae, but we would avenge them. We'd defend the ones that were still alive and prevent Droga from ravaging the rest of the supernatural world by using the crystals against him. Our race wouldn't die out. We'd open the portal to Edmire and make sure our people lived on. Victory was a long shot. Extinction was more or less a sure thing. But I hadn't come to play around. I loved Emma, and she was devoted to seeing this through. I would remain at her side and fight for her until my last breath. Whatever wrath the gods may have in store, Emma and I would battle for Malovia's future. Till death do us part. Ethan and Emma's story comes to a dramatic conclusion in The Fae Queen. Hidden Legends, University of Sorcery, Book 6. The End. This has been The Shifter Empire, Hidden Legends, University of Sorcery, Book 5. Written by Megan Linsky. Narrated by Liana Walsh and Max Pinkins. Copyright 2021 by Megan Linsky. Audio copyright 2022 by Megan Linsky.